One year since humanity lost their war against the demon kin, a vast majority of humans had been massacred. The surviving population had been captured, destroying their mental capacity and using them as hosts to give birth to new monsters. He was the last human where the world has met its end. As the last survivor of the resistance, he has continued that lonely fight. Until this moment, in the face of the demon god Tartarus, the monarch of demons, Zephyr gets stabbed by the monarch's sword as he sits down, waiting for his end. Tartarus casts time-slowing magic on Zephyr because he wants to continue carrying out the conversation a little longer. Tartarus commends Zephyr as he is the first human who has been able to bother the monarch in such a long time. His tenacity is astonishing, and he applauds Zephyr for that. Tartarus tells Zephyr that those who give up after being scared of their opponent's power are not wise, adding that they are just weak. When he sees those who are weak and without perseverance, he gets angered beyond belief. Tartarus offered Zephyr to work under him as someone who had climbed to the top of the human world. He claims that he will take him beyond that small world to another, to even the home of gods. He adds that he wants to conquer all the other worlds with his power and Zephyr's. With the impact of the fight they just had, Zephyr's body has been shattered beyond repair. He can tell himself that his body has no way of healing back to its original form. Thinking about the offers, he assumes that they are actually not true. Zephyr thinks that Tartarus only wants another way for him to beg for his life. He then approaches Tartarus's hand, and the thoughts of the loved one come to his mind. She knows that Zephyr's personality is so awful because she is always telling him this and that. Since he never listened to her, she placed a peculiar spell on him. So, if Zephyr ever did that with his hand, his body would explode with the power that would reach beyond their realm. And that's his answer to the demon god while also giving Tartarus his middle finger. He explodes himself, and the explosion goes as far as the whole plateau. Unfortunately, the demon god survives, and only his hands get incinerated. The only thing he can think of is anger. He is so angry towards the humans that, time by time, always annoys him. What's left of Zephyr now is his burned body, which the demon god punches to subdue his anger. And with that, Zephyr's fights had finally ended. He wasn't able to get revenge for his cherished one and couldn't save humanity like they had wished. It ended in vain. But what he doesn't know is he awakes in his recovered body with his memories intact, and even his armor is fine. He wonders where he is, though he has never seen a temple with the statues of God like this. The conclusion he has is that it's the afterlife in the underworld. But there's someone coming as she says that it's not the underworld, but the lowest floor of the pantheon, where the gods reside. The sounds come from an angel, and Zephyr fails when he tries to summon his sword. The angel tells him not to worry and introduces herself as the high-level angel Mercedes, who will share the words of the gods. She tells him that he has already died, and she explains that usually, he would have been sent to the underworld directly. However, because of the strong demand from the three great gods, they decided to send Zephyr back to the past. She explains further that Zephyr will retain his memories but not his ability, train physique, magic power, and obtain skills. The only thing Zephyr can think of is it is a dream, and Tartarus casts a hallucination ability on him. He thought further that people were dying all around him during the demon's attack and when he was desperate, praying for help. The gods had ceased all communication with their world. They refused to answer their prayer, and they didn't receive their sacrifices either. Also, they took away the clergy's ability to borrow the power of gods. This caused them to lose their ability to heal, resulting in the quick demise of human armies. Once they calculated that there was nothing to gain, they threw away their world. There would be no reason why those calculating gods would give him a chance like that for free. The angel actually knows what Zephyr is thinking, and what the gods want is something a little more interesting to watch. Zephyr is mad, then shoots a mana punch, threatening the angel, implying he doesn't even want to listen to the angel's explanation. He is so mad at the gods when Zephyr and everyone he loves fight with their lives just for the entertainment of the gods. His anger keeps raging in his heart, so the angel summons God's power. A massive leg appears, stomping on Zephyr. The angel then explains that by providing his own self-worth is the only way that he can receive what he pleases. That is the same for humans and other species alike, as nothing can be free in this world. She explains further that there is one god who has been strongly demanding his return for another reason. It turns out that Tartarus took his anger towards the angels. He wants another fight as he doesn't accept the fact that he got hit by a mere human. Then, the angel asks again if Zephyr would take the offer. And it's obvious now, as he says it, if Tartarus really wishes to die, Zephyr will grant that wish. So the angel starts the spell, as Zephyr thinks that even though it's an opportunity given by the disgusting gods, an opportunity is an opportunity. He will take that opportunity to take revenge on the demon god Tartarus, and to all the gods who look down on him like bugs. The next thing he knows, he wakes up being called a rookie. Right after, a bucket of water was thrown at his face in an attempt to wake him up again. Zephyr thinks that he has seen them before. Looking at the stigma, he remembers when he was a slave of the temple, ten years before his fights with the demon god. The first thing he does is to look for a place where no one is around, 
then open the perks for being returned to the past. Along with it, he gets a massive headache as the information comes into his head all at once, either top-class skills and items or even abilities that were implemented as actual skills. Zephyr is happy and thinks about how crazy it is for them to give out something like that. When the supervisor of the slaves finds him out, he repeatedly tells him to get back to work and comes closer, going to whip him. But in this second life, Zephyr is able to catch it. Instead of agitating the situation, he simply just apologizes and then gets back to work. Zephyr is wondering why he is able to catch the whip, as he assumes that it looks so slow because of all his battle experience until the battle with the demon god. Thanks to the skill called the Wall of Iron, even there's no scratch on his hand. That skill is the first perk he gets, and it drastically increases his defense power. It makes him completely ignore damage that is lower than his defense power. Lastly, this passive skills will prevent him from tiring out easily and allow him to do mining work all day long. As Zephyr submits his ore that day, they announce the rankings for each team. Zephyr's group receives the first ranking, and according to their protocols, the supplies for the last place will be divided among the ranks above them. It is then explained that the Temple of Area, one of the three great gods, is the biggest religion and also the biggest loan company in the continent. Most of the people there have either lost their homes to monsters or were once adventurers but were rescued by the temple and became slaves to pay off their vast medical bills. Anyhow, while Zephyr still has the stigma on him, he is not free to move around as he pleases. If he goes outside the work territory without permission, his heart will stop and he will die immediately. So, he needs to quickly pay for his medical bills to regain freedom. Only then can he proceed with his next plan. On top of that, he also thinks about his past lover, Altair, and promises that he will protect her this time. Zephyr then comes to the stall, asking to get a recovery potion, and he dumps all of his money to buy the recovery potion, even going as far as taking a loan to pay for it. He explains that the recovery potion, which recovers a small portion of one's health, has a hidden effect where one's magic power increases if one drinks a large quantity. Also, the other perk that Zephyr has called the Vision of Hermes drastically increases the effect of all potions by 500%. Day by day, he repeats the same process of mining to earn money, drink the recovery potion and train. One day, he reports to the mining supervisor that he heard a monster's cry, so he asks the supervisor to call the hunter team so that he can lead them toward the place where he heard the monster cry. It is then explained that the monsters are beings that were born from warps within magic, and since most monsters were hostile against humans, they had caused so much damage. However, they also gave humans a second chance. The crystallization of magic within their bodies, the magic stones, the bone and fur were used as material for items. Before they knew it, monsters had become a precious material that they couldn't live without. That also meant that dungeons were to be home to monsters. While also dangerous, they were also like treasure chests waiting to be discovered. On the other hand, hunters are sometimes slaves who were selected and chosen for their combat prowess and specialization in hunting. To compensate for facing the dangers that were monsters, they had a higher base pay, and were paid with incentives based on their progress. Zephyr gets back to the stall to buy a recovery potion, but the stall owner refuses to give him more loans because his rank is too low and maxes out his loan limit. So, a priestess offers him money if he would sell his organs, and of course, for the sake of getting stronger, he accepts the offer. The stall owner gives him a whole pack of recovery potions. Zephyr chugs it down as the priestess thoughts that he is crazy for drinking it all. As he finishes drinking it, the hunter team arrives, calling out to him. The leader is Gulf, and he introduces the team. Zephyr then informs them that even though he doesn't have night vision, he is able to use mana detection, which enables him to spread mana in a wide field and heighten his senses. He explains that in order to go deep into a dark dungeon without attracting attention from the monsters, it's crucial that one has that kind of skill. As they prepare to go to the mine, Zephyr also being tasked to be the porter. It is revealed that Zephyr gets transported to the hunter team a month after the dungeon and the mine is cleared. As he remembers it, he knows at least one of the team members, and if things were to go the same way, two of them would die in the dungeon. Now, Zephyr plans to use them to his own advantage. At the entrance of the dungeon, there is another team waiting, and they are the scout hunters. The leader gives the hunting team each a bracelet, as he explains that the string bracelets are laced with magic. And if something were to happen to the hunting team while they are in the dungeon, the other bracelet that he wears will snap by itself. If that happens, he will request backup from the base. While the hunter team enters the dungeon, he also reminds Zephyr that he is with the reconnaissance team. And as long as Zephyr pays attention, there won't be any need for that. Inside the dungeon, a pack of cobbled monsters waiting for them. The hunters throw the stones to distract them, and when they are, they close in and get behind them to finish them off. Their main role was to check if there were monsters and gather information about the inside of the dungeon. Based on the information they collected, they would then create an attack squad that would have the necessary firepower to clear the dungeon. And that's how things usually went. 
as the reconnaissance team was also made up of hunters with combat abilities. If they determined that it would be easy to handle, there were times when they cleared the dungeon themselves right away. While the other members are not sure, Gold manages to convince them to do it, even after saying that they have a dead weight that they have to carry calling out to Zephyr. Gold then tells him to take out the supply he prepared earlier. It was hazelnut leaves and seeds intended to be used as bait because they give out the smell of female kobold. Since the smell is so strong, the kobolds in the cave would notice it right away, and when they ran ecstatically looking for mating, the hunters would lay traps to kill them. Zephyr remembers how, in his past life, he worked together with Goth. As Goth wanted to receive approval from others, he never had the chance to do so. But in this life, Zephyr tells Goth something before deciding to clear it. It was to clear the dungeon with traps, as Zephyr claims that he went inside the dungeon alone, telling Goth that the dungeon is only invested with small kobolds. So Zephyr suggests clearing the dungeon themselves as Zephyr thinks that it would be a waste to give up the chance to other people. And with that, they slay the kobolds inside, while Goth feels proud of himself for being able to take all the credits for clearing the dungeon. Going deeper into it, one of the members, Gale, finds something that leads to some kind of a nest, where suddenly, there's a massive claw reaching out to him. He has no time to react, and the claw manages to grab him and throw him out, surprising the others. Marco immediately readied himself for battle and told the other members to stand behind him as he fell afraid of the thought of what might hide in the nest. What he doesn't know is that the monster is quite big, and he doesn't have a chance of tanking it. Meanwhile, outside the dungeon, the scout who gives them the bracelet is surprised to see three of the bracelets breaking all at once. That's when Goth tries to stand his ground, with blood running down from his shoulder, while Zephyr helps him defend against the tail of the monster with his will of iron passive skill. As the tail grabs its prey, what comes out is a predator, a monster that uses its pheromones to trick other monsters into thinking they are the same species eats the monster that raised the predator when it became fully grown with the sole purpose of wreaking havoc. Zephyr is all fired up now, taking the spear Goth uses and readily takes on the predator. With his third perk from the gods, in his left hand is the silver key to a room in a forgotten castle, where he can store and withdraw items from. In other words, a subspace artifact. He uses it to take out the dragon soul plant which will make him calm upon consuming and a cloth to tie up the spear to his hand so he won't lose it. Goth tries to stand up, thinking that there is no way a miner could stand up against the predator. Out of nowhere, it screams and uses its skill to inflict fear deep down into Goth's heart. Goth then remembers the stories his seniors had told him when he was new. A few years ago, when an adult predator attacked a nearby village, it was said that the villagers couldn't even blink and had to witness the event, because they were paralyzed by fear and couldn't even move a muscle. There was nothing they could do except wait for their turns. But what he witnesses now is so far from that story, and with a spear in hand, Zephyr trades blows with the predator. Because of the dragon soul plan he prepared, he didn't get affected by the fear effect. As he doesn't have enough magic power to slay predator with sheer strength, he takes out a green substance, thinking that's more than enough to take care of puppy like the predator. He reveals that it is the Venom King Fade's 72nd Venom and coats his spear with it which Zephyr gets from his good friend, who spent all of his life researching poisons. He says that it's better if everyone uses it, as he hopes that his poison can kill one more piece of trash to save one more person. With the spear coated in poison, Zephyr stabs the predator, making it scream in pain. It turns out that the lethal venom burial, which was made with the most common herbs, will enter one's bloodstream and spoil their organ. It also caused excruciating pain, and that's also why the Venom King was called a big sadist. As the Predator tries to stamp Zephyr, he estimates that the Venom will fill its body in three minutes, and until then, he needs to stay alive. But he forgets the fact that Predator can use its tail, and as it swings it, Zephyr fails to defend against it and gets thrown against the cave's wall. Swiftly, Predators came right in front of him with an open jaw, intending to shred him to pieces. But Zephyr has another plan for it, and right after, he throws another vial of the venom to its mouth before evading the upcoming attack. As it is not enough for him, Zephyr also lands multiple hits at once on it, making it scream even more and vomit blood. Looking at it, he had about a minute left until the poison spread, and coming again to the predator, decided to lay the finishing blow himself, its tail swinging again, attacking Zephyr, but now, he evades it and grabs onto it propels him right on top of the predator, so he lets go of the tail and with the spear in hand, he stabs the predator in its head. It cries out in pain, and it even tries to swing its claws at Zephyr, but it only manages to break the pole of the spear instead of hitting him. Zephyr then takes the broken pole and stabs it again on its head. As it was not enough to finish the predator, Zephyr took out a knife from his hip, stabbing the predator on its head again. At this point, the predator is just rampaging around the cave in pain, trying to get Zephyr off of its head. 
The only thing Zephyr needs to do now is to take the final blow on it. So he uses the momentum from the swing, jumping in the air on top of the predator. Armed with all of the recovery potions he drank all of this time, he uses a simple technique to envelop his hand with magic power. With a skill called Discharge, he punches the spear, which pierces through the predator's head. Dove, who witnessed it all, can't believe what just happened, thinking that with strength like that, Zephyr could easily move to the hunter team. He misunderstood that even if Zephyr didn't win over his good side, Zephyr's worth would have quickly been recognized anyway. But right now, Zephyr is nothing but a miner, and Zephyr needs a ticket in the form of Goth. Somewhere else, there's a group of people ganging up on the last living person from a kind of group of people. He cries that he is not the demon god worshipper, but Sahach, a man with a robe, calls out to his teammates to crush him anyway. From that crushed person's corpse, there's a centipede coming out, marking him to be the demon god worshipper. Seeing it, Sahach immediately destroys the centipede. The next thing he does is report the matter to his leader, Ned, as he is mad that in order to find one demon god worshipper, Sahach needs to slaughter seven members of the temple. It turns out that they have a plan to do a raid in a month, and Sahach promises Ned that he will rule out the heretics from the temple as much as possible and deliver a better result in the raid. Arriving at the Department of Human Resources, Goth nominates Zephyr to be a hunter in his team. The priest then processes the nominee. It turns out that in the cave, Zephyr asks Goth to talk. He wants Goth to not report the appearance of the Predator. While Goth is worried they might be found out, Zephyr takes the Predator's corpse into the Silver Room, so there's no sign of it left. It is then explained that the dungeon, such as the monster's corpse, magic stone, and items, will be taken by the temple. The only things that slaves were able to obtain were bonuses based on the clearing reward and the value of the loot. Zephyr then offers Goth a promotion in a way that will help Goth advance through three more dungeons, and Zephyr will get all of the monster's corpses. While waiting for the ID tag for transferring to become a hunter, Zephyr thoughts about the great raid with the Temple Knights that is scheduled to happen within the next month. That's where they will discover the item that will cause a huge wave over the entire continent. Zephyr determines to get his hand on it, and he needs to be on the raid party to change the future. When the procedures are completed, Zephyr has been told to collect all the essential equipment from the supply depot. So he walks there with Go, thinking that he enlisted to the hunter team after the raid participant list was announced. And the number of the raiding party is about 20. In order to join, he needs outstanding achievements or connections in order to get into that party. As Goth explains about the depot, the team that hunts the demon god worshipper passes on them. So Goth grabs Zephyr's head, telling him to bow down. Goth explains that they are the team of heresy examiners, the direct slaves of the examiner. The leader of the party is Sahach, who is also called the Mad Dog. That's when Sahach suddenly calls them out, pointing his hand at Zephyr. He introduces himself, and when Goth tries to cover for Zephyr, Sahach releases his killing intent and makes Goth back off. But it doesn't affect Zephyr though. Instead, it makes Sahach certain that no one else would notice, and since Sahach was blessed to have extremely heightened sense, he knows that Zephyr is a high-level expert. It turns out that all new slaves are performance tested prior to being assigned a department. A test in strength and magic, they always give one the opportunity to battle for the hunting team since they're always in need of new recruits. However, such a high-level expert was in the mining team and was nominated to be transferred to the hunting team, which is simply unnatural. All of Sahach's members swiftly circled around Zephyr as Sahach then held him off, intending to ask a few questions. He asks whether Zephyr has ever heard about a demon god worshipper. It turns out only a handful of people know about its existence, and no one knows them better than Zephyr, the demon god worshipper, believers that worship are the demon god Tartarus. They were the beings that would lead humanity to destruction in the upcoming battle for human survival, and they betrayed all of humanity. Sahach explains that he works under Lord Ned, saying that he sees Zephyr as dangerous. With simple words, words, Zephyr provokes them, saying that they wouldn't be able to hold their honor as something unfortunate would befall them. So, Sahach activates a spell called Red Field, which buffs him, and the more the users are on the field, the buffs also increase, while Zephyr uses a weird stance that Sahach had never seen before. In an instant, Sahach appears in front of Zephyr, and he uses Accelerate and starts trading blows with Zephyr. Sahach uses Trust, which Zephyr easily dodges, and launches his own attack, which only scratches Sahach's forehead. As Sahach rolls back away from him, he tries to kick his leg, thinking that it worked. But Sahach realized that he just kicked a steel pipe and ended up losing control of the fight. Zephyr then bombards him with punches, and even with the buffs from the red field, Sahach can't do anything against it and loses his sword. Fighting Sahach, Zephyr fails to notice the attacks that come towards him, so he has no choice but to take it head on. The man with a massive build swung around his steel ball. He asks Zephyr to play with him now, but Zephyr just mocks him, saying that he is just a pet that is being raised. He throws it towards Zephyr, but Zephyr easily gets out of the way of the trajectory of the attack. 
as the steel breaks the stone road and starts going to go towards Zephyr along with the continuous attack from the man. Zephyr keeps showing a swift movement to block everything that comes his way. But, as time passes, everyone else starts getting stronger in the red field while Zephyr keeps tired out. The bulky guy manages to tie Zephyr's hands with his chain, and that allows an opening for Sahach to strike Zephyr's back. Sahach says that the playtime is over, and he tells Zephyr to just quietly beg for his life. With the buffs from the red field and Accelerate, he dashes towards Zephyr, but instead of finishing Zephyr in just one attack, Sahach plays with tied up Zephyr, wounding him slowly. Sahach's abilities have increased by 80%, saying that there is nothing Zephyr can do when faced with overwhelming speed like that. But what he doesn't know is that Zephyr watches every move he makes, where suddenly, with tied hands, Zephyr just stomped him, slamming him into the ground. Zephyr grabs Sahach's hair and lifts him up, only to hit him again, adding that their teamwork is trash as Sahach keeps flying around like a fly which makes the bulky guy have no opening to land an attack. Then Zephyr faces the bulky guy again, asking why he is so far away from his target while having such a tanky build. Zephyr then uses his aura to draw the man closer and consecutively attacks the other members with the steel ball. In the end, the heresy examiners are all defeated, and Sahach asks Zephyr whether he is really a god worshipper, which Zephyr brushes off, saying that Sahach doesn't have the right to hear the answer. Meanwhile, a man with red hair watches them fight from the temple, he is surprised to see Zephyr, thinking that Zephyr is someone who has been sent to hunt him. After the fight, Zephyr goes somewhere to deal with something else, walking towards an empty alley. The next thing that happens is he breaks down in pain from a side effect of mana freezing when his mana is depleted. Then, something shows up in the sky, marking the sign that the collection is about to start. Zephyr faces the spirit of Shylock, saying that under the authority of the god of loan, Uzra, he confirmed that Zephyr's mana had fallen to zero, and the skill Wall of Iron would start its collection. It turns out the passive skill Wall of Iron isn't just a skill that increases defense and endurance. The reality is that during skill usage, fatigue and damages will pile up in debt. When the user's mana has reached zero, the accumulated damages are regained in full, like debt from a lone shark. Many adventurers have used that skill to challenge higher level dungeons and meet their untimely death. The God of Loan, Uzra, is the double-edged sword that feasts on the destruction of humans. Skylock then calculates the accumulated damages Zephyr had suffered. As the calculation is completed, he summons a massive bell to stomp on Zephyr. But Zephyr knows it well and starts going for his emergency recovery potion, which he hides in his hand. When the bell is about to fall right on top of him, he drinks the potion, and Shylock confirms the mana Zephyr has, then cancel the collection and disappears. Zephyr then laughs at Uzra, saying that Uzra had underestimated him, adding that he comes prepared for things like that since he is the pro who survived for a year even after humans went extinct. He doesn't forget to provoke Uzra, thanking him and giving him the middle finger before he passes out. While Uzra is so mad at him, having to learn that he had been played by Zephyr. The next thing Zephyr knows, he wakes up being tied in a bed, and what welcomes him is the priestess who gave him a loan. She intends to collect the money that Zephyr used to buy all of the recovery potions before going to the dungeon. The priestess knows that Zephyr is going around the dungeons doing dangerous things, which makes her furious, so she decides to collect the collateral for the loan which is Zephyr's organ. Now, Zephyr is having a hard time remembering the name of the priestess as her men prepare to cut his arm off. Once he remembers it, he calls out to her, and she tells her men to stop. She is startled by how Zephyr knows her other persona and asks him who he is. Zephyr smiles as she tells her men to go out of the room. She then asks him again how in the world Zephyr knows that name, which he offers calling her the monster broker, White Rose. He then explains that she is a sister of the Shrine of Light, Anna Primrose, and the name of her other persona is the White Rose, who has a connection with the underworld and exchanges monster corpses, equipment, and information regarding people. It's crazy to attempt to clear a raid dungeon with only the cheap equipment one can find from the hunters. That's why he will need to negotiate with the priestess to get some gear. He then asks her to talk as he couldn't be happier that she has picked him up and tells her to untie him. Meanwhile, Sahach wakes up angry, throwing stuff around and scaring the nurse who takes care of him. He is so pissed remembering Zephyr telling him that he has no right to know who Zephyr is and is determined to kill Zephyr himself. Knowing the ruckus, Ned, his superior, comes to check on him. As Sahach tries to stand up, giving him respect, Ned tells him to just lie down while also telling the healers to go out. Ned tells Sahach that he heard stories about what happened to him. As Sahach tries to apologize to him, Ned stops him by feeding him a knife into his mouth. He says that every single person that he came across today, for the entirety of tonight, was talking about the incident. Ned is angry that Sahach dared, in front of all those slaves, get beat up like a useless dog. To make matters worse, Ned also mentions that in the past two years, Sahach can only manage to find two demon gods worshippers. Sahach can only kneel in front of Ned, trembling to ask for one more chance, begging that he will do anything. 
Ned then tells him to not let those who have brought them shame live, as Ned will decide what will happen to him after he does that. Right after, Ned gives him a mysterious package that contains a demon god worshipper starter pack. Ned claims he finds it in the room of the demon god worshipper, and explains to Sahatch that he doesn't have the leisure to choose the means of doing his tasks. In the end, the mad dog Sahatch, the enemy of all of those who are a part of the hunters, accepts to be one of the demon god worshippers. He is so ecstatic to have another chance, claiming that he won't be the one that dies. Instead, Zephyr will. It is then revealed that Ned is a disciple of a demon god worshipper official. He knows that Zephyr uses his school's martial arts techniques, while the only people who know those techniques are his master and the four brothers. He plans to use Zephyr to get rid of Sahatch while thinking if Zephyr is not on his side, he can just get rid of Zephyr himself. Back into White Rose's dungeon, Zephyr takes out the Predator's corpse that he saved in his silver room. They both agree that he will give him another Predator's corpse, and Rose will purchase items for him. After finishing dealing with White Rose, Zephyr goes back to eat with his party. The atmosphere gets awkward, so Zephyr claims he doesn't drink horse piss and takes out an expensive and rare drink. He notices it from Rose's dungeon and asks her to give it to him. With that, they start getting to know each other as he thinks that he will be sure to create results with those guys, and they will help him take care of monsters around there. Whether he likes it or not, they are now in the same boat until the raid. Since he was on the same team as Goth in his past life, Zephyr already knows what to do with him, as he only needs a good teacher to improve. However, he should try to work with the other members as well. On the other hand, Dale, the blonde member, doesn't actually like Zephyr and thinks that they will all soon know the truth about what happened once time passes. He thinks Zephyr is a scammer that won't last long. The next dungeon they go to is located at the cave town Edeline, a town created hundreds of years ago by building homes within the mountains. Inside, it is full of spider webs where Zephyr uses his mana detection. He spread mana outwards from his body, then through the ground, and was able to extend the range of his senses. The shape of objects, any sudden movement, and objects with magical power instilled, Zephyr can sense everything as if he is touching it himself. Before they enter, Zephyr briefs them for a moment, where he explains that inside the dungeon is a black steel spider nest. Counting out Zephyr, it's actually outside their capabilities though, so Dale is against the idea of entering the cave. Black Steel Spider is a spider-like monster who has high offensive stats but an even higher defensive stat. The worst of all is the rate at which they are able to grow in numbers, which makes a nest of Black Steel Spiders more difficult to deal with than a grown predator. But Zephyr says to him that Dale doesn't need to enter if he doesn't feel confident in him, adding that Zephyr can easily clear it by himself. Dealing with the Predator and a duel with the Heresy Examiner Sahatch are both instances that Dale hasn't witnessed himself, so he assumes that the dungeon isn't as dangerous as Zephyr says. Thinking about it, Dale makes a sloppy mistake touching the spider web and notifying the spider nearby. As the spiders attack him, Zephyr grabs Dale out of the way and tanks the little spider mob that came. With Zephyr's passive, the spider is unable to bite his hand, and he tells the members to gather close to him to deal with the spiders. Even though it's just a small spider, the web is still hard to deal with, and it will root them if they are not careful. Fortunately, Zephyr instructs them to cover their weapon with a cloth to shake off all of the spider webs, and it's working. With a mana punch, Zephyr obliterates all of the spiders that attack them. Zephyr thinks that that is pretty normal for him, even in his past life. He constantly had to train soldiers, and there were plenty of them that didn't know what to do, even if he told them the specifics. Since Dale was able to concentrate on taking care of the problem after messing up, it's not that big of an issue, and it's better for Dale to experience things for himself rather than Zephyr telling him everything. The next thing they need to deal with is the bigger spiders. Before they went in, Zephyr told them that the flesh near the stomach area was softer than the back, suggesting they go for it. And they did, so while the tank aggro the spiders, Dale and Goth keep going for the spider's soft flesh. In the end, the three of the original party are able to defeat the spider, and Zephyr commends them for it, saying that it's not that bad for their first time dealing with the spider. While being broken and knowing everything, Zephyr kills a truckload of spiders, while the three of them only manage to kill a single one. Zephyr tells them to regroup and eat, as what's left from the dungeon is the boss. Goth asks him what he used to be before being a slave and Zephyr claims to be an explorer. Goth rephrases, asking whether Zephyr was part of a large guild or an apprentice of someone famous, which makes Dale curious about it. Instead, it reminds Zephyr that he is indeed an apprentice of someone great in his past life. But he doesn't tell them that, so he asks them to finish quickly and break the spider legs to use as a weapon. He then tells them to go out as he will finish on his own, which they refuse to do so, saying that since they had gone that far, they want to stay and finish it together. So Zephyr explains that they are not going to do nothing because he gives each of them a role. So Zephyr goes forward inside the spider queen's nest to find the breeding room, and the queen has a special spider knight whose sole duty is to protect their queen. From the silver room, Zephyr takes out a bunch of bags of ordinary flour, and then throws it towards the queen's guard. 
In an instant, Zephyr takes out a crossbow, shooting an arrow towards the spider. The flame burst within the thick flower will ignite the flower particles, causing a chain reaction. That is the principle of a spell called a dust explosion. Of course, the spiders aren't that weak enough to die from something like that and start chasing Zephyr. So he runs while shooting poison arrows at it, making it scream in pain. Before Zephyr goes, he shows a pouch he takes from the spider where black spiders produce their web. He explains to them how to use it, lays traps with the webs where he tells them to, and stays on guard while they are waiting for him. The inside of the queen's room is going to be filled with many more spider webs than the outside, so they won't have a chance if they fight inside. So they need to lure the queen out, as a spider knight trapped within the web that the party laid. Zephyr takes out the spider leg that he broke before and starts attacking the spider knight. Then, what comes after is the queen itself, chasing Zephyr as it wants to devour him whole. As he nearly goes out towards the cave's entrance, the queen shoots poison towards him. Fortunately, he closely manages to jump out of the cave with the queen right behind him. He tells everyone to start attacking, and with the spider legs in both hands, Zephyr also starts attacking it. Since the only one who can take the boss head on is Zephyr, he will be tanking from the front line, and the other party members will deal damage to it. Goth tells them that the queen's outer shell is the only hard thing while the inside is a bunch of nerves. So, with a knife, he stabs the queen's leg and then hammers it to completely destroy its inner part. While Dale covers his blade with poison that Zephyr gave him, he feels excited, failing to notice that the queen's sting is coming at him. Fortunately, Zephyr is able to hit its head hard, which makes it miss its attack. He is able to block everything that comes at him as the other members fail to follow what Zephyr is doing. Well, it's just like Zephyr said, where he explains that the queen spider will definitely stay on the spot that it initially lands on. Because the queen usually stays in the breeding room to lay eggs, it has a habit of limiting the movement of its back legs. Because of that, the space behind their legs is usually safe, while most of the queen's attack will be focused on targets in front of it. When the poison reached its body, the queen started rampaging, and Zephyr dashed forward right into the queen's stomach. He reaches for the poison gland in her neck, pulls it outside, and then ties it up with his belt. With that, it won't be able to use its poison for about 5 minutes, and Zephyr starts climbing on its arm and jumps up to stomp its head, shocking it. In the end, they manage to slay the spider queen. While Dale is the only person who notices Zephyr is the one letting them have it, and now he knows that Zephyr is really that strong. Looking at the queen's corpse, Zephyr thinks about how he can't get rid of the sign that the spider queen is there, so he decides to just take the bigger spider's corpse to give to Rose. Then suddenly, Dale lays out a carpet for him, asking him whether he wants to rest and let Dale take care of the rest. Now, thinking about it, with the three of them, things aren't too bad, as Zephyr can save some energy to deal with the spiders, and he can use them more in the future, but they wouldn't be able to help him deal with what's to come at him in the future. Back at the temple, Rose deals with the buyer who buy the corpse of the predator. It is unthinkable for her to do shady deals inside a temple during the middle of the day, yet it is quite interesting to see. Zephyr thinks that there isn't a single naive person in this world who thinks that all temples are holy places void of corruption. He then explains that the money that worshippers donate to temples continues to pile up, resulting in entire cities being constructed around temples. That's all because the temple knights and battle slaves make sure that monsters don't approach them. Walking together, Rose tells Zephyr that they are quite lucky to find a good price for the predator, though she doesn't think that he will bring black spiders that quickly. She also gives him a silver alchemist set that he needs to use later. Suddenly, Ned appears from behind, calling out to them. It reveals that Ned is one of only 12 class 1 examiners, a skilled member acknowledged even by the temple, the direct superior of Sahach, and the one that beaten Sahach is right in front of him talking with Rose, which makes her anxious. He tries to take Rose away, intending to talk to her alone, but Zephyr gets in the way. Ned comments that he remembers Zephyr having a nice relationship with their Sahach, but Zephyr ended up provoking him, saying that his memories aren't that good, and he can't seem to remember useless people. They both then release their aura, making them clash, each with their own strength. It makes Rose freaks out, as she can't believe the sharp magic energy coming out from their aura clashing. And now she knows that Zephyr is not just a normal battle slave, which is on par with the Temple Knights or even beyond. Although Ned wasn't intending to go there to fight, he decided to have a little fun anyway. As they use the same technique, Ned wants to know Zephyr's strength. But, as they are going to strike each other, Rose uses the Temple Authority to command them to kneel. Bound by the stigma of slaves engraving, they have to follow those who are marked by the followers of the light, which is Rose. She then slaps Zephyr, asking why he is daring to do something like that, and she takes him away as she claims the need to teach him a lesson. As she walks away with Zephyr, she doesn't forget to tell Ned that Zephyr is her toy, and if he tries to do anything, she will kill Ned. Finding somewhere quiet, Rose explains that he can just fight everyone around him, adding that Ned is really dangerous as she is still shaking. 
since Ned is a class 1 examiner. There isn't a single person who knows how he fights since all of the people who saw him fight are dead. She then keeps nagging as Zephyr is now her money printer. After that, she tries to apologize that she slapped him and tells him to be careful as she won't be able to protect him outside of the temple. Zephyr then brushes her off, saying that he was just saying hi to Ned, adding if Ned really does something, there is nothing she can do anyway. He then goes to the lab, leaving Rose behind. Meanwhile, Ned is in a bad mood, and he has to feel the power of the engravement. He remembers when he is still with his master when he tells Ned to have a slave engravement, and tries to refuse it. His master explained to him that their brethren who infiltrated the temple as priests were revealed and executed. The only thing the demon god worshipper can do is to engrave themselves so the followers of the light won't suspect him. He also adds the mission can only be done by Ned. His master claims that they found a way to nullify the mark. But Ned is not going to use it now and will wait for the right time. In an away village, Sahach comes inside. He asks around how many people are in the vicinity, and a random person says that there are about 50 people. Fully recovered, Sahach then uses a red flute, and a demon appears behind him, which is immediately after the people around him. The demon is feasting on the people while Sahach bathes in blood, thinking that with his power now, he will claim his revenge against Zephyr. In the laboratory, Zephyr uses all kinds of ingredients, as he boils those ingredients together with the Spider Queen's poison, resulting in Poison King's number 61. He asks Rose to help him with something as he marks bunch of lines on a piece of wood from the Arcan tree that is as hard as metal. She doesn't have the slightest idea of how Zephyr is planning with the thing he gave her. Finishing marking the wood, he uses his mana to punch the log, splitting them into needles. He explains that they are called acupuncture needles, as in the east, they're used for medical purposes. Zephyr dips them into the two kinds of poisons for 10 minutes. Poison is very simple because its only use is to kill someone without much effort, or so everyone thought. But when the demon race invaded the world and the gods confiscated the power they gave them, the only thing humanity could rely on was poison. In an instant, Zephyr stabs a bunch of needles into his hand. But just because he is the maker of the poison doesn't mean he is immune to the pain. Pain spread to his whole body as the poison made its way to his veins. Even with the great pain he feels, Zephyr immediately crosses his leg and cultivating. Internal energy flow quells the poison by circulating magic power. Zephyr can increase his stats to the next stage if he succeeds. But if he fails, his physical body will shatter into pieces. To him, that can't even be called a crisis, nor can it even be called pain, remembering in his past life. He had to battle Ned to death or had to be powerless in front of the demon god. A few hours later, in the northern forest near the Temple of Light, there is a magic flare shooting high up in the sky. There's a bunch of hunters who get chased by a pack of monsters, and because they are not strong enough, they are unable to deal with the monsters. One by one, the hunters get eaten by bird-like monsters. The leader is the last man alive, and it's about 5 kilometers until he reaches the temple, which will take over 20 minutes. As he stumbles, he looks at the flock of birds, thinking that he will be reduced to ashes in less than two minutes. As the birds strike at him, they get struck by a dagger from above. A star falls like a meteor coming toward the man, making a huge explosion once it hits the ground nearby. It turns out it's Zephyr, who already succeeds in tempering his physical body, as the mana can be seen leaking out from all over the surface of his skin. The flock comes after him, but as he is getting so much stronger than before, he twists one of the bird's necks and rips it apart as if it were paper. Looking at the remaining monsters that broke from the dungeon, he counts there are 12 birds left. He uses 12 consecutive attacks on them, and with every attack, it kills every bird that remains. After dealing with it, Zephyr asks the man about the location of the dungeon, which he points out, telling Zephyr where it is, and he instantly goes there. The man regrets telling Zephyr the location of the dungeon, as four of his party members died inside, and two of the three that got out died, leaving him as the only survivor. He regrets so much for not telling Zephyr that the dungeon is dangerous and he should have waited for reinforcements. But to his surprise, there are all kinds of screams can be heard from the dungeon. And to put it simply, it sounds like a massacre. At sunrise, Zephyr comes out from the dungeon, dragging the boss's head with him. With that, Zephyr thinks about how his body feels so light, as it seems his stats have increased by two or three folds, and his experiments are successful. After that, he shoots a green flare, a signal that indicates the emergency crisis is resolved. On the other hand, Sahach finishes massacring one village after another, and as soon he reaches a certain level while also being so determined, only then will he take revenge on Zephyr. A few days later, in the temple, the news that Zephyr single-handedly cleared the uncontrolled Cicatrice nest comes to the temple's head, 
And what's more shocking is that the boss is a 30 meter long boss. Bathias, the senior heresy examiner of the 3rd Division, informs Lucius, the head of the Temple Knights, regarding the incident where both the field investigation and the survivor's testimony match. Zephyr is really making himself appealing in order to participate in the raid about 20 days from now. Matthias suggests to Lucius that they should investigate Zephyr to check if he is a demon god worshipper. But Lucius prevents him from doing so and orders him to let Zephyr be, explaining that they won't be able to investigate thoroughly, so as long as the demon god worshipper is useful to them. Lucius will use them anyway. Matthias is worried that the worshipper will steal from the temple, and that's the reason for Lucius to bring him into the dungeon. Inside, stored was the Spear of Brilliant Light and Michael's Winged Shield. Lucius spent a third of his wealth to obtain those items. He tells Matthias not to worry, as Lucius will be invincible in the raid. Back at the barrack, the trio finishes cleaning up themselves as Rose walks up to them. They bow down, greeting her, but she just mocks them, telling them to pay off their interest on time. They were wondering why Rose, the demon's sister, was coming out of their room, and Zephyr could be seen wearing a new ring that was probably given by Rose. They were surprised to see it, asking whether she had given it, so Zephyr explained that it was a ring of purification, which will assist in his mana circulation and increase his magic defense. Zephyr can also use the skill called Curse Removal once a day. Rose asks him to tell her anything he needs, as she will get everything he might need, making Zephyr all fired up. It turns out that Rose heard of it from an informant in the black market, the assassin guild called Persephone. Using poison to increase their stats, they were legendary assassins who never missed their target with their remarkable martial arts skills and deadly poisons. Suspiciously good hunting skills and body reinforcement using poison, everything's starting to fall into place for her. His dear customer was an assassin from Persephone. Due to an internal conflict, Persephone fell to ruin a few years ago, but she heard that the high nobles were their customers and were looking for the survivors and the poisons they used. And the nobles are willing to use colossal amounts of money to obtain the best talent and the best poison. Thinking about it, she thought that she should support Zephyr to the best of her ability to make him hers, but Zephyr knows that she seems to have severely misunderstood it. Well, for him, it's a good thing if she spreads rumors about him so that Zephyr's old friend can find Zephyr on his own. Not only Rose but Goth also seems to misunderstand the ring, and he thinks that Zephyr has a close relationship with Rose. But then suddenly, there's a knock on their door, so Dale sees what it's all about, but there's no one in the hallway. Only a piece of paper sticks on the wall, informing them of an emergency order for Goth's group. Looking at it, Goth wonders who would like to deliver an emergency order secretly like that. But when Zephyr takes a look at it, he knows that Ned wrote the signature and the contents. He knows that Ned prepares that invitation, so he tells the group that he will go by himself. Wearing the hunter's robe, Zephyr runs with lightning speed towards the location, thinking that there are about 20 days until the Temple Knights raid. He explains that the dungeon the raid is going to is no ordinary dungeon. It is called the Tomb of the Abominable Princess, one of the eight riddles of the world, the ruins of the ancient kingdom of Media. Due to the extreme difficulty, it has been attempted for over 10 years, but no one has reached the boss room yet. Therefore, the criteria for the rights of the raid party participation are also complex. Be in a hunting team ranked 5th and above for the past year, or be the direct slave of a priest who confirmed to participate or those who received a recommendation letter from the direct slave. One can participate only by satisfying one of those conditions. It's impossible for Zephyr's team to gain enough achievements to reach the 5th rank by starting now. Therefore, in this life, Zephyr will use Ned because Ned is the direct slave of the heresy examiner, Matthias. If Zephyr fools Ned and gets his recommendation letter, then he can enter the raid party. There's no way that Ned, who received a mission that he cannot fail, would ignore Zephyr, who uses the same martial arts as him. And Zephyr knows that Ned must be already itching to test him. Does he think Zephyr is an ally sent by his master or a criminal who stole their sex martial technique? If Zephyr is a force that Ned must bring along, he must know how strong Zephyr is. The voice that welcomes Zephyr instead isn't Ned. It was Sahach, saying how dare Zephyr come alone. So Zephyr wonders why Sahach is here, then blatantly tells him to go home, as Zephyr doesn't feel like playing with him. Sahach says that the pain from the scars on his mouth is because of Zephyr, adding that he hasn't been able to sleep soundly. So Sahach put up a stance, boasting that he would show Zephyr his new power. But with a lightning flash speed, Zephyr gets behind Sahach and knocks him out. He tells how stupid Sahach is, shouting for the people around to come out as he will take them on, thinking that Ned is a perfectionist and wouldn't test Zephyr with Sahach alone. But behind him, with the flute in hand, Sahach rises up, laughing, yet Zephyr ignores him again. So he summons the demon, claiming that he will kill Zephyr, then slowly and painfully rip Zephyr to shreds. He commands Shoggoth, the demon in his possession, to devour Zephyr. It is a surprise though, how the biological weapon of the demon god worshipper, Shoggoth, would be there to see. 
He explains that the Shoggoth hibernates in the form of an egg and awakes when they hear the sound of an instrument imbued with the power of hypnosis. The Shoggoth is a mindless creature with an infinite appetite, and physical attacks have no effect on it. It gets stronger by absorbing the mana of the human it devours. These features already make it a tremendous threat, but they are not what makes the Shoggoth truly terrifying. Mind corruption begins with being in contact with the Shoggoth. One then experiences the feeling of terror, similar to that of fear, and starts to hallucinate. When one's mind corruption reaches 100%, one enters a state of frenzy. Human in a state of frenzy lose their reasoning and start killing everyone around them, and it is the most optimal method of indiscriminate massacre. An artificial monster made by demon god worshippers to slaughter another human being with ease. Zephyr is not afraid though, because as the Shoggoth bites him, Sahach expresses how stupid Zephyr is, saying that Zephyr must want to die looking at the demon. Zephyr's eyes start to turn red, a sign that he is about to enter a frenzied state and the mind corruption is about to reach 100%. But unknown to Sahach, Zephyr has the ring from Rose. Using the skill, he removes the curse and completely incinerates the demon around him. Zephyr chokes Sahach, saying that a long time ago, he had only ever thought about keeping himself and those around him alive. Zephyr thought that was the obvious thing to do in this cruel world. But, one day, other thoughts started to appear in his head. What would have happened if he had more comrades who knew how to fight? What would have happened if the remaining humans had started working together more? If that had happened, the people he loves would have lived a little longer. That is why, in this life, Zephyr saved people that he could save and gave those who have a desire to get stronger a chance. However, Zephyr states that Sahach is not one of them. So, Zephyr starts rampaging toward the miserable man, and with a full aura in his hand, he starts to punch Sahach, who is seemingly worthy of those punches. A skill begins with a barrage of blows and with a final palm strike. Strikes the fog of blood that the opponent coughs up, that ruptures the drops of blood and generates lightning. It is a skill known as the Dragon's Roar, feared by many in the East. Dragon King-style secret art, Thunderclap Palm. An instant death must have been very painful, with all the electricity flowing through his entire body. It befitting death for a bastard like Sahach. Zephyr then picks up the flute, as physical attacks don't work on the Shoggoth, so he plays a song that breaks the connection of magic power that connects the Shoggoth's cell. Suddenly, Ned appears, surprised that Zephyr is able to play the tune, adding that Zephyr knows quite a lot of things. Finally, the time has come, and Zephyr needs to pass Ned's test and make him believe Zephyr is one of the demon god worshippers. That's the only way to change the future, and the debt in Zephyr's heart that he couldn't repay in his past life. He wants Ned to face a different end this time, and in order to do so, Zephyr needs a chance to get closer to Ned by fooling him. Ned says that he has been watching the whole time, and he has come to the conclusion that Zephyr is a target for elimination. So he dashes towards Zephyr with lightning speed, going to strike him while Zephyr is ready with his stance on the secret technique. In a flash, Ned slashes Zephyr 14 times, but Ned feels something weird in his hand, as all of his attacks miss Zephyr. Suddenly, there are three stones imbued with a lighting aura going to him. It shows how impressive Zephyr is and that he manages to slip through all of the strikes and even counterattacks. Ned knows that there shouldn't be many people on this continent aside from his master who can surpass his sword speed, so he assumes that Zephyr must have used another method. But Zephyr asks him why Ned is fighting an unarmed person with a sword. So he just dropped the sword and started his own stance as well. The two people face off with each other using the exact same martial technique. Using the same principle as the thunderclap palm, Ned wraps his body in electricity and gains explosive acceleration. But those from the same clan know how to counter that move. Zephyr uses the counter with the exact power to completely negate Ned's attacks. Now Ned knows that Zephyr is the real deal, thinking that it makes it even more confusing as only his senior brother and he has been taught the secret art of the Dragon King style. So he asks who the hell Zephyr is. It is then explained that the demon god worshipper ranked 9 is the master of the east and is a lone dragon. A man from the east who crossed the land of the demon, the Sahara Desert, from the eastern continent to here, the Aslan continent. He rose to the executive rank of the demon god cult with his mysterious martial art technique, Dragon King style, and had two successors. One is the biological son of the lone dragon, named Strong Dragon, and the other is one that he picked up from the Aslan continent, Ned Streer. To gain a deep understanding through sparring, two successors are required. Therefore, no more than two are needed since the principles of martial arts techniques must be kept confidential. So, it is suspicious that Zephyr knows the technique and obliterates the valuable asset of the cult, the Shoggoth. Zephyr then tells him that it's pretty simple if he uses his head a little, adding that he is a shadow apprentice, 
prepared for when one of the two apprentices dies. A shadow disciple that even the insiders don't know about is secretly trained in case something happens to the official successor. But, they are killed if the official successor safely develops and inherits their master's position. So Zephyr takes advantage of that situation. If Zephyr telling the truth, his identity should be the most well-kept secret. So Ned asks him why their master sent him there. Zephyr explains that the orders he received were to hide his identity from other demon god worshippers and to participate in the raid with his own strength. He adds that he is supposed to take over Ned's mission in case anything happens to him. Ned asks whether Zephyr knows what his mission is, and he answers that Ned is going to run away with the dragon's heart. It is then explained that there is a magic stone formed in the heart of a dragon called a dragon heart. It is the greatest item said to give one power comparable to that of a dragon. Zephyr says that there's no way the Temple Knights can follow the electrical acceleration of the Dragon King style. The moment Ned gets his hands on the dragon's heart, no one will be able to stop him from escaping. However, whatever Ned can do, Zephyr can do as well, adding that their master was anxious with just Ned on this mission. The reason why Zephyr defied his order and lured Ned there with something flashy was because the raid participation conditions were more complex than he expected. He doesn't want to take the hard way when the easy way is right in front of him. That's that. But Zephyr adds that, in truth, he personally has something to tell Ned. Zephyr comes closer and whispers it's about the blood tears. It's the stolen treasure of Ned's family, as he is following his master in order to reclaim it and take revenge on the temple. The only ones who know that are his master and Ned. In the end, Zephyr says that he will tell Ned when he judges that Ned is trustworthy. So then Ned tells Zephyr that there's somewhere he needs to go first, asking him to come along. On an abandoned building near the temple, Ned announces that he has brought the last one. Introduces Zephyr, who was sent by their master to assist in his mission to the demon god sect. Adding that Ned has gone through the procedures to confirm Zephyr's identity. It turns out that Matthias is also one of the demon god worshippers, who will lead 40 of them that will follow Lucius in the raid. While Matthias explains the plan again because of the newly recruited worshipper, Zephyr thinks it's so absurd that it's not even funny. They are different from Sahach, who completely relied on items and monsters, or the past Zephyr, who had nothing but ambition at that current time. The demon god worshippers are all very strong. They are an elite force formed for the sole purpose of executing that mission. Zephyr thinks that if all of them have that much strength, then why are they following the demon god? Ned thinks that the fact that Zephyr has revealed himself means that his master does not completely trust him let alone Zephyr knowing about the blood tears and thinking that the one his master trusts may not be Ned but Zephyr. But he convinced himself to not waver, as his master promised him, that if Ned become an important person to his master, he will fulfill Ned's revenge. In a roundabout way, Ned needs his master for the sake of his revenge. So for that purpose, he needs to get his hands on the dragon's heart no matter what. Also, if Zephyr is a shadow disciple who has been groomed to become Ned's replacement, Ned assumes that Zephyr may desire to aim for Ned's neck. With that, Ned tries to shake hands with Zephyr, thinking if Zephyr wants to snatch away his life, it's better to keep Zephyr close to him rather than keep his distance. Zephyr thinks that if he can shift Ned's trust to him, Ned will be a great help in overcoming everything that will happen in the future. Zephyr had countless connections that disappeared in vain. Among them, the first one he will pick back up is Ned. Back in his past life, Zephyr gets threatened by Ned, where he is injured, and Ned asks him to choose whether he will help Ned escape the cave by learning the ultimate martial arts technique or to die and become beef jerky for him. Zephyr's first connection that made him into the strongest human is his master, who taught him the Dragon King style was Ned. On the next day, the names of the raid party members who would clear the tomb of the abominable princess dungeon were announced. Everything is according to plan, as Zephyr should settle out all his own arrangements now. Although their time together was short, Dale understand that Zephyr has a goal. And that goal is much bigger than anything that ordinary people can imagine. Zephyr tells him that as long as he trains himself to death, there will come a day when he will be able to walk alongside Zephyr, asking him to follow Zephyr then. With that, they bid their farewell, and now the two people who should be dead by now are alive. Looking at their shining eyes, Zephyr feels good since it means that he didn't make a mistake. However, those guys are as good as dead as of now because three years from now, if the demon god worshippers succeed in their summoning, many people, including those guys, will lose their lives. To stop that from happening, Zephyr must get his hands on the dragon's heart. The next one is to come to Rose for equipment. The dungeon he is going to is crawled with living and moving skeletons. They do not feel pain since they are already dead and their bodies are made up of only sturdy bones. Therefore, to defeat a skeleton, one will need to break it with a blunt weapon. Additionally, Zephyr picks up a sword called the Twilight Long Sword, as the things he needs to worry about in the dungeon aren't mere skeletons. The Temple of Light that's trying to end the 10-year dungeon clearing attempt, and the demon god worshippers who will jump into the fray for the survival of the cult. Zephyr must push through them all and obtain the dragon's heart. In other words, the entire party is his enemy. And one more thing, Ned still doesn't trust Zephyr yet. 
For now, even if he is telling Ned the truth, it won't be easy to convince him. So, if Zephyr fails to persuade Ned, and they end up fighting, it won't just end in the middle this time like it did before, because it will be until one of them dies. Now, an enchanter named Angelia comes inside. She will imbue the sword that Zephyr takes with divine power, and it turns out that she is one of the greatest enchanters in the temple. With the power of the Goddess of Light bestowed on her, she enchants all of Zephyr's equipment, though he needs to prepare to fight his party members. He can't slack off on preparations for the dungeon, and with that, his basic preparations are complete. Rose pays Angelia with the enchants, totaling 3,000 gold. Looking at it, Zephyr is surprised to learn that Angelia's backdoor enchantment is only that much. He thanks Rose that he doesn't need to pay commission, and it turns out that Rose has already prepared for some losses to score some points with Zephyr. Now, Zephyr thanks her again as she already helps him that much, saying that Rose was probably short on time as well, which makes her blush, and there she goes, the first victim of dragon god Zephyr. Then, he tells her that he has no more money left, breaking Rose apart in an instant. He claims that he is unable to find anything worth money, and he doesn't have anything he can give to Rose. In the end, he takes out the two poisons he cooked. Looking at them, Rose freaks out, thinking that it is the deadly poison of Persephone, so she begs him to give them to her. After giving it to her, Zephyr tells her to not sell them to the contact named Mole as he is dangerous, so he bids his farewell to her and goes back. The next morning, the party lined up in the training ground, and there were quite a lot of people who would go to the dungeon. Among all those people, only a few survived Zephyr's past life, and it will be no different this time. The party leader, Temple Knight Captain Lucius, arrives, greeting everyone who lined up. The raid party members are as divided into vanguard and rearguard teams, and they will be under the command of four individuals. The healer captain, Arno. Rearguard captain, Leona. Vanguard captain, Matthias. The party captain, Lucius, is the bearer of the stigmata given by the gods and is called the saint. He says that with that raid, they will put an end to the 10-year-long dungeon clearance attempt, and with that, he tells them to endure the harsh training that begins today. As the party members cheer up with him, praising the almighty area. At the special training ground, Shrieking Peak, Zephyr climbs up the cliff, thinking that the glory for the party members is only a gimmick. However, the true nature isn't some virtuous goal such as the action of a hero or for humanity but purely for business. They engage in politics to gain the dungeon clearing rights, gather party members, and gather investments for endless expenses such as costs for labor, equipment, potions, etc. The preparations are finally finished, and the dungeon is cleared after several years. Once the dungeon has been safely cleared, roads and cities are built on the newly secured lands, and investors can reap the various benefits, including the increased value. That's the kind of large-scale business it is. The third great temple of the Temple of Light is nothing more than an outpost for St. Lucius to clear the dungeon. The people who participate in the raid are nurtured, and those selected for the raid are the elites who have received daily training. In the training ground, the instructor explained to assume the light she summoned as the enemy's magic attacks. Those who are hit three times are dead, so they need to raise their hand and come out. So, the mock battle begins, and the soldiers have a hard time, even though it is only for training. However, Zephyr easily pierces through the puppet, and Ned instructs him not to reveal the Dragon King style in a place like that. Together, they go toward the golem, and with his nimble feet, Ned jumps around from the puppet to the golem. Simultaneously, they work together to defeat the golem along with the puppets. The training to eliminate 500 golems is complete, so they can have a 15-minute break. Arno is surprised to see both Zephyr and Ned are doing better than he expected and evaluates the level of the slaves as higher than in the previous raid. He then uses his light magic to completely treat their injuries and recover their fatigue. He adds that as long as the healers are around, they will be able to do four weeks worth of training in the span of two weeks that they had, and with that, he starts the training again. When the evening falls, Ned refuses to eat the food that the temple provides. Zephyr brings a plateful of food for them, but Ned still refuses, saying that he needs to maintain his weight to maximize his acceleration. So Zephyr decides to do the same since he will have to carry out the mission if Ned fails. Then Ned questions Zephyr whether he was still planning on outdoing Ned. Zephyr asks him not to make such a face, as he has brought them something good, which is an expensive drink to warm them up so they can move around better. Drinking at sunset, Ned asks Zephyr how much he knows about Ned. At first, he thought that Zephyr was trying to eliminate Ned to take his place. However, Ned realized that Zephyr had no desire to harm him during the training period, adding that if Zephyr knew Ned's deepest secret, he should have demanded things now, but he didn't. So Ned asks again what Zephyr means by saying that Zephyr will tell him when Ned is deemed trustworthy. Looking at him, Zephyr thoughts that Ned is different, but at first, Ned was blindly trying to kill him, yet being together for two weeks had an effect on their relationship. So Zephyr tells him that he is asking the wrong question. 
What he should ask should be where the blood tears are and who has it. So Zephyr tells him where the sword is and who has it. It is explained that the Strier Barony's heirloom, the demonic sword, Blood Tears. It is a trophy that their ancestor obtained after defeating the demons of the desert. Once their ancestor offered up that sword to the king, he gave their family the title of Baron and ordered them to watch over the Blood Tears for generations to come. Ned's father tells him that one day, Ned will become a baron of the Streer family, as he will also inherit that honorable mission when that time comes. His father encourages him to become a knight, which befits that sword. But then, the temple came knocking, the baron screaming for the temple to give back the sword as he only put the baron title and estate as collateral for the loan. But not the blood tears. The priest explains to him that he gave up his baron title, and the blood tears belong to the baron, so he no longer has any authority over it. This makes him angry, so he unsheathes his sword in an attempt to strike the priest. But the temple's knight interrupts the attack. Right after, the knight chops both of his hands and the other stabs him in the stomach. While Ned can only watch his father getting killed in front of him, when the priest explains if his sword had reached the priest and harmed the son of the bishop, who is of noble blood, they would have to execute his son as well. That was 12 years ago when the dungeon investment started to become excessive, but raids continued to fail, which caused the economic crisis and the dungeon bubble break. The Temple of Light made a fortune by selling deformed products, deceiving investors, and maximizing their benefits. Like Ned's father, the investor who bought products through investment becomes penniless and forced onto the streets. That was all caused by the high-ranking priests, especially Priest Aldian, who scammed Ned's father, using their friendship as leverage and even taking away his life. Ned searched all over the world for the blood tears, the symbol of his family, that he hadn't even heard a rumor of. What is shocking to him is that his master, the one who possesses the blood tears. So Zephyr explained that not long ago, the master told him about the identities of the demon god cult and the twelve apostles, the executives of the cult. The cult leader and half of the twelve apostles are high-ranking priests of the Temple of Light. As they depart into the dungeon, Zephyr plants the seed of doubt that Ned's master plans to offer the cult leader the dragon heart that he brings him. If that happens, they will no longer be able to touch his body forever, and Ned's revenge will go down the drain. Zephyr ultimately says that they were deceived from the start. To say that Ned's master, who he considers to be his family, has been deceiving him, he thinks that there's no way he can believe that. But, if it's not the truth, Ned questioned how Zephyr even knew the words that his master said to him. So, he comes to a crossroads, whether to believe his master or what Zephyr said. Before long, they arrive at the gate of the tomb of the abominable princess. Lucius opens the massive gate to the dungeon the temple had been trying to clear for the past ten years. The dungeon is divided into nine floors, but, as they are already familiar with it from the last ten years, the party easily goes through the gatekeeper of the eighth floor. This time, even though the monsters appeared with a different aura than the upper floors, they were still excited to face them. Matthias' leading expresses how he will have fun. At the same time, at the Temple of Light, Bishop Alponso, Lucius's uncle, speaks with another priest, saying that they are in trouble since all of the combatants have left for the raid, thanking the other person for lending them his defense force. While Lucius was away in a dungeon, the ones who arrived at the third parish great temple were the temple knights dispatched from the capital parish, and the head of the leader is Cardinal Aldian, one of the demon god worshippers. So, there was a battle between the mobs of the undead and the mixed party of the Temple of Light, and the demon god worshipper. Going deeper into the eighth floor appears another mob of bone golem, which is several times bigger than the ordinary skeleton. With a single attack from the golem, the shockwave blasting so strongly sent several party members flying. The priestess cast her magic, called the chains of light, to restrain the golem. It works for a moment, and the party starts attacking it while simultaneously dealing with the skeleton warriors. Unfortunately, the golem breaks the chain and rampages to the party, so Matthias uses light magic, praying to the goddess, to shine a beam of light to coat his sword. In an instant, he strikes the golem twice, making a cross with his sword coated with a light aura. He then tells everyone to keep their focus, explaining that if the bone golem is nearby, the summoner of the golem must also be around. It is a skeleton mage, a mid-rank skeleton monster that can shoot magic and can order skeletons of lower rank than itself. The mage will continue making the bone golems if they don't kill it first, so they need to kill it fast before too many members get hurt. In any case, they have to get closer to the mage for the attacks from the rearguard to reach it. But Matthias is looking for an ancient tombstone, and if he doesn't find it, the battle will become a complete mess until he finds it. Suddenly, Lucius comes forward, telling everyone to step aside with the Spear of Brilliant Light and Michael's winged shield in hand. He uses a light beam to completely decimate the whole skeleton army. In the process, he also breaks the ancient tombstone, an artifact that supplies magic power to the skeleton mage. Now, both Zephyr and Ned witness the power of the saint in two million gold worth of equipment. With that, they cleared the eighth floor, 
and before proceeding to the last floor, they took a break while Zephyr sneaked around to somewhere he knew from his previous life. He looks around for a certain secret mechanism in the dungeon until he finds it. Meanwhile, in the temporary conference room, Lucius briefs the captain about the ninth floor's layout, and the boss there. They need to destroy all of the tombstones in each area, and if not, they will fail again like last year's raid. Once they reached the entrance of the boss room, they were surrounded by an undead army from the secret passages, and countless lives were lost. Now, they cannot repeat the same mistake as before and must eliminate all variables, even if it takes time. The most important mission of this raid is to conserve as much of Lucius's stamina as possible and escort him to the boss's room in his best condition. It's possible for him, in his current condition, to defeat the monsters. As a year ago in the boss room, looking at a single monster was enough to break their morale. The gatekeeper of the boss room is so strong that they cannot break through. Suddenly, at the sight appears a Shoggoth that surprises Matthias as the demon god worshipper prepares five Shoggoths to carry out their mission. But right now is not the time for it. At that moment, the reason why all four leaders looked at the same place was due to some unknown instinct or intuition. All the strong possess a danger sensor that is more sensitive than anyone. Zephyr presses a secret button, where a helm appears, and he starts to roll it. As he did, the layout of the ninth floor changed, and the floor's block moved in a bizarre way. Back at the gathering of demon god worshippers the day before the raid, party members were announced. Matthias explained the plan to the members again. He reveals that Lucius borrowed the legendary item of the Pope called the Stake of Faith. Lucius plans to use it by sticking it between the doors. After that, the demon god worshippers have to take care of Lucius and push him to the position farthest from the entrance. Then, after Ned steals the dragon's heart and slips past the doors, only then will they awaken the Shoggoths. As long as they are able to create an opening, the boss will take care of Lucius for them. After that, they will come out of the dungeon and report to the temple that they failed to clear the dungeon. With that, he supplies the demon god worshippers with a vial that will allow them to remove the slave's brand and also the flute that will control the Shoggoths. That's when Zephyr activates the contraption, as he evaluates it won't turn into a complete disaster with all those healers, and calls out the Shoggoths. Before he goes, he shouts at the party to encircle them so it's easier for the healers to purify. So, as Zephyr activates the contraption at the same time, the four leaders look at what he is about to do. Meanwhile, Matthias can only wonder what Zephyr is doing over there. It is explained that three years after the raid, the dungeon was being used to avoid the demons. It is a protective contraption of the inner structure of the dungeon by moving every single structural material in the tomb. Because Zephyr has spent time in that place before, he knows its layout very well. As Zephyr runs deeper into the dungeon, Lucius uses the slave's brand on Zephyr, thinking that Zephyr will have no choice but to follow the command. But Zephyr doesn't stop, and Matthias knows that Zephyr already has the secret vial with him, which enables him to remove the slave's brand temporarily. So he becomes so enraged by it, using the light magic, that he intends to cut Zephyr up. But Ned comes with his light speed to strike Matthias. After that, Ned also runs following Zephyr's path, and as of now, he has succeeded in blocking Matthias' attack. But there is one more attack. Lucius uses his beam of light from his spear towards Zephyr. But Zephyr knows the layout of the dungeon very well, so he uses the timely mechanism to dodge the beam where the stone block appears right after he runs through it. Not only that, Zephyr uses his cheat skill called Strong Luck, where he can only use it three times. At this moment, Luck is on Zephyr's side, and as Ned catches up to him, he commends Ned that he is able to follow him up. Ned gives him back the favor, saying that whatever Zephyr can do, Ned can do as well. Now, it looks like Ned has made his decision to trust Zephyr. Back at the training ground, Zephyr explains to Ned if he steals the dragon's heart and brings it out to run away with it by himself, Ned will definitely die. The only option to stay alive is to clear the boss with only the two of them. Ned is angry, thinking that Zephyr is only spouting nonsense, but Zephyr tells him to sit down as he will let him in on Zephyr's amazing plan. After he finishes, Ned thinks that the plan indeed has a high chance of success, but the problem is credibility. So Ned asks what Zephyr means by saying that Ned will definitely die if he runs away with the dragon's heart. Ned explains that if he runs in the Dragon King style, no one will be able to catch him. But what if he becomes the owner of the Dragon Heart? So Zephyr tells him that the Dragon Heart can only be absorbed using a special method, so if Ned recklessly absorbs it, he will definitely die. Secondly, the one who came to the third parish temple is the carrier is Cardinal Aldian, and if Ned doesn't show up at the meeting, Aldian's twin knights will hunt him down. The twin knights are one of the ten strongest people in the entire continent. Not only that, but the entire demon god worshipper will also hunt Ned down. Now, Ned decides to trust Zephyr with his plan, so they start bouncing around in the chaotic dungeon that constantly changing its shape. 
his nemesis, Cardinal Aldian, was an executive of the demon god cult, and he was close enough to his master to be put into such an important operation. It wasn't enough for Aldian to destroy Ned's life with a scam and to think that he had been deceived his whole life. Ned looks so furious with the thoughts of the demon god worshipper. A skeleton golem appears in front of them, so Ned uses his Dragon King-style technique to kill it in an instant. He determined to destroy all of the demon god worshippers and the Temple of Light. Zephyr tells him to just focus on running, explaining that they will fail if they are even a second late. Zephyr understands how Ned feels, but he can't afford to be swept along by his emotions. Ten seconds until Zephyr's strong luck runs out, and they are about to face the gatekeeper of the boss room. The monster notices them and asks where his heart is. Not only that, he starts releasing his skill to strike them. As the aura blade comes toward them, Zephyr tells Ned to jump, and that's when they see the gap that leads to the boss room. So they evade the gatekeeper and slip into the gap at the last second when the gap starts closing. In the end, they manage to get into the boss room, and Ned is pondering if he should be surprised or confused to be able to think they actually entered the boss room like that. Ned's confusion grew as looking for the boss, a sound calling out to them, asking who they might be. She says that he can still feel the energy of her knight outside the door, wondering who they are to interrupt the slumber of the royal family. Outside of the boss room, the party finishes dealing with the Shoggoths, so they regroup and confirm the number of survivors. Lucius is wondering whether Zephyr didn't have a slave's brand from the start or if he has something that nullifies the brand's effect. Moreover, right after the Shoggoth suddenly appeared, he activated some sort of contraption. All of those events are telling him one thing. An unknown number of demon god worshippers are hidden in his party. Lucius then asks Arno about Ned and Zephyr. Arno informs him that Zephyr entered the party through Ned's recommendation, and Ned is from the unit directly under Matthias. Matthias is enraged, wondering whether they ran away because they were scared of facing the boss after making that much of a mess. He then commands his party to cease the operation and to get ready to kill or be killed. As Lucius and his party are already prepared for the battle between the Temple of Light, and the demon god worshipper. Lucius asks Matthias whether he has anything to say, where he expresses whether they really need something like words between them. Inside the boss room, Ned can't believe that the abominable princess named Princess Eurydica, who massacred her people 1,000 years ago, was such a serene and beautiful person, but she can't hide her sorrowful eyes that bewitch Ned into wishing to lessen her sorrow. As Ned is about to fall for the trap, Zephyr holds him off. To think that he would fall for such a basic illusion, Zephyr says that Ned is an idiot. Then, Eurydica laughed, saying what a shame that he missed her chance to eat Ned while changing to his true form. The serene and beautiful princess changed into a terrifying demon that lusted for blood. Welcoming the attack, Zephyr mocks Ned, saying that she is his girlfriend. Ned tells him to shut up, as he is already out of the illusion. A skill called Dark Hand, the red hand that absorbs one's stamina, and the blue hand that absorbs one's magic power. The great magician Eurydica can create hundreds of those hands at once, according to the clear dungeon report that Zephyr secretly read in his previous life. So many party members fell prey to that skill and became Eurydica's potions. Lucius, against her, who endlessly absorbed stamina and magic power to recover, managed to miraculously defeat her in a half-dead state. Meanwhile, Zephyr can feel his yearning gaze for Zephyr's failure, as if he is waiting for that moment. At the face-off between the Temple of Light followers and demon god worshippers, Lucius tries to interrogate Matthias with conviction. For now, it's impossible for Matthias to escape using the slaves, as he doesn't know the dungeon structure after it changes. So, he has no other choice but to fight Lucius to death. But it's a terrible matchup for Matthias, as the saint is equipped with legendary grade items and, with the healer captain on top of that, the battle priests. But Lucius's party still doesn't realize the demon god worshipper is on their side, so Matthias evaluates that he still has a chance. He gestures to his followers to drink the vial, and Matthias speaks to Lucius to settle that with a duel like nobles, so if Lucius can beat him, he will tell everything he knows. However, Matthias hints that it is too late, as Lucius uses the slave's brand to command the slaves to attack Matthias. With that, the demon god worshippers won't carry out Matthias's commands anymore, and in other words, Matthias can't stop their attacks without defeating them. It's truly a shame, though, as they have been friends since Lucius first entered the academy at 12 years old. They overcame countless trials together until now, as he is 32 years old and are close enough to understand each other without words. But to think that Matthias betrayed Lucius is beyond him. Now, Matthias has no other choice but to kill all of the demon god worshippers. From their corpses come out the insects that the demon god worshippers grow in their stomachs, the branded worm. Lucius expresses how disappointed he is, as he leaves the selection of the slaves to Matthias because Lucius trusts him, only to recruit the slaves from the demon god worshippers. Arno thinks that Matthias is undeniably a force to be reckoned with, as it took him 30 seconds to take care of over 30 slaves. Yet, the Saint Lucius is simply stronger, and with a light chain, he tied Matthias for judgment. 
He knew it wasn't going to be easy, but to think that Matthias's sword didn't reach Lucius even once. He wondered whether that was the fate decided by God. Lucius wants to hear Matthias's reason for the betrayal, but he refuses to answer and going to break the Stone of Revelation, a thing that allows Matthias to turn himself into a demonification form. Matthias thoughts if his fate is to be manipulated by the hands of God, and being human doesn't allow him to resist them. He is determined to detach his life as a human. Knowing that Matthias was only demonized just earlier, Lucius commands his force to start attacking so the priests can use all of their light magic towards him. But it's useless, though, because in front of Matthias, their attack is not. And in an instant, Lucius appears in front of him, going to strike him with his overpriced equipment. With a skill called Judgment, he attacks Matthias, and the shock waves go so long that it looks like Matthias is just being blasted open. But it can't be further from the truth, as Matthias holds the overpriced spear with a single hand of his. That surprises the party, so Leona feels the need to help Lucius, and she thoughts that if a legendary item doesn't work on Matthias, she needs to use the stake of faith that Lucius has trusted her with. As she moves forward, she fails to find it, and it turns out that Ned already steals it, as he expresses how truly amazing Zephyr's plan is with the inclusion of the Stake of Faith. They both keep evading the attack from Eurydica as they count down the timer for 15 seconds. It revealed to Ned that it was true and how spot-on Zephyr was, as he told him to evade the skill for 15 seconds, and the skill disappeared. It is explained that because magic skills require the user to calculate complex magic formations in their brain. It will melt from overload if multiple large skills are used in succession. One must use smaller skills compared to the large ones to cool down the brain. Now, their chance comes to attack, so they take one step back, then three steps to the side, and they evade her. Together, they climb the twig that Eurydica uses to attack them. Even now, Zephyr can't foresee everything, even if he knows the future, and a battle is a series of endless unexpected situations. That is why he prepares various equipment and, ultimately, the Twilight Sword. Now, the most important thing is how much he has accumulated until then and whether he has enough items, whether he has comrades that he can trust, whether he has an unwavering mentality even in the face of adversity, whether he has to overcome all kinds of situations that abruptly come his way, made the Zephyr now who can handle this moment, this fight. Together, they perform the Dragon King Sword technique, which is called Cloud Dragon Ascension. Now, just because they manage to behead Eurydica, the fight isn't necessarily over because right after, she changes her form, and Zephyr grins as he waits that moment. That's when he gives the hint to Ned, and he dashes towards her. As the day before, Zephyr explains that even though both of them use their secret art, it'll be impossible to slay Eurydica, as she becomes so much stronger when she goes to her second form. But she can't move nor use any skill while transforming, so they need to aim at that moment to take out the stake of faith and drop it right on top of her. It's an item that reacts to malicious energy by releasing its own strong divine energy. Now, the stake will deal the majority of the damage, so they just need to prevent her from trying to remove the stake. Even if it's a legendary grade item, the amount of divine energy it has is limited, and when it's all used up, it just becomes an extremely heavy scrap of metal. So Lucius, who spent a fortune to borrow it from the Pope, probably didn't think to use it for attacking. Well, it's not Zephyr's money anyway, so they keep attacking her like a lunatic. A while later, the stake of Faith's ignition stopped, meaning that it sensed the enemy had been incapacitated. She was so tenacious that she didn't give them any time to rest, even after using all the weapons that Zephyr had prepared, which were all out of divine power enchantment. As Zephyr drinks potions to replenish his mana, he wonders what would happen to Lucius, considering that Matthias will demonify it. Well, he has the Goddess of Light as his backer, so he won't die that easily anyway. Looking at the pitiful state of Eurydica, Ned saw an eye crawling outward. Fortunately, Zephyr noticed and told him to leave it, as she wouldn't be revived in her current state. And if she died, the door would open, and the gatekeeper would come in. He then throws a potion at Ned, telling him to recover his health, and asks him to look for the dragon's heart. Ned thought that the boss of a dungeon was called one of the eight riddles of the world, defeated by only two people and that it was truly a miracle. He considers himself to be quite strong but nowhere near strong enough to create such a miracle. And it can happen only because of Zephyr. It's gone beyond surprise or suspicion, and it's as if Zephyr is looking down on everything from above. Now, the guard outside the gate is agitated because Eurydica is calling on him, and the two people inside can feel the aura that the guard extruding. Now, Eurydica is waking up again, swirling her aura like a twister. Ned asks what the hell that is, which Zephyr claims he doesn't know. That wasn't in the Lucius's dungeon clear report that Zephyr read in his past life, so he assumes that the future changes as he didn't kill the guard. Now, Eurydica looks completely different from before. Not only that, but she doesn't seem to be simply rampaging around and starts changing the layout of the room to take the stake away. Both Zephyr and Ned don't wait for what is about to happen because, right at that moment, they simply start attacking her again. 
but they were flabbergasted by the fact that they didn't feel any slashing from their sword. Zephyr realizes that the ancient magic of Medea is space distortion. She summons her twigs again from the floor. Fortunately, Ned manages to dodge it. She sets her eyes on him as she chases him and he doesn't have enough momentum to dodge another attack. So Zephyr prevents her from finishing him, and with the web from the Spider Queen, he ties her up. Not only that, he also drags her to come to him, making her seem taunted. Using a basic mana application technique to reinforce his hand, Zephyr swung her away from Ned. As a defensive skill, space distortion is invincible, but since it distorts the space around the user, the user's attack also won't reach the opponent's. Therefore, the moment when she is about to attack is also their chance to attack. Eurydica tries to hold herself from Zephyr, who is trying to swing her around. Instantly, Ned comes right in front of her and vertically slashes his sword to cut her twigs. For a moment, he felt happy as the attack went through. But then, he also got slashed by the sword attack as she used magic called a black mirror, an ancient skill that reflects damage. She receives 300% from the attacker. After that, she summons the dark hand to absorb Ned's stamina, and Zephyr appears behind her to punch her. That's not all because as she keeps her eyes on Ned, Zephyr uses the thunderclap palm on her. As she tries to do something, Zephyr uses an eastern technique to press her pressure point to block her mana flow. Even though it doesn't do damage, he will have time to counter her. That makes her try to keep her distance away from Zephyr, so he shoots the web again to prevent her from doing so. As she comes to him, he uses the thunderclap palm again, but this time, he uses a rosary engraved on it, which allows Zephyr to heal with every bead and use it to help Ned recover. However, because he lost concentration, he got hit by her twig, blasting him several meters away. Being enraged, Eurydica uses a massive spell on him, not one but multiple spirit ball that makes his blood shiver, that decimates everything in the room they were fighting. Meanwhile, at the temple, Rose drops a teacup, thinking that something must have happened. As she thinks about Zephyr, she wishes that she should have given him a higher capacity rosary and hoping that he would be okay. But it can't be further from the truth, as Zephyr got heavily injured while Ned was incapacitated. Zephyr thoughts how ridiculous that is for him to fail the eight challenges of the world, as he could have easily taken care of her before his regression. He feels how it really hits home, how worthless he is at this time. He used up all of the consumable items he had prepared, and all of his weapons and defensive gear were destroyed with nothing left. With the perks of the skill of iron, it is just that, the god aims for Zephyr's failures. The divine beast egg that he doesn't know what might come out from. Strong luck that he had limited use, and he had already decided where he would use the remaining two chances. Sword of Light and Revive that will trap him after he uses them. Those are neither goodwill nor gifts from the gods. He remembers how the angel tells him that it's all just for entertainment for them. Their only use is to keep him tied down as they watch him despair while being surrounded by hope. While in truth, they are just lashes. When Eurydica comes to him, intending to end his life, he thinks whether he is really going to die there and all of his plan is bound to crumble no matter what he does. Zephyr decides to do something and starts writing on the floor, a thing that will make all of the gods feel like a complete shit. That's when the angel, Mercedes, appears, asking what the meaning of what he did is and why a human like Zephyr knows about the blasphemous symbol. In turn, Zephyr feels happy that he cast a bait and caught quite a big fish. The proof that the gods lost disgracefully in the past is all that Zephyr knows about that symbol. What he is certain about is that the gods decide it to be a taboo and that anyone who even draws receives divine punishment and dies. Divine punishment is the principle of the world that automatically punishes those who break the taboo. In other words, the moment he completes that symbol, he will die according to the principle of the world. As of now, Zephyr is unable to sense Eurydica, thinking that Mercedes must have put a barrier in place, and now he can recover a bit of his health. She then asks again how Zephyr knows about the symbol, so Zephyr extorts her, asking her to pay if she wants to know that. That stupefied her for a moment. But then she is mad, really mad, really, really mad, which makes Zephyr unable to finish the symbol. She said that even though he gained the interest of the gods, he was not a saint nor an angel. The fact that he even attempted to draw the symbol has infuriated countless gods, and they are crying out for her to kill him. Zephyr calls her bluff, asking her to kill him. She can try to handle the consequences as if he knows that she doesn't have the right to do that in the first place. He knows that by carefully reading through the regression sheets that the gods gave him, he can tell what they want from him. Zephyr claims that he doesn't want to do that shit anymore with the stupid perks that the gods gave him, expressing that he is probably better off if he just died there. He then shouts out to the god, asking them to bet big while they still have the chance, and if Zephyr dies now, there will be no human like him. The god and goddess are watching as Zephyr expresses his thoughts. As the goddess of light is laughing, she expresses how amusing he is, and the light comes down to earth and shines Zephyr up, telling the angel the message. As the light subsides, the time resumes and Eurydica looks so excited that she kind of really wants his meat. But her left hand suddenly gets obliterated, 
and a horizontal slash comes her way to slash the red and dark hand. It turns out that Aria, the goddess of light, gives Zephyr the sword of light, which makes the other gods riot to her, but she just says that she will add another weapon from her treasury to Zephyr later. Arcarus, another great god, expresses how he did something unbefitting of one of the great gods. However, he thoughts that he doesn't know what the demon god wants with Zephyr, so he will keep his eyes on the matter. Meanwhile, Zephyr faces Eurydica in third form with the sword of light. Even if she was a great magician, there's no way that a human's magic can block a divine artifact. It is a one-sided massacre. Even Eurydica's ancient magic is no match for the light. He uses the exclusive skill to strike the evil magic from Eurydica, which, in turn, wakes her up. In the end, she falls into Zephyr's arms, and with the curses removed, she is able to think and talk. She expresses how it feels like a dream, asking who he is to be able to drive away the evil within her. He confesses that he is her successor, one of the twelve heroes, Zephyr. A flashback to when Eurydica is still a human, a man presents the dragon heart to her, a heart that formerly belonged to the black dragon Kaiseris. She accepts it, and along with the heart, her heart also gets snatched by the man. And at that moment, she believed there would be nothing but happiness for them. But she was foolish. She explains that the last floor of the tomb is a great magic circle embodying the Tree of Life, the treasure of the elves. It is a facility that exists to purify the dreadful curse put on the Black Dragon's heart. She has extended her life by a thousand years using the magic circle's power, and finally succeeded in purifying the dragon's heart. But in exchange, she was eroded by the curse and lost her humanity. Now, Zephyr and his companion pull her out of the darkness, yet she doesn't know how she can repay them. So she asks, for what purpose does Zephyr want with the dragon heart? Instead of explaining because of they don't have enough time, he asks her to read his memories. She saw all of it, his lonely journey to fight the demon god, how the angel asked him to entertain the gods, all of his cherished comrades that he made along the way, and his process going ten years back to today. Meanwhile, there are traces of flashes in the path of the battle between the Saint Lucius and his supposedly best friend. Matthias. The demon thoughts how amazing it feels to have an omnipotent power like becoming a god, barraging Lucius, who wears his overpriced equipment. Then suddenly appears, a magic circle on the demon god worshippers that sneaks into becoming a priest. The centipedes burst open from their chest as they ran toward Matthias. He uses a skill called seizure to absorb the power stored in the branded worm from nearby demon god worshippers. Now, not only is Lucius not able to deal with a massive amount of damage to him, but Matthias has yet to get stronger. After that, he uses a skill that burns everything. Seeing that, Lucius knew that the skill was dangerous, so he told his men to maximize their defensive skills. The fire is so strong that no one except one who is defended by the overpriced shield is incinerated. Seeing how his party members get burned, Lucius asks him to not commit any more evil. That, instead, enrages Matthias, as how dare Lucius, of all people, say that. Even though he is not a saint candidate, Lucius receives the stigmata, and the original saint candidate, Matthias, gets left out. The people are disappointed after they invested so much in his family, thinking that he is a fraud and all. Matthias is furious that Lucius' family sells out the name of a saint, saying that the people can only overcome chaos if they receive Lucius's blessing and then extort the assets of the devotees. He screams his lungs out, saying that the Temple of Light is the true evil. Meanwhile, Eurydica calls out to Zephyr as the pitiful one, and she cries as she sees the future that he walks. So he tells her that this time, he wants to win against the demon god, as if someone like Eurydica helps him to help transplant the dragon's heart into him. She apologizes, as she cannot abide by that favor. She tells him that, a thousand years ago, the world was on the verge of collapse. The strongest of the seven dragons, the black dragon Kaiseris, set the entire world aflame. Although Kaiseris was one of the twelve heroes who led the war against the demons, he lost his reason and went berserk due to the demon curse. The Archmage, Princess Eurydica, along with other strong individuals such as the Knight Georgius and the Gold Dragon, stood on the side of humanity. The remaining eleven heroes had no choice but to face their old comrade Kaiseris to protect the world. After fighting desperately, the battle with the Black Dragon that went on for an entire year comes to a close with a strike from the Knight Georgius. Zephyr reveals how the demon god, Tartarus, is able to descend to the human world through summoning. And that's the entire reason for the demon god worshipper. Her goals in the past and his current goals are the same. Eurydica thinks they are so different, and she wonders why Zephyr reminds her of Georgius. He says how proud he is after Eurydica and the gold dragon spent three years purifying the dragon's heart. And after so many mock transplants, he is finally ready to be the first dragon slayer, and will have the power to protect the world. Instead, the transplant failed, and the curse ate Georgius alive. It turns out that the gold dragon betray them, making it as if the curse has been lifted from the dragon's heart. At this point, it is unknown what his motives are, but he claims that he had fun being on humanity's side. However, he also has a duty that he must fulfill. Using a skill called Dragon Tongue, 
He commands Eurydica to keep her mouth shut for eternity about the secret of the world that she learned about something else that's being censored. He says how unfortunate it is that they were too greedy for the dragon heart, adding that they could have spent their old days happily with their daughter if not for it. He also says that Eurydica's skill is quite marvelous, as the dragon heart was perfectly transplanted within Georgius's body, along with the demon curse hidden within. She fights him, and she rips out the dragon's heart from his chest with her own hands. Then, for a thousand years, after purifying the curse, she waits for a suitable hero to pass on the dragon's heart. She is already aware that Zephyr is worthy of it. However, his body is not ready to receive the dragon's heart. If she transplants it into him now, his body will either be shattered into pieces or he will be crippled. He knows that and intends to use the strong luck, which she also knows. She says that there is another moment for Zephyr to use strong luck, as she tries to say it when Zephyr asks her. She got silenced by the power of the gold dragon who cursed her thousands of years ago. She is enraged with it, as it already is thousands of years, yet he is still restricting her with dragon tongue. But she refuses to back down and indirectly says it will be when Zephyr must choose between the one he treasures most and someone else. After considering all the future risks and all, she offered to transplant the dragon's heart after all. She also suggests killing the other four dragons in a year. Well, with everything he knows now, a year is way too long to kill four dragons. He promised Eurydica that he will show her the safe world that she and Georgius wanted to see. He will accomplish it in half a year so she can lay down her duties and watch over him in the afterlife. She cries as she apologizes, and she decides to pass on the duty that she could not complete in her era over to Zephyr. She opens up her tomb to take up the dragon's heart. Now, she was finally convinced to transplant the heart to Zephyr. As she takes up the dragon's heart, she pays her respect to Zephyr's resolve, the new hero. So then she begins the process of the transplant. A few moments later, he finds himself in a dark place where he can't see anything. As he uses her mana to feel the surroundings, he knows that he felt something similar to that before and that something other than himself is in there. Suddenly, a massive eye appears behind Zephyr, and as Zephyr turns around, the thing attacks him immediately. He was Kaiserus, and he grabbed Zephyr, enraged by the fact that Zephyr dared to covet his power. That is the evil desire of Kaiserus left within his dragon heart. He smells Zephyr up, and he can smell the gods on him because, as it turns out, he hates the gods to the bone, saying that Zephyr is the last person he would ever hand over his power to, and he just eats Zephyr up, shredding him to pieces. Meanwhile, Matthias massacres the Temple Knights, and the Light Temple has nothing they possess that is able to stand up against him. At last, the last two members that survived, aside from Lucius, are in Matthias's hands. Now, all that's left is Lucius, so with the fire magic, Matthias bombards him. Fortunately, that same attack is of no use against the overpriced shield he possesses. A moment later, he uses his light magic to counter, but it is still too slow, as Matthias has already dashed behind him. In an instant, he clawed Lucius's back twice, and Matthias knew that his reaction speed was noticeably slower, signifying that he was extremely fatigued. The more time passes, the more acclimated Matthias is with the demonic power. Moreover, his recovery speed is ridiculous, while Lucius keeps accumulating damage when they exchange blows. As Lucius swings his spear, Matthias grabs it, and from point-blank range, he summons his fire magic again. That blasts Lucius, smashing him into the wall. But right now, both Arno and Leona, who have been giving him support, are lifeless. He has no choice but to use his saint power. However, he knows that he might end up in bigger trouble if he uses that power. On the other hand, Matthias wants to end their fight when suddenly the fireball he summoned disappears. It surprised him that a feather coated with a light power penetrated his fireball and annihilated it. In the end, Lucius uses his saint power to summon his future self, as he asks Lucius how much of Lucius's lifespan he will offer to summon that power. Lucius offers one month of his life, but the power seems to want half a year's worth of his life to defeat the demonification of Matthias, so he accepts it, and Lucius gets powered up with all of the light he will ever need to defeat a mere demonification. At that moment, Matthias, the demon, feels afraid of the power Lucius possesses. He is supposedly no match for Matthias, yet with a flick of Lucius's hand, he splits open Matthias's chest. In the end, Lucius barrages him with the light beam, decimating the demonification of Matthias. Looking at his dying supposedly best friend, Lucius explains that it's a saint-exclusive skill called Glimpse of Glory, and he borrows power from the angel that he becomes in the future in exchange for his lifespan. It's a closely guarded secret of the temple that only the power and portion of cardinals know. That is why the average lifespan of a saint is around 30 years, because the temple always forces the saint into dangerous places for its own benefit. The position of the saint is brutal, as they are nothing but jesters being played around by the temple. He then asks Matthias whether something like that is what he needs, to the point that he betrays his friend and abandons everything. Matthias laughs, saying that Lucius was not the only jester in that matter, and he adds that the only difference between them is that the goddess of light acknowledged Lucius, 
but not Matthias. In the end, Matthias dissipates into dust, as his hatred towards the goddess remains in his heart. The next thing Lucius does is heal his dying priests, and he is bumped by the fact that only three of the temple's party members are alive. He says that the raid is over and orders them to go back. Meanwhile, the effect of the strong luck helps Zephyr to fend off the dragon's attack. He expresses that there is no need for her to intervene just because he spaced out for a bit. He knows that he is inside of his own consciousness, and it is not reality. What is most important in there is his spirit, so all he needs to do is to recall who he was. His future self from his last life, the armor and power he possesses are coming back to him, and in an instant, he jumps off toward the dragon, punching Kaiserus's eyes as he summons his sword. He expresses how that is not the first time he has to fight the evil desire of a dragon, including the one in his previous life. Kaiserus's evil desire is the fifth that he has to conquer. He expresses how annoying the dragons are, telling the Kaiserus that if he is dead, he should just let himself be absorbed, adding that the dragons go out of their way to test people to see if they are worthy of the dragon powers. With full confidence, he tells the dragon that he will beat the shit out of him and do as Zephyr says. Kaiserus says that the only top-notch thing about Zephyr is his mouth asking him to come. With the ability to conjure his full power, Zephyr faces the supposedly strongest dragon in the world. Meanwhile, Ned awakes, confused about what is going on right in front of his face. He sees that Eurydica is busy doing something to Zephyr, and he seems to be unconscious. He thinks that might be his chance to attack the boss, but as he tries to stand up, his body doesn't want to move because he experiences mana freezing. Eurydica tells him that he shouldn't get up yet and suggests that he get some rest. Before that, she also casts magic on him, which made him throw up. It was the branded worm that he swallowed, and Eurydica commended him, knowing that the worm was in its larval state. This signifies that Ned has never used the branded worm's power, and he managed to obtain that level of strength purely through hard work. As he starts to lose consciousness again, she tells him that he will recover after a long nap. Three days later, somewhere else in the dungeon, Lucius, Arno, and Leona are lost because the dungeon's layout has changed. Arno wants to leave the place immediately, but Lucius has another plan, and he wants to look for the stake of faith. He thinks that's the only way they can escape in time, knowing that the two slaves, Zephyr and Ned, were acting strange in the raid. Lucius assumes that they are different factions from the demon god cult, and they might be after the clearing rites to the dungeon. Now, he must find them and ask for the escape method. As they move toward the boss's room, the guard knight welcomes them with his attacks. Lucius still manages to hold his ground, as the other two are wondering how the stake of faith is inside the boss room while the gatekeeper is alive. Lucius is having a hard time dealing with the gatekeeper. He can only use a glimpse of glory once a week, and he already used it against Matthias. He thinks that it's finally his end, as he feels afraid of not being able to see his family again. But, suddenly, Zephyr opens up the gate, and he witnesses Lucius being pinned down by the massive gatekeeper. Zephyr expresses how perfect the timing is, and because he was being asked for a favor earlier, now he needs to help the saint. So he uses the dragon tongue magic, telling the gatekeeper to bow down. That, in turn, smashes the gatekeeper's head into the ground and surprises Lucius with what just happened in front of him. He is so surprised that the gatekeeper, the monster that he can't fight on his own, is obeying the person that he knows as a slave. Now, Zephyr is counting down on how effective his dragon power is, and at the tenth second, the gatekeeper breaks free. He evades its attack as he knows that in order to prevent the dragon's heart from going berserk due to the imbalance between his power and the dragon's power, the dragon heart's capacity is restricted to 1%. Of course, even if there are restrictions, that is still the power of the dragon. The gatekeeper picks up his sword called Graham, which is a weapon made to kill the strongest dragon. So it's a bad matchup for Zephyr, but he has his other power as well. The Sword of Light, given by the Goddess of Light, she lifted the restrictions on using the Divine Weapon with the request to save her saint, Lucius. With that, he summons the Divine Sword's power to kill the Gatekeeper, and he says thank you to the formerly Dragon Slayer, Georgius, for his hard work in keeping the peace. Lucius knows that what Zephyr has is the Divine Artifact of Legends that only a few chosen priests know of, the Sword of Light. Now, he also knows that he was wrong, and Zephyr is not the demon god worshipper. Rather, he feels the goddess of light's presence from Zephyr. Not only that, Lucius also feels something similar to when he met the gold dragon, an undefiable pressure. As Zephyr turns around, Lucius and the temple's priests kneel in front of him, greeting him as the exalted one. It is explained that the battle between Zephyr and Kaiserus within his consciousness lasted three days. In the end, Kaiserus acknowledges his power, but that doesn't mean Kaiserus trusts him, so Kaiserus will continue to watch Zephyr from within. When he opens his eyes, Zephyr finds that Ned is unconscious and Eurydica has crumbled into ash. She also left keepsakes for Zephyr, a crystal of magic that he would have to give to Eurydica's descendants and a master key, which would allow Zephyr to move around easily in the tomb. Lucius then removes the slave brand on Zephyr and Ned. 
With that, Zephyr also asks Lucius to take care of the debts, and Lucius is more than willing to do so. Now, he also offers to help Zephyr more, as he currently thinks that Zephyr is on their side. While Ned thinks that it won't be too bad to be able to join arms with the saint, he knows that Saint Lucius is the ultimate weapon raised by the temple through the money they plunder from people like Ned. Lucius is simply someone that Ned cannot bring himself to have good feelings for. For now, he thinks that he will use anything he can, including Zephyr. Then, Lucius thinks that it's not a good place to talk and offers them to go back first. But Zephyr reveals that their dogfight has only just begun. He informs that the third parish of the Temple of Light must already have become a nest of demon god worshippers by now due to the forces that the demon god worshipper Cardinal Aldian brought, and the Twin Knights, two of the strongest in the continent. Even with Zephyr, who obtains the Dragon Heart, his strength is still constrained, so they need ample preparation. Especially against Aldian, the situation won't simply resolve with just a battle. Zephyr then takes out the Master Key and changes the layout of the dungeon to reveal the treasure room. He offers them to gear up first, as Eurydica's treasure room is one that no one has been able to enter for a thousand years. Inside, there are so many treasures that are able to fill up a country even high-grade treasures that are protected inside a crystal barrier. Even though they don't know how to take out the treasure, Zephyr simply takes them out with the master key. Zephyr also finds an elixir that is able to help them identify the demon god worshippers, which makes him happy as things are starting to work out in his favor. Not only that, the party of five also gets geared up as well, with them taking equipment that suits themselves best. Meanwhile, Ned, one supposedly Zephyr's teacher, takes a crow cape and dusk tunic bracelet, and Sword of Mirage, while Zephyr takes Graham for himself and Dragon Set Armor, that makes him also fully geared up. Now, they discuss the plan to take Aldian, where the tricky thing to deal with is that Aldian is a high-ranked noble, and all Lucius knows is that they don't have a way to identify the demon god worshippers. That's when Zephyr reveals the vial to the party, and as long as Lucius is able to identify them as the saint, the son of the goddess of the light, people will listen to him. Meanwhile, Alponso gets controlled by Aldian, and it's true that he is already succeeding in taking over the parish temple. Lucius's wife, Claudia, and their kid can only watch as she knows that Aldian is a priest and wonders why he would do something like that. Aldian asks whether she thinks that he has shown her something amusing, and not only that, he also explains that his branded worm is different from the others. As he takes it out, his branded worm has a special ability called Hive, which already evolved into a queen and is able to give birth to a larva. That allows him to brainwash and control any human who ingests it, just like the reverend in front of him. And with that, he asks her to persuade Lucius, yet as she asks him what she needs to persuade Lucius for, that makes her kid cry. His name is Marius, and Aldian intends to use his hive for him, saying that it's a little bug friend as a present for him. But Claudia fends his hand off, throwing the bugs away from the kid. That also reveals the other bugs that make up Aldian's body. As he gets enraged with her, a knight arrives, reporting that there's trouble in the temple and adding that Lucius is outside. Aldian is surprised to learn that Lucius is back that soon, so he looks outside, and what he witnesses is a lot of his knights get knocked out flat by the trio, Lucius, Arno, and Leona. He greets him, as it's been a while since they met, and Aldian is shouting why a saint would attack the priests of his own parish. Right now, Lucius is already using the Potion of Scrutiny, and when he adds a drop of that to his eyes, he will be able to see the branded worms within the demon god worshipper's body. Witnessing how powerful Aldian Worm is, the Saint of Light, Lucius proclaims to arrest Aldian for acts of heresy, adding that the sins of deceiving the Temple of Light are a heavy weight to bear. Aldian is told that he will pay for it now. That enrages him, laughing and calling the saint an impertinent brat. Alponso appears, as of now, to be controlled by Aldian, asking whether Lucius has evidence to accuse the cardinal of heresy. Of course, Lucius notices that in his uncle's body is not a branded worm, but Aldian's ability, which Zephyr spoke of. But Zephyr prohibits revealing the potions of scrutiny, as it will stir a lot of trouble that might get Lucius killed and he suggests getting surefire evidence. Eurydica's tomb is a great labyrinth that covers an extremely wide underground area. That range actually extends as far as directly underneath the third parish temple. And if they move to the right location and dig through the ground to get outside, they will arrive at the base that Matthias used, where the demon god worshippers held their assemblies. That's when they found the evidence in the abandoned mansion, and that's what Lucius brings to arrest Aldian. These are the letters that Aldian exchanged with Matthias, his plot to seize the dragon's heart, and his acts of worship to the demon god, all of which are recorded in those letters. Though there are instructions to burn immediately after reading, it seems that Matthias holds on to them in case he gets betrayed. In the end, Aldian laughs, knowing that Lucius is that thorough with investigating him or whether Matthias feels some sort of fidelity toward Lucius and blurts out everything. He then reveals it as the executive of the demon cult ranked 11 among the demon god worshippers, Aldian. 
but for now, Lucius is still unable to do anything as he also has Claudia and their kid hostage. He asks Lucius whether he would ingest the special worm Aldean has with powerful brainwashed ability, or Claudia should. Without hesitation, Lucius offers to eat it and tells him not to lay a hand on her and his kid. But in the end, Aldean decides to feed it to Claudia anyway, when suddenly Ned appears and stabs him from behind. It turns out that the Mist Bracelet is able to hide his presence, which makes the Twin Knights fail to detect him. In turn, his Sword of Mirage is able to hurt Aldean. His first priority is to save the kid and Claudia, so Ned grabs her, intending to take her away. But the Gold Knight stood in his way, so at that moment, it was his first time facing the older of the Twin Knights, and he was incredible because he possessed the power of one of the continent's ten strongest. To cover for Ned, Lucius uses his spear to distract Aldian and his knights, that leaving the Gold Knight no choice but to defend his lord. That opens the door for Ned to take on the Silver Knight and for Claudia to snatch back her kid. Now Aldian is confused about whether the Eastern One deceived him into ruining his plan and putting him into a corner by pretending to cooperate. All he thinks now is to get away, as he has lost his hostage, and if Lucius uses his glimpse of glory, he can easily kill Aldian. The Gold Knight gets down from the tower preparing to face the saint, and the Silver Knight helps Aldian run away. It is then revealed that he is Castor, rank 20 of the Demon God Worshipper, who will go face to face with Lucius, the first Son of Light. From all over the town, the people are prohibited from entering because the knights are in the middle of training, and even the mining slaves are able to see the smoke that comes out from the temple from afar. Arno and Leona go against the lower-ranking knights and priests that swarm into their way, but with their newly attained equipment, they are able to hold their ground quite well while the saint and the gold knights wreaked havoc in the temple, breaking buildings one after another. Therefore, Lucius has the upper hand. Castor thinks about how annoying it is that he has to deal with Lucius' spear. In a face-off between a sword and a lance, a lance is fundamentally more advantageous since it can be used to attack with a long range. But it's different with him as he is the tenth strongest knight on the continent, so he evades the lance's tip and goes to cut the saint up. Castor doesn't expect Lucius to wear a mirror chainmail, which reflects 50% of the damage he received. Lucius counterattacks him as he expresses that he, the saint, let the twin knight rise on the rank within the continent while he barrages Castor with trusses from his extremely overpriced spear. A divine being such as himself cannot dare to be placed in the ranks of mere humans as he pushes the gold knight into a corner. In the end, Lucius uses a light magic called Judgment, making a massive hole in Castor's stomach. As the saint lands down, Leona cheers up, calling out to him, thinking that he has managed to beat the gold knight. But, he yells to them not to come closer, as his stomach also gets hurt, because as he uses his judgment, he receives a total of 7 attacks. Castor heals up with the worm's ability, saying that he also has a reflection ability that reflects around 50-60% to 60 of the damage from judgment. He claims that he was planning to hold Lucius off until Aldean manages to escape, but now he is enraged and decides to kill Lucius. He dashes toward the saint and instantly appears behind Lucius. Now, the saint fails to react to the attack and Castor uses his maximum power with the help of the worm in his body. He shouted that he would send Lucius to his goddess right away. But suddenly, Aldian sent a message to Castor, asking him to come to Aldian right away. As he gets distracted by the message, Lucius uses chain fail and paralyze, which makes him unable to evade anymore. Lucius then uses another judgment on him, seemingly because the saint doesn't care about the reflected damage he might receive afterward. Somewhere else, it turns out that Zephyr intercepts Aldian escape route while all of the chaos happens in the parish temple. Zephyr tells him to get up, as his beating is not over yet. And that's when Lucius reveals to the Gold Knight that his job was to keep Castor occupied from the start to kill the three of Aldian, the Silver, and the Gold Knights, one by one after separating them. Lucius mocks him, saying that he sure fell into their trap quite marvelously. That makes the Gold Knight so enraged to him that it looks like his vein is going to burst open. Back at the demon god worshipper's castle, Aldian asks to transport the dragon heart with his ability so he can control the third parish temple and possess the saint. So, the leader allows him to, yet Aldian can only wonder why it turns out this way. He already planned for every situation, but he fails to count for the Easter One's betrayal. He previously said that he would eliminate his disciple, but in the end, Aldian was left running away from the temple. Then, both Aldian and the Silver Knight arrive at their getaway carriage, as what concerns Aldian the most is the scale of his enemies. If the Eastern One betrayed him, then he doesn't know how many more Dragon King-style disciples are in hiding. As he goes into the carriage, he touches a green and sticky substance. In an instant, pain spread throughout his body as he screams his lungs out. He knows it was poison, one that hurt like hell. It turns out that Zephyr disguised himself as the temple's priest. Aldian tries to ask who the hell he is, but Zephyr kicks the high noble priest in the face, telling him to shut up. The Silver Knight is quite slow-witted, telling Zephyr to surrender. So, Zephyr throws a poison needle into the Silver Knight's face, 
saying how shabby the knight is, adding that Aldian should bring around the real silver knight with him instead of a fake who dies from a single poison needle. So Aldian tries to call him out, Pelux, the real silver knight. But Zephyr has already beheaded the silver knight, who is staying on guard. Twelve hours ago, the trio, Zephyr, Ned, and Lucius, gang up on the silver knight. Where Lucius feels skeptical at first, but it turns out that the potion of scrutiny can really distinguish demon god worshippers. The original plan is that Ned will hand over the dragon heart that he stole, and his master explains that there will be a temple priest among them, telling Ned to lay low after getting the slave's brand removed. But the priests and his master plan to use the slave brand to restrain Ned and plan to kill him. Now Ned knows, while Zephyr knows it from his past life, where he also knows that Lucius, who was controlled by the worm, was a nightmarish enemy. However many times he recalls it, what he remembers is the horror when Lucius's wife begs Zephyr to kill her. With all of the dragon heart's power he can muster, he summons lightning that envelopes his sword, striking into Aldian. But he realizes that there's not enough volume for a person to disintegrate. Suddenly, there's an attack coming Zephyr's way, so he blocks it with his sword. The attack comes from Aldian, who releases his demonification form, as he claims that even though he is stronger than the twin knights, he chooses not to fight because he doesn't want to show that form to anyone. Zephyr knows that Aldian segregated a part of himself as the lightning fell and returned to his true form, and in that state, the poison must have already been removed. It turns out that Aldian was originally demonificated and had gained the mimicry skill that allowed him to mimic human appearance. With that, he gathers all of his strength into his hand, then he stomps the ground with it, and the impact destroys the forest hundreds of yards away. However, Ned and Claudia notice that the battle between Zephyr and Aldian has already begun. So Ned tells her to hide with her kid while he goes to back Zephyr up, and he tells her to not come out until he says so while giving her the bracelets that are able to hide their presence. Then he goes, leaving both of them in the cave. As Ned went towards the battle, he thought about how he had waited for that day, the day to take his revenge against the beasts, who killed his father and took their family heirloom. One is already dead, only two remain, and Ned is determined to send them all to hell. Meanwhile, at the temple, the Gold Knight is using his branded worm's power. His attack power has gotten significantly higher, but the sharpness of his attack has reduced. The amount of effective blows he's landing on the saint is decreasing. Lucius calls out to Arno, and he immediately uses the highest grade support skill there is, called the light on the battlefield. Not only that, but even the spirit can also receive the buffs. Shooting starts then goes to the gold knight, as Leona's chain of light follows suit behind the spirit. Though that kind of slow attack is not effective against the gold knight, once shooting stars magic debuffs him, slowing him after direct contact. The next person that comes is Lucius, and with his overpriced spear, he thrusts toward the gold knight with no mercy. Even when the knight tries to counter it, the attack fails to find its target and misses Lucius. Though the strikes went to the building, it was the gold knight's plan all along. He wasn't aiming for Lucius but the building, so the chunks of the building would go to the brainwashed priests below and Lucius's uncle. Then, the gold knight manages to run away from the temple, and at this point, the saint has already destroyed a third of the worms in the knight's body as he runs towards where his master calls him. He is so loyal to Aldian because his lord gave both the twin knights new meaning to their lives. But, as he dashed around in the tree, a mana strike appeared from below, striking the gold knight in half. It was Ned, with the mirage sword in hand, which allowed him to hurt the demonification worm inside the gold knight's body. Laying down on the ground, Castor is pissed at the fact that Ned keeps getting in his way. That's when Ned reminds the gold knight that he is the one who killed Ned's father. In turn, Castor mocks him, saying how he can remember the names of hundreds of people he killed. As he finishes recovering with the power of the worm, he takes off his armor, saying that he will let Ned live if he stays away from the knight's way now. As he counts to ten, he thinks that the temple's party must not be confident enough to defeat him head on. That's when Ned reveals that he has the other twin sword, the moon sword, that the silver knights wield. As Ned says that, Castor's brother's last words to his face. That, of course, pisses him off so much, and Ned's plan to hold off the gold knight is working. Meanwhile, the strike that destroys the forest doesn't really hurt Zephyr. They trade blows, one after another, and with the Dragon Slayer armor set, Zephyr is able to defend against the powerful punch from the demonification Aldian. In return, with Gram in hand, the Dragon Slayer sword, Zephyr counters the attacks with his Dragon King-style swordsmanship. Though Aldian is able to concentrate the mana, not only to change forms, he can even recreate the sharpness of metal and the monster's hard thick hide. He is also able to mimic the insect's digestive fluid, a lava-like substance, and spread it around him, aiming it toward Zephyr. After evading it with the Cloud Dragon Ascension, Zephyr slashes Aldian into pieces, a sword technique that focuses on speed and accuracy. That doesn't stop Aldian's attack, as one of the tentacles spews more digestive fluid, but Zephyr is able to tank it with the set armor. Right after, Aldian's body pieces turn into various weapons that surround Zephyr immediately, and in that instant, 
he sends barrages of attacks toward the Dragon Slayer. His other name is Immortal Aldian, and he claims that no matter how much a mere human cuts him, he will keep regenerating. As he finishes, he grips his hand, focusing the mana he has into his hand, saying that he will only half kill Zephyr, and will put an insect in him that will make him Aldian's subordinate instead of the saint. He punches Zephyr, blasting him away toward a boulder and disintegrating it. Aldian doesn't stop there. He jumps up in the air with the mana gathered in both of his hands. He turns it into a double sword and strikes them toward Zephyr. Right after that, he combined both of the swords into one, making it a bigger sword. Aldian also coats it with the mana he possesses and with the help of the branded worm. Then he strikes it, making a massive explosion in the area, and with it, also appears a blinding light in the collision. But he doesn't know that Zephyr is a dragon slayer, and even with 1% output of his dragon heart, he can easily stop the sword strike with only his fingers. At that moment, he reveals that Aldian and his twin knights are too easy for Zephyr to deal with, but he wants to reward Ned, giving him a chance to satisfy his revenge. Secondly, at this point, demons are rare, so Zephyr wants to test his dragon heart, as he releases the 1% output of the power from the dragon heart. His eyes turned red, and dragon scales appeared on his skin. Zephyr then says that the data he might gain from battling demons is especially valuable, and immortals like Aldian are perfect for being the punching bag. He is going to test a few things, as he asks Aldian to endure it as best as he can, while Zephyr gives off such intense pressure that makes Aldian shiver. In the end, he flies, trying to run away, thinking that he doesn't want to die, not in a place like that. But with the dragon power, Zephyr claws Aldian mid-flight, bringing him down. As the demon falls, Zephyr tells him to get up, adding that he still has more to test out and he won't let the demon die easily. Somewhere else, Castor is able to pin Ned down in their battle. In the end, Ned is about to lose against the Gold Knight of Aldians. Before the battle, Zephyr explained how to defeat the Gold Knights to Ned. Originally, 25 years ago, both the Gold and Silver Knights were a noble with promising futures. Aldian, who took notice of them, interfered with the Vigo Count family's succession and made the Twin Knights his subordinates. And to them, he bestowed the Sun Sword and Moon Sword that resonate with each other to maximize their unique constitutions. The Twin Knights' notorious skills are perfected through the Sun Sword and Moon Sword. Once he attacks, there inevitably forms a gap in his movements before he moves on to his next stance, and it's a weakness that everyone has. But the Silver Knight attacks as if making up for the Gold Knight's gap. These techniques, called Eclipse, they transcend their own limits of accuracy, and speed to unleash a storm of blades that slaughters the enemy without a single gap. That's where Ned comes to recreate Eclipse by resonating with the Gold Knight through the Moon Sword and using it against the Gold Knight. That surprised Castor, as he never told anyone but Aldian about the secret of the Eclipse, but how does Ned know about it? At the same time, Aldian's screams were once again echoing in Castor's head, but he did not listen. And just as planned, after Ned shows him the Silver Knight's sword and technique, Castor won't be able to ignore Ned, no matter how worried he is about Aldian. That is precisely why Ned has to kill Castor now because there won't be any other chances than that. They trade blows again, Ned with his vengeance, and the same thing could be said with Castor. A few moments later, Castor splits Ned in half, only to realize that it's a trick by the power of Ned's cape. That instant, Ned appears behind Castor with his Dragon King style ready on his left palm to immobilize him. Now, Ned manages to stop Castor's movement, and his chance arrives, and he strikes the Moon Sword toward Castor. However, the Sun Sword moves on its own even though Castor is stunned. That's what Ned doesn't know. The two swords are drawn toward each other, and with that, Castor is able to finally land an attack on Ned with his hand. And that is how he is able to pin Ned down on the ground, wishing with every fiber of his being to kill Ned. However, Ned punches the Sun Sword and starts performing his Dragon King style to the fullest. He burns Castor's eyes with electric energy. On top of that, Ned also blends his presence with the power of the Crow Cape, making Castor have a hard time dealing with him now. With the Moon Sword, Ned summons massive lightning and strikes it toward the Gold Knight. At this point, one of the spots in the continent's strongest ten that the Twin Knights, the Vigo brothers held, had become vacant. Ned is finally able to satisfy his anger towards the people who took his life before. At the end of the night, Leona helps the battle with her buffs, telling the knights to seek help with the healing, along with Arno, who is resting. He is relieved that fortunately, Aldian emptied the building, resulting in not much harm done after Lucius's battle, where he needs to destroy the building. Other than that, all those larvae died at once. Thanks to that, their brainwashing has been undone, which means that Aldian has died. A moment later, Lucius turns around and smiles brightly as the party of two come back from their own battle, along with Claudia with her child in hand. The burden of all the battle disappears in an instant as Claudia and her kid fall into Lucius' arms, marking that the battle with Aldian's plot to take over the third parish temple has ended. 
The next few days were extremely hectic, with treating the injured and arresting the demon god worshippers that Aldian brought from the central parish, and a mountain of other work to take care of, then of course, among the crucial things to get done, encouraging the troops fatigued throughout those hectic days. Purging the demon god worshippers who had been in hiding for years was also part of it. On the other hand, Alponso finally recovered, saying that he could not believe that a priest of his level could be deprived of his own will and completely controlled by Aldian. Zephyr and Ned are also present, where Alponso thanks them for saving him along with the third parish temple. Zephyr says that he only did what any human should have, and he then presented a gift to the bishop, intending to congratulate him on his recovery. It is Aldian's head, caged in a memora's birdcage, which he got from Eurydica's tomb. That makes it impossible for anyone trapped inside to use any skill, and that birdcage also preserves the state that they were in when put inside. That shocks the bishop, saying that they should burn him down, yet Zephyr assures him that the queen worm is already dead, so Aldian can no longer use his ability, and now he is completely harmless. Even though Aldian is a demon god cult executive, they can extract useful information from him. Ned then also expresses how he is feeling very refreshed right now. Besides that, he has discovered that information that matters has become something that he can't handle alone. Zephyr then gives Alponso the information he gathered regarding the demon god cult. Upon reading it, Alponso is so shocked by the information he reads about the demon god's advent plan. The destruction and reconstruction of the world, and the ones who are pushing that plan are the Eastern Union. It is then explained that in the Kingdom of Kayan, which occupies half of the Aslan continent, there are two powers, the Western Alliance of the Western Lords and the Eastern Union of the Eastern Lords. The two powers originally held nearly the same amount of strength, but after the Giornetti Duke House of the Western Alliance produced both the Queen and the Saint of Light, the balance of power collapsed. Zephyr explains further that the Eastern Union, after several difficulties, had been experiencing a continuous slump since the dungeon bubble break, and they would even sell some of their territories to the West. Then, the difference in strength had become too large, which is why, a few years ago, among the nobles of the Eastern Union, the demon god cult permeated their ranks like ink in the water. As a result, two of the eight challenges of the world, Blue Dragon Artalis and Ice Dragon Morenia, started to destroy the Western territories. Then, Zephyr offers himself and Ned to go to slay the dragons. That surprises Alponso with how outrageous that is, even with the two of them, while Lucius is feeling left out, wanting to go as well. But Zephyr tells him that Lucius has to protect the third parish, and if something bad happens to Lucius's family, the scale of the battle may be flipped completely on their heads. Right at that moment, Lucius swears on his name as the saint, to name Zephyr and Ned as senior temple knights as thanks for the work they have done protecting the parish, and they will also be granted either gold, jewels, and magic stone. Being a senior knight will allow them to enter all territories that the Temple of Light's religious influence reaches. They can use any kind of commodities they want in the Temple of Light in the name of the saint, and Lucius even writes them a certificate that allows them to mobilize troops. And Lucius and his uncle will pay the offerings that they have to pay to the temple, half from each of them. Stupefied Alponso, right after, they shake hands on it and bid their farewell. But as they do so, suddenly, the birdcage that keeps Aldian's head shines, extruding chaotic dark magic and surprising the party. With little life force Aldian has, someone tracks him down and possesses him. The being talks, saying that he thinks he would connect with Aldian since he feels his life force disappearing. With his red devilish eyes, he asks the party whether they are the ones who killed Aldian, and instead of answering, Lucius asks who that being is. He then extrudes his overwhelming aura, filling the room with it and then telling Lucius to kneel before he asks. Right after, he claims to be the demon god cult leader. That surprises the party, and Lucius thinks that the leader must have come to finish them off after finding out Aldian failed while swearing to himself that his overpriced equipment is being repaired. The demon god cult then continues, looking at Zephyr, saying that he feels that unnerving energy he extrudes. Then, he knows that Zephyr must be the owner of the dragon heart. Suddenly, Lucius and Ned step forward to deal with the demon god cult leader, while Ned also tells Zephyr to get away first, and they both try to buy him some time. While Lucius wonders to himself that he still has his trump card, Glimpse of Glory, even though it won't be easy, he is determined not to allow him to take the dragon heart. That surprised Zephyr, who moved with their determination to fight for him while both Ned and Lucius prepared each of their moves, trying to collaborate. In an instant, they dash forward and instantly appear right at the median of the magic, intending to destroy Aldian's head to break the magic connection. But the demon god cult leader had already cast his magic to block both of their attacks and simultaneously cast another magic to root both of them, making them unable to do anything beyond trying. That caught them off guard, with Ned's shock that the magic was activated before he even had the chance to dodge using the crow cape, while Lucius's mana kept dispersing, 
making him unable to use any skill. The demon god cult leader uses a skill from the ancient dragon's shadow while telling them to not do anything stupid because that skill is not something the likes of them can undo. He also inwardly thinks that someone should have come to interfere and change the situation. But that seems to have been a wasted trip for him, for finding out that it was a total failure on Aldian having enough of it. He uses all kinds of magic and curses to deal with Ned and the saint, intending to finish them off. Alponso can only pray to the area, the goddess of light, and he is unable to do anything himself to change the situation with the appearance of the demon god cult leader. Suddenly, Zephyr joins the fray, using light magic to cut off the root that binds his two comrades. That surprises the demon god cult leader with the sight of Zephyr wielding the sword of light, along with the power of the dragon heart he possesses. Where before that, the demon god cult leader thought that it was a waste of time to go there, but to find an amusing guy right in front of him. He wondered if someone who was not a saint could be a chosen one. Zephyr smiles, saying that he wants to know, so Zephyr claims that he can tell that much for the demon god cult leader. But before that, he offers him a wager, saying that it would be boring just to tell him. So then, the loser tells the winner about the thing they want to know. Then, if Zephyr wins, he is going to tell his comrades the demon god cult leader's identity. And if he wins, he can do the same to his comrades as well. That surprised the demon god cult leader, as well as both Ned and Lucius because not even Alden knew the real identity of the demon god cult leader, but to think that Zephyr knows that much is beyond his thinking. The demon god cult leader can tell whether someone is lying or not with his detection skill, and he determines that Zephyr really knows his identity. But still, he agrees to it, so Zephyr throws up the coin. The air grew tense as the coin fell down, and the demon god cult leader chose tails while Zephyr chose head. As the coin falls down on Zephyr's hand, both Ned and Lucius know its tail, and Ned is unable to understand whether Zephyr is leaving it up to chance or whether he is preparing some sort of trick. But then, a jolt of magic attacks the hands that cover the coin. A light blows up from it, and the source of that is the collision of Zephyr, and the cult leader's mana condensed to an extreme level of density. What decides the result of a coin toss is when the hand that covers the coin is completely opened, the one who flips it and solidifies their victory when the hand opens. Zephyr tries to cover his hands, defending against the attack that comes from the cult leader's magic power. It's a battle in which the winner will be decided by crushing the opponent's interference, a contest of strength with such a simple rule. That is the true nature of that wager, where he and the cult leader are constantly fighting in an attempt to open Zephyr's hands while he is trying to decide the outcome. In a clash with no criteria for victory or defeat, it's difficult to withdraw, even if one didn't intend to see it through to the end, and that's why they made the rule. As the timing closes in on Zephyr, he throws the coin away from him, yet both of them know what to do and then chase the coin with their magic. But then, Zephyr uses the Dragon King-style move, which surprises the cult leader, as he notices that it's the Eastern One's electrical acceleration technique. With that technique, Zephyr punches the coin into the ground, breaking the floor into the basement of the temple. At that exact moment, the dragonification duration is over, and that decides their wager. The coin is split in half, one that lands on the tail and the other half on the head, marking their wager as a draw. A moment later, after that wager, Ned tells the story to Claudia, which makes her express how amazing Zephyr is, with how Zephyr accurately grasped the cult leader's mentality, resulting in not much harm to the party. It turns out that because it's a draw, both Zephyr and the cult leader agree on using the Oath Ring, a token of the promise between two people, so if one breaks the promise, the ring of the other breaks, and a sentence for the breaker begins. The sentence is one of their sense disappears for one month. After looking for a way to break the oath ring in the temple, both Zephyr and Lucius fail to find a way. So, until their second round, Zephyr can't reveal the cult leader's identity to the party. But he smiles wickedly, saying that not directly anyway. With his evil smile, he intends to give them a riddle to solve or a hint that doesn't count as breaking the oath. Before that, he reveals that it's even more dangerous than even the Eastern Union, so he can't tell anyone about that but the people he truly trusts. The demon god cult leader is Polaris Albert Kayan, the first prince of the Kayan kingdom and the youngest cardinal of the Temple of Light. He is not expecting that he thought Zephyr would spill about him at his party already. With that, the cult leader suspects that Zephyr might have an enormous amount of ambition, and he looks forward to it. Anyway, he is at the party of Altair Justina Kayan, his sister, where she is celebrating her 20th birthday and Altair Zephyr's lover in his past life. At night that day, Lucius is losing sleep because of the instance with the demon god cult leader, and as if he connects all the keywords Zephyr told him, he knows that the cult leader is one so powerful that they can't handle it, but his family and he can no longer withdraw from the battle, while Ned is determined that there's no choice but to fight and win. Because his revenge isn't over yet, both his master and his cult brother, along with the facilitators that Aldean spoke of, can't stop until he has uprooted them all. 
If it wasn't for Zephyr, then forget about revenge, and right about now, Ned would be regretting his foolishness after being thrown away by the demon god cult. He owes Zephyr a debt greater than his life, and he will repay him, no matter how powerful of an opponent he must fight. Meanwhile, Zephyr's mind is also occupied while he is meditating. He is thinking about why the cult leader showed up. But then, the silver key in his left hand glows up, implying that Mercedes is calling up to him. He then entered the space that connected with the silver key. Inside, Mercedes welcomes him with her pet in hand. There, Zephyr figured out that Mercedes was the one giving perks of the silver key, so he asked her about it. So she explained that she is his manager after all, and with it comes her own privileges. She also says that she would be disgraced if Zephyr died a boring death after sending him off empty-handed when the gods desire entertainment. After that, with her authority, she teleports them both to sit down and then Mercedes delivers the main point of the message. There, the gods want to tell Zephyr the addition of rules and rewards. Even though it was rather fun, his insolence of threatening the gods with his life will not be forgiven a second time. Additionally, if he ever does something like that again, the perks he was given will be collected immediately. Zephyr will then be designated as prey, and every single person who hunts him will be given the perks he has collected from him. Right after, Mercedes explains the rewards and new rules that he has to carry, about how nothing is free in the world, trading the request from the gods, and Zephyr will be rewarded. On the next day, both Zephyr and Ned bid their farewell to the priest and priestess from the temple, going to proceed into his next plan. Then, they depart as Lucius thinks about his role. It's not only the demon god cult, nobles, the rich, adventurers. There are countless people aiming for the dragon heart. His role is to draw their attention to him, pretending that he secured it, and make it easier for Zephyr to act. With that, he commands the knight to lock the gates, prohibit anyone into the temple, and declare that from that point on, the great third parish temple will be blockaded indefinitely. Meanwhile, in the tomb, Eurydica is able to feel Zephyr's presence getting further away, marking that he is leaving that place, and it is her time to go as well, to where she and her lover were meant to go. With that, her role is over, along with her thousand years of loneliness. She leaves it all to the one who inherited their mission and her descendant who will walk alongside him. She gets a letter from Lucius, her older cousin, congratulating her on her birthday, adding that he apologizes for not coming to the party because of the raid. In the letter, he also said that he would send her a birthday gift instead, and he was sure that she would like it. At that exact moment, a commotion occurred at her residence, and it was Zephyr beating the people who queued in the yard for a chance to meet her. That is when she knows that Lucius' gift to her is something she has always desired, someone who will be her strength. A few moments before that, when Zephyr and Ned arrive at her territory, it is explained that the territory was awarded to Altair, along with the title of Grand Duchess of Lindell, when she was 16. Zephyr arrives, showing the letter from Lucius, the Saint of Light, to the knight, so they let them in. Inside, there is an envoy that will escort them, as Ned is skeptical that coming to the princess will be any help to them in the dragon raid. As they are talking about it, there's someone thrown away from the castle into their face. The escort then explains that they are suitors who come to see the princess, which surprises Ned with how there are a lot of them who look like thugs instead. It is then revealed that Princess Altair Justine K.N. She has looks, talent, a noble bloodline, a woman who was born with everything, and the shining star of Aslan, a lucky child who was promised the throne without the need to push her older brothers aside. A lot of nobles coveted her hand in marriage because whoever got her would be the next king. In a single sentence, she says that she doesn't even want to utter a single word about marriage to weak men. From just those words, countless men of nobility continued to take up the challenge to gain the qualification to even have a conversation with her. The challenge to fight Altair's first guardian knight called Ophelia Amalith, only to get repeatedly getting their asses beaten miserably and go back to their homes. Upon checking the contenders, they are not even close to Zephyr or Ned, but they are also people who wouldn't be disrespected anywhere they go. It's just that Ophelia is one of the continent's strongest ten. That makes Zephyr smile to see her in her younger form, while at the same time, there's a huge guy calling out to Zephyr and Ned, asking who they are. He is mad because the end of the line is on the opposite end, and he is already standing there for three days straight. So Zephyr reveals that he is an envoy of the saint and asks the man to move so he can proceed to meet the princess. In the end, the man steps aside and then lets Zephyr and Ned pass by them. Zephyr thoughts how annoying that group of people is, why they are talking behind his back about the dragon raid and how they are gossiping about the possibility of the princess that might also invest in the raid. The huge man goes as far as spouting rumors about Altair, and Lucius is a lover, and he smiles wickedly as he claims that everyone in the capital has heard that rumor. Lucius is in a filthy relationship with his own cousin, and he even adds that he heard they conceived a child who's being raised secretly in the temple. In an instant, a punch was thrown at him, blasting him away. It was Zephyr who only moved a single hand to beat him to a pulp, and the other man was calling to him as he flew away. 
A moment later, Zephyr calls out to them to come as well, as he says that they are perverts who stood in line for three days straight just to get their asses beaten. So he says that they don't need to wait in line anymore, then asks them to come to him. And that's how Altair sees him beating them up from her window. Later that day, the escort brings both Zephyr and Ned inside the castle, and he apologizes for not having escorted them better so they don't pick a fight. There, suddenly, a gentle voice sounded behind them, asking whether they liked her greenhouse. In the original future, Altair and Zephyr don't meet for another few years. He trains in the cave with Ned for a year, and only after Zephyr comes out of the cave does the flow of time resume for him. He greets the princess, kissing her hand, and feels so relieved that he thinks this moment has arrived so soon. With the information Lucius gives her in the letter, she asks Zephyr in detail about what he can do for her. While Ned is wondering why her first night, Ophelia, keeps glaring at him. It was Zephyr, the one who made the fuss, not Ned, and that is why he wonders whether they have met somewhere before. Meanwhile, Zephyr knows that Altair's communion skill still hasn't fully bloomed at this point in time. She can't read someone's memories at will like Eurydica. But, since she has the talent for it, she was able to screen people with a special sense. And with that talent, she gathered comrades to oppose the demon god cult. Furthermore, she is originally Zephyr's senior who walked this path before him. But, at first, he wanted a vague idea of success and then revenge as per his master Ned's dying wish. Then she showed him something much greater, and what she wants are strong comrades whom she can trust. That's when Zephyr displays his 1% dragon heart, as he declares that he can fulfill the desire of hers, and how he thinks that it's probably faster if he shows her instead of telling her. That catches both of their attention, the power of a person who received the dragon heart transplant. Altair then asks Ophelia whether she has already had a fight with Zephyr, which she says she hasn't yet. Like knowing what she wants, Ophelia steps forward while unsheathing her sword, saying that she will try having around three bouts with him. The air grows tense as they face each other, Zephyr, the human who possesses the dragon heart, and Ophelia, one of the ten strongest knights in the kingdom. Looking at him, she knows that he looks like he is just standing still, yet he has no openings. She will be the one to be devoured if she just rushes in recklessly. She then carefully moves forward, and on the first bout, he parried her sword with hand movements like a flowing stream. On the second bout, her strongest thrusts couldn't even penetrate his skin. On the third bout, her weapon left her hand before she knew it, and a heavy palm strike slammed into her stomach, blasting her away. In an instant, Zephyr appears behind her with his hand, which is able to manifest the dragon's claw, which is pointed at her neck, as he asks her whether they should continue the fight. Zephyr then talks to Altair, saying that he heard she was trying to form a dragon expedition there. He claims that in a month's time, he will offer her the blue dragon's head. Altair asks what he wants in return for it, and he tells her to think of an appropriate reward herself. Along with it, he requests as many healers as she can lend after the trouble with the tomb of the abominable princess raid. Right after, she asks about the chance of him slaying the blue dragon, which she tells her depends on her, while also giving her the crystal of magic, which contains the ancient magic of the Media kingdom that Eurydica mastered. He then explained that it was entrusted to him by her ancestor, and Eurydica told him to deliver that to her, no matter what. Along with it, Altair will immediately become the strongest ally once she absorbs the Crystal of Magic, and she will also be able to smoothly tune his dragon heart. After that, Zephyr excuses himself, and their first meeting is miles better than the one in his past life, and for him, that is good enough for now. Even though he was dying to see her, that is their first time meeting in this life through Lucius's introduction. Showing off his value and piquing her interest in him is good enough. In the end, she is bound to come to find him, so he will wait for her. After they leave, Ophelia expresses that Zephyr is incredible, though she is a bit worried that Lucius introduced him since he has a terrible eye for people. Yet, in terms of skill, Zephyr is close to the talent that Altair wants. However, Ophelia suspects that Zephyr seems a bit weak for a holder of a dragon heart. So Altair explains that the dragon's heart has not yet fully settled into his body, and she knows he will become even stronger. Right after, she wonders how he talked as if he had met Eurydica herself. Since she was a legendary archmage, it's not a stretch to say that she could have been alive within the tomb. And if that's true, then the one who transplanted the dragon heart into him was Princess Eurydica herself. That makes her think how he wields such an incredible chance for a nameless knight, and she immediately knows that he may become the key to her plans. She also had something bothering her mind, and it wasn't one of the warm or ominous feelings that she always feels when she comes into contact with someone. That is the second time in her life that she saw something, a glimpse of their other future shown to her, which bothers her mind. Somewhere else at the demon god cult's castle, the vice cult leader answered the summons of the cult leader upon him. That's when the cult leader reveals that Aldean has been killed, and there is now a vacant spot amongst the twelve apostles. The cult leader then commands her to make sure that the apocalypse plan that she entrusted to them all must proceed diligently, and that Aldean's vacancy does not create any setbacks in the plan. 
After commanding his subject, the cult leader disappears, and the vice leader immediately orders her men to prepare the phantom horse so she can head to the third parish right away. Back at the kingdom's castle, Altair goes to her dungeon after trying so hard in her investments, deciphering ancient scriptures in the dungeon to help in raiding Princess Eurydica's tomb. She got the crystal of magic back, the grimoire that she desperately needed to develop her magic that had been stagnant at level 2. That reminds her about that time her master apologized to her, how she is unable to teach Altair further and only able to get her that far. And now she finally has a way to, and probably the power to beat that man, her only enemy in sight, the demon god cult leader. As she uses the crystal, her mind moves into a subspace that is immediately connected to her mind. There, she can feel the enormous amount of magic knowledge that is arranged like stars. Also, a soft, warm voice speaks to her, saying that it is beautiful and that it is the magic of Medea that they pursue. It is Eurydica who speaks to Altair, adding that though she is nothing more than a remnant within the crystal of magic, she wants to meet Altair, her descendant, and her heir, along with her magic. Somewhere else, Zephyr and Ned are playing rock, paper, scissors. Deciding that Zephyr will go to the party and Ned stealthily will search for any demon god cult member within the castle. So then Zephyr prepares to go, as Ned offers him the mist bracelet, but Zephyr tells him to wear it since one of the ten strongest knights is present in the castle. Zephyr also explains that Ophelia was paying pretty close attention to Ned, so there is a possibility that she might be the dangerous person, and aside from that, he doesn't know her. Zephyr then reveals that she is probably not a demon god worshipper, but still, he tells Ned to be careful, thinking that Ned will take care of himself as long as Zephyr tells him that much. Right after, Zephyr prepared himself as well, using dust from the fire pit. He changed his silver hair a little darker and used an eastern technique of changing his appearance by adjusting his facial muscles and expression. The specialty of the real shadow disciple is who will rise to be one of the twelve apostles in the future. At the party, people talk about the result of Lucius's raid, and Zephyr talks to one of the huge merchants in the kingdom. There, the merchant reveals that Zephyr is quite talented. After he takes a closer look, he is able to figure out that Zephyr is the one who beat up the priests of the Temple of the Sky in the yard of the castle. That immediately surprises Zephyr because such a weak-looking person sees through his transfiguration and wonders who that guy is. Somewhere else in the castle, Ned is cleaning up the demon god cult's members, going through the East Wing. As he jumps around, he thinks about how massive the castle is. He is unable to believe that one person owns that, and how he doesn't think he would ever get used to it. He also thinks that Lucius's newlywed home in the temple was similar in size to his old house, so it was comfortable there for Ned. Ned's home was also like that, not only because of the size but also because of that warm ambience. He then remembers the last time he ever saw his mother, along with his older sister, as he is thinking about all of it. A crude and glaring voice calls out to him, asking what he is doing on the roof instead of enjoying the party. It is Ophelia, expressing how Ned is weird, taking a nighttime stroll in quite a peculiar place. That makes him think that it's his blunder, for he couldn't have sensed her presence, even after wearing the mist bracelets as a pair, and he should only barely be detectable, even with a legendary rank detection skill. Ophelia then tells him not to be nervous and that she only came there because she vaguely felt something out of place. As a matter of fact, she had business with him, so she asked for some time with him. Ned then calls out to her as a liar, so he asks her for how long she has tailed him. She reveals that it was worth a shot and that she had been tailing him from the second floor of the East Wing. Being in the corner, Ned tells her that the people he killed were demon god cult members, and he adds that she should be able to confirm that since there are corpses of branded worms around them. He then apologizes for rummaging about without permission, explaining that their leader judged that a quick purge as soon as possible should be prioritized over an agreement. Ophelia then expresses how excellent and fine judgment it is, but then she says that he is misunderstanding why she came to see Ned. That instant, she strikes him with her energy sword, explaining that the dragon raids the princess's long-cherished wish. She worked very hard to gather exceptional talents to make it a success. Ned's comrade, Zephyr, already proved himself. However, she tells Ned that he has yet to be verified. Then she summons her aura into her blade as she tells him to prove his strength to her. Ned then expresses his own mind as well, saying that she is insisting on being punished, so he will welcome her strikes. Somewhere else that night, the cult vice leader, using a pack of hound creatures, found traces of Aldian's demonification. Along with it, she found traces of scorch marks from lightning. She now knows that those are no doubt the traces of a Dragon King-style martial artist. Not only that, she inspects the carriage that is supposed to take Aldian away. There, she found a deadly poison belonging to Persephone that shouldn't exist in a place like that. And now she assumes that the Eastern One, the Saint, and the Tarantula who recently entered the cult must have joined forces. They killed Aldian as planned, which makes her unable to believe they would commit such insanity during a mission with the cult's future on the line. 
And now, she wonders who has the dragon heart, whether it's Lucius or the Eastern one. A few selected humans who can receive an implant of the dragon heart. Suddenly, a mysterious woman appears. With her red crimson eyes, she looks at the vice cult leader, and she knows that one who wears a bird beak mask could only be the vice cult leader. That instant, she jumps away from the vice cult leader, and the vice cult leader has a hunch that person is related to that situation and she mustn't lost her. Using the hound creature she summons, she commands them to follow suit with the mysterious woman. A while later, the hounds manage to chase her and bite her shoulder, which makes the vice cult leader happy that she manages to catch her, only to find that the mysterious woman uses the eastern technique, Dragon King style, the thunderclap palm. That is just the person that the vice cult leader wants to see, so she takes out a whip going to fight against that mysterious person who belongs to the eastern continent. At the same time, another fight keeps going on on top of the roof of Altair's castle. It was net against one of the ten strongest knights of the continent. Dashes of light resulted from their clashes and their swords strike. That makes Ned mad, as it makes him sense that she has some discrimination in that assessment because they have had way more than three bouts. As their swords meet again, he asks whether she is saying someone who's not on par with her can't participate in the dragon raid. Ophelia stays silent, but then Ned's mirage sword changes its form into some kind of snake and he manages to disarm her. But she doesn't give up yet. Instead, she throws a kick towards Ned. In fact, she barrages him with her kicks, blowing dust everywhere, and that makes her lose sight of him. But in that instant, Ned appears behind her, exactly like what Zephyr did, saying what a great technique that is. Somewhere else, at the lake near the area where Aldean got killed, the mysterious woman is walking towards it. She feels relieved that she can finally lose her, the vice cult leader, whom her master was always wary of. It turns out that she is supposed to come into the raid to take the dragon heart. But then, she got hold up with the princess's subordinate, Ophelia. She takes off the hood on her head, revealing the red hair that she has, thinking that she finds evidence of betrayal by her master's disciple, who was put into this operation. And even that bitch vice cult leader is loitering around the operation area. At the same time, Ophelia reveals to Ned the fact that the shadow disciple of the Eastern One, one of the Twelve Apostles, called the Smiling Woman, is a master of transfiguration. Ophelia was preventing her from joining the operation of seizing the Dragon Heart. Ophelia notices Ned's breathing, step technique, and anticipation of the next moves, down to the finest details. Ned and that woman have similarities that are unique to those who have learned the same martial art. Ophelia is even more certain of it after fighting him. She also reveals that Zephyr showed the same similarities, but the princess has already confirmed that he can be trusted. Then, most of all, the shadow disciple, smiling woman, shares a resemblance to Ned, as if they are related by blood. So then Ophelia asks whether Ned is truly an ally, which shocks and ends up confusing him because all he knows is that Zephyr is the shadow disciple. Back before leaving the third parish, Ned is torturing Aldian for information. There, Aldian apologizes to Ned for killing his father, with the excuse of him being only a priest and having to do what the temple asks him to. Then, he also tells Ned to not trust Zephyr, telling him that Zephyr is deceiving Ned. Walking in the yard, Ned thinks that Aldian's words are the rambling of a madman and are not even worth listening to. That's why he has been ignoring them until now, but after Ophelia reveals what she knows about the red-haired woman, who might be his sister, who he thought for the longest time might be dead, is still alive. He comes to a crossroads, and he is one of the Dragon King School's shadow disciples. And now he wants the truth. Meanwhile, at the party, Zephyr deals with the big figure, Philip, who helps Altair with her affair as a mentor. They slowly built strength in the darkness and then gave their full support to Altair. And as far as Zephyr knows, Philip was killed by the smiling woman. Then, Zephyr has two priorities. One is not letting Philip die and stopping the smiling woman without knowing where she will appear from. The only problem is that she can change into any form she desires, whether it be a man or a woman. And she never showed her true appearance, even to Zephyr, so he might as well have no idea what she looks like. In any case, Ned should have come back by now. Then, as he turns around the room, Ned is already waiting for him with a dagger in hand. That instant, Zephyr steps back and even surprises himself with it, only to remember that he instinctively does it because when he is in the cave with him, he always beats Zephyr senseless whenever he is in that kind of mood. But then, Zephyr asks Ned whether something happened. So Ned explains that he was caught by Ophelia as he was searching around the mansion, also revealing the fact that she had met someone who seemed to be his older sister. As Zephyr sits down, Ned says that the shadow disciple of the Dragon King style that Ophelia is blocking is his sister. That's when Zephyr remembers the woman he met in his past lives far into the future, and there she asks who taught him the technique he has, implicating that she is looking for Ned, her younger brother. Now he knows that he boned his master's sister. He fails himself, for he never thought of it when once the Eastern One reveals that a martial body is very rare, and that it's hereditary. 
a sibling of one with a martial body is also highly likely to have it. Then which means the Eastern One plotted with Aldean to destroy Ned's family to obtain them from the start. And after all that, he abandoned Ned once he became useless, the Eastern One, a fucking bastard. Ned then says that he doesn't know yet and he doesn't think Ophelia has any reason to lie to him. As he calls out to Zephyr, it doesn't make any sense that everything Zephyr has said to Ned is a lie either. Ned's father trusted Aldean, and Ned trusted his master. Then, both of their lives fell, or almost fell, into the depths of hell because they trusted the wrong people. That is why Ned was afraid of putting his trust in someone once again. But even so, after all of that time both Ned and Zephyr went through. All of the time, they have already faced and overcome several life or death moments together. They are brothers, and now he wants to believe that their camaraderie was real, as well as thrusting Zephyr. He just needs something, even the smallest thing, as Ned lets down his dagger and begs Zephyr to give him proof that he can trust Zephyr. That's when Zephyr started to reveal it. Originally, they were supposed to meet around three months later. After stealing the dragon heart, Ned found out the truth from the Silver Knight and ran away. The demon god cult along with the entire world then starting to chase Ned down. He received several injuries from his senior brother, the Eastern One's son, at one of the eight challenges of the world called Canyon of Oblivion and was left to die. The Silver Knight also stole the Dragon Heart from Ned at that time. Zephyr was one of the temple slaves who was tracking him, and he happened to meet Ned after he fell into a cave under a cliff and learned the Dragon King-style martial arts from Ned because it was impossible for an injured man and a weakling to escape the Canyon of Oblivion. Zephyr, who became stronger thanks to that power being the foundation, finally reached the pinnacle of humanity. Ultimately, he couldn't stop the world from being destroyed and couldn't protect a single person to the end. Zephyr is the last human, a hero, a loser, and a regressor who returned to the past with memories of 10 years into the future and Ned's only disciple. Back then, Ned had a plan. How much stronger he and his disciple needed to get to escape the Canyon of Oblivion, the condition of his body, after taking all that into account, how long he could take to train Zephyr in that cave. Survival and his desire for revenge on his master, who betrayed him. These purposes alone were the only things prolonging his life. However, they had no choice but to come out of the cave earlier than planned. Zephyr has always regretted it. If he had become stronger a little faster, if he had learned a little more, the result could have been different. They could have escaped together instead of Ned sacrificing himself for someone like Zephyr while giving up on the revenge that he so desired. Ned is looking behind towards Zephyr, calling him out to take a good look. Taking a stance right in front of the monster, Ned uses the final secret art that he couldn't pass down to Zephyr. On that day, Zephyr saw his master's back, and he could never forget it. Zephyr tells that story to Ned toward the rising sun. At the end of the day, Ned is still having a hard time believing it. But still, it makes too much sense for Ned not to believe. From using a divine artifact when he is not even a priest, knowing way too much information and it's plausible if he returned to the past with the perks from the gods. Zephyr then apologizes for approaching Ned with lies, and he isn't sure he will be able to make Ned believe that in such a short period of time. He thought it would be better to just make Ned doubt the demon god cult. Zephyr expresses that to fight the demon god again, he needs him, and more importantly, he wants Ned to live. Now, the reason why Ned kept moving wasn't just revenge. He thought it was natural to live as a part of his family, for someone like him, who had his family's peerage, the old duty of watching over the blood tears, his family, and everything else stolen from him and become a shell of a man. His master granted him a new purpose to live as his disciple. Because of him, Ned worked himself to death to become stronger and repay the kindness of his master, who took him in. Because of him, he happily took on all sorts of filthy errands, because he believed there was a just reason for anything that his master did. A master-disciple relationship is one that is akin to family, even if there are no blood relations. Thrusting your family and helping each other is natural. Ned was reproaching himself for living his life wrong. But, then, his life had meaning in its own right since he left something behind in this world. Ned stands up, going to go out, and he taps Zephyr's shoulder, thinking that he is taking revenge for him in the past life and helping him in this life. A hero who returned to the past to save the world, Ned knows that he had taken in quite the absurd disciple. He expresses how he expects nothing less from his disciple. Ned goes out, saying that he won't let Zephyr shoulder it all on his own, and offers to walk together in this life. They both see Philip's group that morning, and is expected of Altair's comrades, things progress quickly. But Altair is absent, and Zephyr knows that she is not suddenly appearing at a time like that, which would mean that she is asleep because of the grimoire. A crystal form grimoire, different from a book form, makes a copy of its contents directly into the user's brain. Its only flaw is the side effect that one falls asleep during the time that the magic incantations fuse with the brain. The longer the duration of sleep is, the greater the quality of the grimoire and symptoms such as fever will accompany it. Altair is probably receiving care from a healer, but since it's not an injury, they won't be of much help. 
It ultimately depends on how quickly Altair can absorb all the magic. After that, days went by in a flash. At this moment, they had to prepare many things for the Blue Dragon Raid, research new fighting methods to match their new items and work with the party members. One of the priestesses asks Zephyr to come into her arms, and Zephyr tells her to just make it quick. She uses a skill called Angel's Embrace, sending a jolt of magic into Zephyr's body to check his health and physical characteristics in great detail. That makes Zephyr shout out all kinds of curse words as the priestess tells him to endure it for a little longer, which makes Ned reluctant to go through with it. Still, he can't get away from it, and as he falls flat on the ground, Ophelia comes into the room, commenting on how Ned looks so pathetic. There, she informs both Zephyr and Ned that the princess is calling for both of them, surprising Zephyr that Altair finally woke up while Ned is confused with where to look for being right below Ophelia. A moment later, from her bed, Altair greets both Zephyr and Ned, while all Zephyr can think of is that someone might have told Altair about him. Back when her mind is directly connected to the crystal, Eurydica congratulates her that the proof of her meridian has reached level 3. The basic knowledge of Median magic is within Altair now, and all she has left is to reach enlightenment through training and raise its level. A new star will be added to the line every time she level it up. Eurydica adds that she is sure Altair will be able to accomplish what no human, even she couldn't do, which is to reach level 8 of Median magic. Right after, the connection between Altair and Eurydica reaches its end, then she wakes up. She is welcomed by a priestess and Ophelia, along with a massive headache. The priestess informs her that she has been asleep for a week, so she must not move so suddenly. The only thing she can remember at the end of the crystal magic is that Eurydica tells her to thrust Zephyr, so Altair asks Ophelia to call Zephyr right away. Once they meet, Altair claims to have wanted to call Zephyr earlier, but she hasn't been feeling well lately, so she apologizes for it and poorly greets them in her sleepwear. Zephyr knows that Eurydica might tell her something that isn't just a matter of their relationship. Right after, Zephyr gives out his hand to Altair, implying toward her to read his memories and asking whether she has learned the communion skill. So she says that when Zephyr gave her the crystal of magic, she thought he was trying to show her his ability and enter her party. Rather than that, she assumes that he was trying to raise her to use her for his plan. Unfortunately, she can't use it yet because the communion skill is an unexpectedly advanced skill, and as a level 3, she can't freely read others' memories like her ancestor who was a level 7. She then asks to continue their conversation from a week ago, and wants him to try to persuade her to come up with a surefire plan to slay the dragon. Zephyr takes up the challenge while also asking her whether she has already eaten when he activates his silver key to take out bundles of letters, adding that the contents are a lot to listen to on an empty stomach. A few days later, they depart into the region where the blue dragon resides, and Zephyr is sure that Altair will do her best to leave traces befitting the princess of debauchery as he notices how excited she is to be outside the castle. On the other hand, Zephyr is also sure the demon god worshippers are in a frenzy, doubting each other, and the other people in power are bound to be focused on Lucius's seclusion. But that will only last around a month, no more than two, so until then, Zephyr must earn as much as possible and as quietly as possible with no distractions. The first step to that is the Blue Dragon Raid and forming an alliance with the Elf. Meanwhile, Ned remembers that he had been to that region before, and he knows the scenery of the endlessly stretching Golden Wheat Field was amazing. The other members say that it was in the past and open the window to reveal the state of the region now. It turns out that the region turned into ruins, leaving a plain full of remnants of the Blue Dragon's poison. It ended like that since the Blue Dragon flew over the region and made its nest at the water source of the river that flows through there three years ago, and spews deadly poison. Healers were dispatched, but they failed to purify the land, and 80% of the farmland was eradicated in just three years. Yet, Zephyr knows that by the next year, the remaining 20% will also become deadly land and he honestly thinks it's a miracle that it managed to last three years, it's because the river water itself is special. A moment later, they go into the gate of the last human settlement, which Altair's party uses as the last post to go to the Blue Dragon Raid. Inside, Altair explained that it's a medical relief station, a place that protects farmers who lost their place to live during the poison disaster. A soldier sent by the Lord of Danakil is supposed to meet with them there, where the front lines lack supplies. So Altair asks Zephyr to wait there while they will also perform maintenance as they wait. Zephyr has no problem with it. At the same time, a cough can be heard from one of the houses sheltering the farmer. Inside the house, Zephyr talks to the priest, offers him water to drink and asks who the man is. There, the priest informs Zephyr that he is Grimes, a knight, and he came there from the Lord's castle. But monsters appeared while he was on patrol, which he took care of but came back injured. Zephyr notices the violet skin. He knows that the blue dragon's poison has spread throughout his entire body. Those are symptoms that can be seen when drinking poisonous water or being attacked by monsters from the nest. 
just like the land. There's nothing a healer can do to purify him, so he can only receive treatment to reduce his suffering and wait until the day he dies. Altair then whispers to Zephyr, saying that she knows Grimes and that he is a trustworthy knight with great fighting prowess. She thinks he might be the soldier that the Lord sent. Zephyr then requests to tighten the security at the station as he takes stuff out of his silver room thinking even though there's no one who can deal with the blue dragon's poison, it's not like he can't do anything about it. He takes out deadly poison needle, and right after, he announces that the place will be a class 1 restricted area. While Zephyr is treating the injured knight, Altair senses that someone is coming into the station, and outside is Captain Regulus Danakil, along with his army, the Scarecrow Knights. He is welcomed by Philip, as he expresses his thoughts, which is deeply concerned whether the Altair's party got scammed by someone or something. The condition to start the dragon raid is that Saint Lucius has to discover the dragon heart in the tomb. And apparently, Lucius has cancelled all plans and shut himself inside the third parish. As he commands his army, shouts and screams from the house can be heard. Regulus goes inside, and shocks appear on his face. He recognizes Grimes and confuses him with the needles that stick to his body and suspects that Zephyr uses poison needles. Right in that instant, he draws his sword and using all of his aura, telling Zephyr to step away from Grimes right away. But then, a kick landed on the back of his head, blasting him down to the ground. It was Ophelia saying how dare Regulus unsheathe his sword in front of her highness. It confuses him more with why Ophelia, the princess's guardian knight, is stopping him. Then Altair reveals herself, saying that she has heard the gist of it using mana detection. Regulus's conversation with Philips. As she took off her hood, she said that his questions were valid. However, he had no right to reject participating in the raid or to harm one of their party members, explaining that the letter his father received was not a letter of request for reinforcements, but a decree from her, the Princess of Cayenne, Altair Justina Cayenne. In an instant, Regulus, along with his army, kneeled down to greet Princess Altair. A while later, Zephyr manages to cure Grimes, and he thanks Zephyr for it, asking how he can possibly return that favor. Regulus then apologizes to Zephyr, as he didn't know that he tried to save Grimes earlier. That relieves Zephyr because Regulus doesn't blame others when apologizing, showing promise, and Zephyr doesn't need to have to trample him to discipline him. Altair then calls Regulus out, reminding him about the time when they were together in the academy. During group assignments, Regulus's group members were scared of him because he was known for being harsh. But in fact, he always paid attention to points others didn't care about. Thanks to that, the groups that he was in never had any accidents, and he was hard to beat, even for the group she was in, the group consisting of people considered to be geniuses. Even in this case, as both the Young Lord and the Night Order Captain, he is taking responsibility for figuring out exactly what is going on, and that part of him is what she finds very reliable. Altair then introduces Zephyr as the Exalted One, sent by the Goddess Area through a revelation to save the saint who was in danger, as well as the entire world. That surprises both Regulus and Zephyr at the same time, as Altair reveals the letter that Lucius sent, which they himself wrote, adding that they must consider Zephyr's will to be the Goddess's will, and to be obeyed. Regulus cries with happiness, praying to the Goddess Area, then proclaims that he will serve Zephyr to the best of his ability, while Altair winks at Zephyr and he can only facepalm himself, thinking what a masterpiece that is, as he remembers that she is a master of bullshit, and she even forged that letter. Right after, both of them walk out of the room. While Zephyr thoughts how her ability to bullshit is out of this world as Zephyr also strokes her head out of habit. Meanwhile, another party member still looks at him with a disdainful eye. Still, the party members that they met at the station accepted Zephyr as the operation commander without much issue. Of course, that also means he has taken responsibility for all kinds of duties as they depart to the nest, the great elven forest. Right after they enter, Ned expresses how he expected the forest to be completely destroyed, like the farmland, but it turns out that the forest still remains. Altair then explains that it's different from the outside since the mana density is high, and she also adds that once they cross the forest's remote village, they can't travel on horseback since the horses get scared by the thick mana in the air. As they go deeper into the forest, Zephyr suddenly feels something, and even if it is just for a moment and very subtle, he feels a gaze from within the forest. Altair notices him acting weird, so she asks what's wrong. Zephyr has something that he would like to confirm. Altair says that the last message from the remote village was two days ago, that a homing pigeon flew their way when they were at the relief station. The mages dispatched from the magic tower confirmed that they had set up magic such that red smoke would rise from the village if any problems arose. Then Ophelia also says that she has confirmed her eye ability, but she doesn't see any signs of ambush or stealth skill in the area. What Zephyr knows about the Great Elfin Forest is from his dear friend, as he reveals that his hometown is not an entertaining story, and it's nothing more than an old, meaningless story then. He decides to tell the story anyway, 
And in fact, he tells Zephyr stories of this forest around the bonfire as if to chase away the darkness. Thanks to that, Zephyr knows very well that though this place is surprisingly beautiful, it is a forest of evil that devours humans enraptured by its beauty. So Zephyr whispers to Ned, telling him to protect the merchant leader as Zephyr informs him that an ambush might come at any time. Right after that moment, the forest moves as it has its own mind, forming a door. Altair notices that it's the door of the forest, a device made to restrict entry to outsiders. She knows that it is supposedly much deeper in the forest, past the remote village, yet they haven't reached the village. Then the door forms a face, calling out to the humans in front of it, telling them to go back and saying that this is not their land. Zephyr takes out a sword from his silver room, saying that two days is more than enough time for enemies to occupy the base and readily go through the door with violence. Then Zephyr asks what happened to the people from the remote village. Altair steps in, telling him to stop, then introduces herself as the human's princess and offers to the elf behind the door to converse. The elf is mad, saying that they have told her of their will several times using homing pigeons before and any resolutions through conversation have been severed due to her brother. How he strong-armed the elder of the elf, making an agreement that favors the humans for the border of the forest and the river between the elf and the humans. Along with it, he gets valuable items from the elf, leaving the elf no choice but to follow what he wants. And now, the forest starts attacking the party, with the root that moves, messing up the soldier's footing. Elves are beings that have long ears, lifespans several times longer than humans, and a high affinity with mana. They are a race that built their own kingdom in the Great Elfin Forest and survived for a very long time. For over 2,000 years, they advanced their own distinctive magic and restructured plants to create a comfortable nest, as well as an impenetrable fortress using the forest's overflowing life force. The forest keeps attacking the soldier, and as a horse steps into red beads that rest on the forest's floor, it explodes. Meanwhile, Altair is calm and expresses how unfortunate it is that the elf decided to go this way. From behind the door, magic shoots up to her, and a green-yellowish beam of light comes through toward her. A blonde-haired elf oversees the watchtower interior, and as they watch, the magic beam shoots up toward the group of humans. One of the men addresses her as princess, claims that the humans are no match for them, and then she yells at him not to take his hand off the crystal. From the blast appears a silhouette of the humans. It was Zephyr shielding Altair from the light beam using the Dragon Slayer's cape, which reduces damage from the magic of all attributes. Along with it, the healer captain uses a barrier of light, which blocks enemy attacks using sacred power. Zephyr poetically asks whether Altair is alright as she thanks him for covering her. Zephyr knows that the gatekeeper elves that control the door of the forest are nothing but average foot soldiers. No matter how well made the device is, it's not enough to stop him. Right at that moment, Zephyr uses the dragon tongue magic, saying to open the door and calling them imbeciles, so the door opens up. Now, Zephyr has an eye on the watchtower, noticing the identity of the gaze that he has been feeling since earlier. In an instant, he dashes into the massive tree that oversees the forest, punching away the soldier elves, then has his hand on the elf's princess. He then says that even though she looks like a kid, she might already be a hundred years old, so he will just slap her once and conversing will come after. As he is going to smack her, he notices that she looks different from the one that he knows, and she also has two different colored eyes. Suddenly, there's an arrow that comes right down towards him, destroying the tree into pieces and blasting Zephyr away, losing his grip on the princess. The blonde elf princess telling the elf who strikes the arrow, calling him an idiot for trying to kill her. Then she sends him the coordinates again, asking him to kill Zephyr for sure this time. Meanwhile, Zephyr recognizes the skill along with its power, and he knows that it's definitely him. One of the strongest ten of the continent, the strongest archer that joined the human resistance force later on and made the demons tremble in fear. The divine archer, Dariel. Right a moment later, he got the coordinates from his sister, claiming that he would finish Zephyr off with his next attack. That instant, he shoots his arrow from a kilometer away, confusing the party on the site and looking for where the next attack might come from. The mage then uses Gree's eye, a long-range golems that share video and sound information. As she commands her golems to fly up in the sky, a shock of horror runs down her face, witnessing such a powerful shot of an arrow from such an absurd distance. But Zephyr, the target of the attack is ready, and without even flinching, he prepares his stance to receive the attack. In a split second, their attack meets and Zephyr manages to deflect the arrow. Still, the backlash is pretty heavy on him, with blood pouring down from both of his hands, receiving pretty heavy injury. The blonde princess is surprised to see that Zephyr is able to deflect the arrow that easily, only to notice that his arm is already injured a moment later. So she tells her brother to shoot his strongest skill, Crimson Meteor. That instant, Dariel releases three consecutive arrows manifesting into a meteor. That instead makes Zephyr even more fire up, realizing that it's Crimson Meteor, three times faster and stronger than regular arrows. He also knows that the arrows are too fast to stop using Dragon Tongue, 
and the shock wave will wipe out the other party members. So he instantly summons his dragon heart's power, and with his crimson red eyes, his movements seem very slow. The traces of his sword seem gentle yet fluid, but in actuality, not even a second passed. In the next moment, the traces became a dragon and surged upward. The Dragon King style, as its name suggests, symbolizes a dragon. However, that's only because the flow of mana and martial arts resembles a dragon, and as far as Ned knows, it has nothing to do with a real dragon. Looking at Zephyr mustering those powers like what he sees, makes him knows that there is a stage like that. Kiara is shocked to learn that a human manages to do that, which makes her wonder whether Zephyr is a dragon taking a human form. Remembering her sick mother, she finally gives in and surrenders to the party of humans that comes into her territory. Right after, she says that whether Zephyr is a dragon or a human, she begs them to help the elves, and Zephyr nonchalantly agrees to her request. It is explained that the Lake of Life spreads throughout the Great Elfin Forest through river streams to keep the massive forest alive. The powerful vitality and healing ability of that lake became the foundation of the elves' prosperity, and once the water flowed out from the forest through a narrow stream into the Danakil estate, that land became the greatest granary in human territory. The massive tree that grew while drinking the water from the Lake of Life is the Tree of Life. The tree itself holds sacred power and is the being that gives high elves their power. The elven kingdom was prosperous for 2000 years due to that. But after the blue dragon made the Lake of Life into its nest, the water of life filling the lake soon became poisonous and spread throughout the forest. A year after the blue dragon appeared, two high elves known as Scarlet Moon and Black Moon invaded Danakil. They were overpowered by the elves and almost lost their land. But at that time, Prince Polaris participated in the battle as a cardinal while leading his temple knights. The elves fled to the heart of the forest because of the gold dragon that soon joined the battle. Ultimately, that war ended in the human victory in the form of a ceasefire treaty. And one year later, the farmland was polluted by poison. Now, Altair's objective is to form an alliance with the elves to do the dragon raid, starting with Zephyr helping the elves that are affected by the blue dragon's poison. Still, Dariel is cautious of Zephyr to an extent. A while later, Altair continues her bullshit by praying to Goddess Aria, saying that the Goddess of Light is guiding them through the Exalted One, which makes the soldiers worship Zephyr, as he is feeling annoyed by it. On the morning of the next day, the party moves closer toward the Tree of Life to scout where the Blue Dragon resides. Tiara shows them the plant that was originally created to support the elves, but now turns into a flower that sprays poison mist and some that have become a monster factory. Also, Dariel agrees to form an alliance only if their priority is to protect their village from the monsters surging from the forest. Zephyr says that's obvious, claiming they will eradicate the monster, all while gathering some magic stones and production material in the process. The fight with the monster in the outer area then starts, with the mages using their magic with the support of the priestess, and the healer, including Ophelia and Ned, each showing off their skill and strength, and with that, they manage to protect the village on the outskirts of the affected area. Later that day, Dariel thanks Zephyr for helping them with it, yet he reveals that the two items that Zephyr has requested are key items that protect the village from contamination, and he can't give them away like that. Zephyr has enough of it, telling Dariel to stop bullshitting anymore and just tell him what Daryl needs, loud and clear. All this time, even though Dariel still feels suspicious of Zephyr, he tries to be courteous to him. Then, Zephyr lays it out, stating that he needs to create a perfect cure that will save the Elf Queen, restore the lake and tree of life, then slay the blue dragon. Zephyr explains that for the first one, the sap from the tree of life is the main ingredient, and for the second, the tree will be restored on its own as long as the blue dragon leaves or dies. In the end, Zephyr gives him the middle finger, saying that they just need to kill the dragon. Zephyr makes it clear that he will slay the dragon, so he pushes Dariel with what he needs more than that. Still, Dariel is not sure about it because he isn't confident that Zephyr is able to slay the dragon, and if the dragon is rampaging after a failed attempt, it will be harder next time they need to raid it. That pisses Zephyr off, telling him not to misunderstand it because there is no next time. They face off with their rage on as Zephyr explains that that matter is something that must be done as soon as possible by squeezing out every last drop of strength they can muster, and it's not something they can wait and see. In the end, even though Dariel fails to get through to Zephyr, he agrees to let their strength do the talking. That instant, Zephyr summons his dragon power as Dariel shoots his arrow right towards Zephyr from that point-blank range. That's when Dariel lays out his frustration, as he assumes that Zephyr now should understand since he must be wanting Dariel to be the main damage dealer. His arrow isn't even able to scratch a dragon scale, and that is the extent of his skills. He feels hopeless in the face of the blue dragon, and even though he wants to kill that dragon as soon as possible, it's impossible for him to do with his current strength. Zephyr tells him to stand up, explaining that he is weak because his items are trash, as he breaks Dariel's bow in half. That surprises him, along with Altair, 
who knows the quality of the bow, as Zephyr tells him to stop crying and adds that he will make him a new bow. A while later, Kiara is crying over the broken bow, saying that even though Zephyr will make a new bow for his brother, he should have let another person use it. Philip also appraises the bow, noticing how expensive that bow is, which is about a heroic grade weapon. On the other hand, Dariel is surprisingly relieved by the fact that Zephyr would make him a new bow, saying that Zephyr didn't break his bow but his indecision. Since he has nothing to rely on now, he can put his life on the line to raid the Blue Dragon, while Ned thinks that it turns out Dariel is just as insane as Zephyr. Later that day, they gather in the inner part of the castle, as both Kiara and Dariel give their blessing to Zephyr to use both their last means of defense, the Water of Life and the Branch of the Tree of Life. Right after, Zephyr drinks up the whole glass of the last pure Water of Life that the elf has. With the perks that he has, Zephyr's body is immediately filled with an overflowing vitality. Zephyr then sits down right away performing his dragonification along with a skill called Microcosmic Orbit, a skill that allows him to control the flow of mana to heal internal injuries and increase his mana capacity through repetition. Along with it, Altair assists him in the process of increasing his power output from his dragon heart. Since they don't have time, they need to force the process and direct that overflowing vitality and the dragon's power into the dragon's heart. That process doesn't come easy, as pain runs through every fiber of Zephyr's body and makes him throw up blood. Right after, the priestess helps to heal him right away, praying to the goddess area. Both Zephyr and Altair push themselves together, aiming to make Zephyr able to output 10% of the dragon's heart. Knowing they have a hard time, Ned sits behind him, assisting Zephyr with the flow of his mana, as he says that Zephyr's breathing is all over the place. He happily assists his now-acknowledged disciple while he thinks that the one who can best support a Dragon King-style master's cultivation is a fellow Dragon King style master. Using his hand to help, he will guide Zephyr, hoping to tame that rampant power. With that, Zephyr is able to progress further in taming the dragon's heart and in increasing his physical strength to be able to muster more of it. A moment later, a light fills the room, and Dariel is one of the first people to witness Zephyr's new form. A crimson red eyes, body full of dragon scale and a pair of dragon wings bloomed from his back. Ned smiles while the healer falls down with sweat drenching their face. Altair holds onto her staff, smiling towards Zephyr and expressing how amazing he looks right now. He manages to muster 10.1% of the power of the dragon heart and achieves the second form of dragonification. Right after, Zephyr asks Dariel to bring a towel to him, then uses it to shut his own mouth. What he does next shocks the soft and adorable prince as Zephyr rips his own scale explaining that a dragon's scale can't be penetrated by regular metal, but the power of another dragon will. Even though it's only a small amount of its true power, those are scales from the strongest dragon, Kaiserus, and Zephyr is excited to rip all of it and make his first dragon weapon in this life. On the next day, with clear gold, a dragon scale, blood rubies, and arrow shafts, Zephyr makes a new weapon using his dragon tongue magic, Flow. In an instant, he is able to craft a black dragon bow along with black dragon arrows that will be wielded by the strongest archer on the continent, Dariel. At this point, it's two weeks until the raid, and all the humans and elves are spurred in preparation. Ned will handle the training for those two weeks, and the hunting team will be handled by Ophelia, who is going to clear the path toward the middle of the forest. Along with it, magic stones from the monsters accumulated like crazy, yet they all disappeared in an instant to be used to craft weapons, golem cores, fort construction and strengthening, and magic circle installation. Meanwhile, Altair is cooking up a strategy that she will use the last branch of life as the core to be the safe zone so the poison mist won't be able to enter the area. As for Zephyr, he keeps cultivating and trying to keep increasing his dragon heart output. As long as he can maintain his dragon form for 30 minutes, he will have a chance to fight against the blue dragon with the support of the party. Also, he repeatedly uses dragonification and keeps making the black dragon arrow, helping with creating the path to squeeze everything out to the utmost limit and surpass it. On the night before the raid, the soldiers have a long night to rest, and after dinner, Zephyr immediately leaves, claiming that he will take a long sleep to rest. Looking at him, Altair then follows him, saying that her skin is a mess after all that work, adding that she should sleep early as well. Ophelia tries to offer to accompany her, but Ned holds her off and reminds her that she will be his sparring partner tonight. Before all of that, Altair tries to form a raid party, but no one, from the qualified nobles to strong adventurers, is willing to help her. She can only trust a small number of people that she built up trust with before. But then, as if it were all a lie, everything starts to go smoothly because of Zephyr. An unexpected stroke of luck and fate, that's what others would call it, but she doesn't believe in that kind of thing, as she goes into Zephyr's tent. 
Without saying anything, she reaches out her hand to him, inviting him and then giving him a kiss. A time stop as it's the first time Zephyr is able to kiss her like that since her death in his previous life. But Chill runs down his spine, shocking him as it turns out that Altair uses a skill called a kiss of darkness, which makes him confess anything to her. Zephyr falls down as he asks what Altair is trying to do. But Altair shuts him up, saying that he is not allowed to ask any questions. It is fascinating that they managed to work together with the elves, and the blue dragon raid that she thought would never begin is happening tomorrow. All thanks to Zephyr in the short span of a month. She has her doubts, so she stays by his side and keeps watch on him. But after watching him shred his own scale every single day, she can no longer suppress her doubts and assumes that Zephyr has some sort of goal. If Zephyr develops some sort of malicious intent or is following the orders of another dangerous individual, no one will be able to stop him. Everything will come to an end, just like that. Therefore, she needs to know what his goal is, then she asks who sent him. With the kiss of darkness on his tongue, Zephyr confesses that he is there on his own accord, adding that all of it is for Altair and that is shocking her. She knows that the skill is in effect, and he is not lying, so she demands explanation. Zephyr confesses further that she died for him once, and to change that future, he returned to the past. That shocks her further, and as of now, she is able to conjure a dark hand choking Zephyr. She is trembling and afraid, being unable to accept that, shouting to him not to screw with her. But Zephyr knows, as he says, that she must be pretty shocked, and she should know that better than anyone because Zephyr is under the effect of Kiss of Darkness. So he cannot lie about anything she asks him. Right after, he broke through the dark hand, reaching out his hand to hers as he closed on and told her to interrogate him as much as she wanted, the truth that she so desired. He wraps his hand around her, and as the duration of the skill runs out, he kisses her again after telling her to recast the kiss of darkness. Meanwhile, somewhere else that night, the elder of the elves is sneaking around meddling with the magic written on the golem that supposedly will be used in the raid. He laughs as he thinks that those golems will become loyal subordinates who will only listen to his orders. In the morning the next day, the war drum, along with the war trumpet, is sounded. Ophelia with the foot soldier, the mages, and Ned, who will be stationed in a special post. Everyone can feel it. This day, some will return to the dirt, and others will witness a turning point in history. The first order of the plan is to put every strengthening spell on Zephyr, the healer with the magic of the goddess of light, Kiara, empowered by the tree of life, and Altair, where she already knew that the path she chose to walk was wretched, one filled with blood. But, it was much more wretched than she expected. Last night, Zephyr assured her that she was already walking down that path, even without any knowledge of the future. Zephyr tells her that since it's his second time, he can do better, and at the end of that path, he is going to grab hold of what he really wants. When that time comes, he asks her to be her king, addressing her as the queen. With that belief, Altair uses the strengthening magic from the line of Media. That instant, along with all the buffs, Zephyr immediately manifests his second form, marking the commencement of the Blue Dragon Raid. Zephyr, as the sole vanguard, flies up high in the sky, so even though that is a ridiculous idea, that has the best chance for raid success. With overwhelming strength and lightning speed from the Dragon King style, Zephyr opens up the path for the foot soldier, long-range army, and the support. In an instant, Zephyr slays the huge plants that stand before him. At the same time, he realizes that it is definitely near the lake, as it's full of huge plants. Using the silver room, he drops off tombstone-type golems that would disperse any mana wavelengths in a 70-meter radius, and they resonate with each other and create a mana road. From then on, the magic that's used from the camp will be passed along all the way until the end of the mana road. Along with it, the mage creates a huge video relay golem called Cyclops that will become the party's eyes. And with it, Dariel, the long-range damage dealer, is able to see the fight from that far distance. At the bottom of the Tree of Life lies a blue dragon, radiating poison mist several thousands of meters away from it. Zephyr slowly sneak right above the blue dragon. As he expected, he managed to come that close without the blue dragon caring about his existence. With it, he can only move within the poison fog for a maximum of 28 minutes since he used 2 minutes to move and set up the golems. Right after, he summons a black dragon chain that was made using Zephyr's scales. First, he ties up one end of it into the Tree of Life's branch and then dashes down towards the massive dragon. Though Zephyr knows that the blue dragon is not a poison dragon, the world has simply forgotten the type of being it is because elves live an average life of 300 years, while high elves live about 500 years. The last time a blue dragon appeared was 600 years ago when the lake of life possessed a strong effect compared to even the prayers of priests. The reason it suddenly appeared in that place in tatters was to heal itself because the blue dragon had been poisoned by the demon's poison. As Zephyr flies down toward it, the dragon notices him, and in an instant, it moves, striking his head and eating Zephyr whole. Fortunately, he can easily hold the teeth that are going to devour him. 
Because of the dragon's weakened state, he is able to overpower it with his 19% dragon heart output. Using his dragon king style and his dragon claw, Zephyr decides that the blue dragon will be his first prey, and then rampages in its mouth. And with it, Zephyr also binds the dragon's mouth with his black dragon chain. Right after, he smiles as the time for fishing comes, using his dragon tongue magic. The strikes come, lifting the massive dragon up from the lake toward the branch. Still, even while injured, the blue dragon was able to swing Zephyr around. After using all of his 19% output of the dragon heart, he still completely loses in terms of strength. So Zephyr summons his dragon slayer sword, swiftly swinging it to slash the inner part of the dragon's mouth. The inside of its mouth is way softer than its scales on the outside. That's also where the important blood vessels and nerves pass through. Zephyr decides to stay as close to its insides as possible and deal damage. Right at that moment, the dragon gives up, trying to free itself, then strikes its jaw toward the tiny human right in front of it. That manages to pin Zephyr down, and with it, the massive dragon tries to perform its dragon breath from up close, point-blank range. Tiara, who is watching from afar, knows what that means, along with Dariel, who knows that blue flame, the one that burned their forest back in time when the dragon came. However, Altair doesn't lose her composure, commending the support team to prepare their skill, because she knows that it's alright and that Zephyr is safe. It turns out that Altair wasn't the only one that noticed, and the dragon also did. While it wasn't fully in the right state of mind because of the pain of the poison, it knew that it didn't feel anything between its teeth. Since the side of its mouth had felt a sting right before it unleashed its breath, its prey, which it was holding tightly, had disappeared. It turns out that Zephyr used the silver key to enter the silver room and dodge the flame. Right after the dragon unleashes its breath, Zephyr immediately appears again right in front of it. He knows that the chance to counter-attack comes right after, and in that instant, he performs his thunderclap palm strike. The dragon doesn't have a long downtime, so it performs its own counter as well, going for another breath. Fortunately, it took a long time to prepare, so Zephyr noticed it, using his own dragon breath to explode its dragon breath pocket. Even if it possessed great regenerative powers, it wouldn't be able to use its breath for the next 10 minutes, so Zephyr tells the support team to do their strikes. That instant, the priestess uses a thorn of sins, a mage that uses an ice spell that binds and freezes the dragon right on the trunk of the Tree of Life. Right after, Dariel, who uses the black dragon arrow and the black dragon bow, coats the tip of his arrow with extreme venom. With all of his power, he releases it. Along its path, the power of the strikes also cleared the plants that were summoned by the massive poison plants, going straight to the tide dragon. The people cheered as the arrow pierced the scale of the blue dragon, along with Kiara, who seemed really happy that it did. But Dariel still doesn't feel satisfied, as he remembers that time when Zephyr scolds him. Zephyr explains that the second reason he is weak is that he lacks real fighting experience, adding that all of him has yet to fight an opponent that would awaken his true strength. However, even if he still doesn't fully understand it, he will soon find out not only his power but also his life's mission. Another strike comes toward the dragon again the crimson meteor riding the bloody dragon's scale arrow. Realization comes to him, as he understands it is that the blue dragon is not his end goal but merely a stepping stone that he must surpass. Together with the other supporting magics, the blast towards the dragon deals massive damage. On the other hand, Zephyr is having a hard time looking for the dragon's fatal weakness, something specific that is located on the dragon's body. As Zephyr is trying to rip his way through its inside, his hand stops moving as if something is gripping it tightly. He notices that something is wrong, which Altair also notices. She immediately commands the party to stop the attacks and turns on the defensive because the Mana Road is changing directions. What Zephyr explained to her is that the Mana Road is able to direct its attacks toward the dragon, but the dragon is also able to strike its attack towards the party. In response, the healer cast her defensive spell, and the soldiers put up a defensive barrier. As the mage counted down, the timing of the mana road changed, and she got struck along with the party by a blast from the tombstone golem that came from the blue dragon. Yet, Zephyr knows when the water's surface starts to suddenly splash around for no reason, and when he gets thrown back suddenly. As his black dragon chain breaks, that would mean that from that point on, the dragon will be using the power of its unique attribute, which is telekinesis. It is a power that allows it to move objects without touching them. The dragon set its eyes on Zephyr, and when a dragon that has close to infinite mana possesses such a power, that would mean destruction, screams and despair. Yet, Zephyr doesn't lose his composure, and after 20 minutes of his dragonification, he stares back at the blue dragon because he knows, even if the blue dragon is dazed because of the pain after it suddenly experiences a great amount of another stingy pain, it will actually sober up and that will be when the true battle starts. The blue dragon sees Zephyr, noticing the sword that he wields, the dragon slayer sword that someone it faced before wielded. At the party's side, they gather their wounded and heal them while Altair evaluates that their skill's effect will be reduced even further from now on. 
On the other hand, Dariel has a problem if he shoots his arrow from 1.5 kilometers away. It would take 4 seconds to reach the dragon, even if he uses his fastest skill, Crimson Meteor. So Zephyr needs to stop the dragon from moving for at least 4.5 seconds for his arrow to hit. And the dragon raid gate that was open started to seem like it was closing. Everyone is waiting for that one person. The soul vanguard, Zephyr, to open it again as he evades the dragon's strike with his swift movements in Dragon King style. The strike was so strong that even the sturdy branch that could take the weight of the dragon was turned to dust, and there was no chance Zephyr could tank that attack head-on. While Zephyr zips around with lightning speed, the dragon uses its telekinesis to move the branch, finally landing a hit on Zephyr, stopping his movements. That blasts him toward the lake, and as he manages to gain his footing in the air, the blue dragon is ready to strike him with his wide-open jaw. Fortunately, using electric acceleration, Zephyr manages to dodge the strike, summons his sword again and slits the dragon's mouth. But then, the dragon goes for a swim in the lake, trying to recover its injuries. Still, it won't be able to recover that quickly because of the poison in the lake, and the bigger problem is the raging wave of the poison lake. The plants that produce byproducts would use the water of life as materials, and the quality of the byproducts would be decided by the amount of water of life that's provided to them. The plants produce, after absorbing all the raging waves of the poison lake, strong monsters that will march toward the party. With all that they have, they support the golems to deal with the monsters. But, there are too many monsters appearing, and they decide to push all of them toward the lake so that they don't get in Zephyr's way and kill the monsters that are approaching the camp. But then, suddenly, half of the golems are changing direction, running away from the battlefield, the golems that had been meddled by the Elder Elf. On top of that, a sudden range attack comes their way, and fortunately, Dariel notices it. In response, he shoots his arrow toward it. He deflects the attack, but the problem is the distance between them and the monster who launched that attack is about 700 meters. The party needs to stay on their toes because that monster is definitely on the level of a dungeon boss. In the previous life, the raid took place one year and four months later, where they lost the Black Dragon's heart, but Altair didn't give up. She gathered strong comrades and challenged the Blue Dragon, so while they did kill the Blue Dragon, they couldn't obtain its dragon heart because of a grave mistake they made. The pollution of the Danakil granary was so serious that it was beyond cure. A failure is the only word that could be said about the result. Despite all that, after Zephyr came out of the cave, he returned to the temple and started to struggle as he climbed his way up the ranks. One of Ned's enemies, Aldian, was in the third parish. He had to become a temple knight to get closer to him so that he could have a chance at revenge. He overheard Aldian talk with Matthias about the princess's failure. It turns out that the failure is the result of the demon god cult schemes, and at that time, Lucius is under the brainwashed control of Aldian. Along with it, the demon god cult possesses two of the dragon hearts that had been discovered at that time. But now, inside the Silver Key, Zephyr knows that this time, the situation is different. He has a black dragon heart and will get his second with the blue dragon. With it, he drinks a bunch of potions to recover and uses the video relay golem to see the situation on the lake. Outside, the monsters uproot huge trees, and then a bunch of smaller monsters mount up to them as the massive one throws them up toward the party. Using the hippogriff's feather arrows and with the support of his sister, Dariel shoots them down. Their combined magic, called Blue Storm and Flame Dance, incinerates the monsters that come their way. The rest of the party is also pulling their own weight, but the problem is that there are too many monsters. On top of that, the boss rank monster suddenly casts magic that makes the swarming monsters disappear all at once, only to appear again right on top of the camp where the party station is, slamming them with their sheer number. Along with it, the boss rank monster also joins the fray, stomping its massive leg onto the masses of the party. Fortunately, Ophelia is there, able to stop it with her sheer physical strength, saving the knights that going to get flattened. She then barrages the massive monster that stands before her with her sword moves, saying that its head is way too high for a monster, commanding it to stand down. Meanwhile, Regulus and a few support members stand guard of the branch to protect it from getting destroyed by the monsters. As Alter sets it up, she tells him that his role is to protect it, and the safe region will be destroyed if that branch is gone. So he comes to a crossroads whether to help the party outside or stand on guard inside the zone. But then, suddenly, Altair shouts while knocking at the door, calling out to him to open it. Though he knows that it's probably a monster that uses the princess's voice, he still opens the door in the end. Waiting outside is the elder elf, using an imp acorn to imitate the princess's voice. He then suddenly uses a flashlight spell, blinding the party that guards the branch. In that split second, he comes inside and grabs the branch. The sound of the horn whistle then sounded, marking that the core of the magic circle had been stolen and the Elder Elf, with a few of the High Elves, ran way out of the camp. Using the video relay golem, Altair is smiling, asking Zephyr whether he can hear that, and they are about to be in deep shit, 
and telling him to kill the blue dragon within 10 minutes. Zephyr then teases her, asking for a reward, so she offers him to continue what they couldn't finish yesterday. That simultaneously excites and surprises Zephyr with a full heart on and Altair wishes all of them luck before ending personal communication. Right after, the blue dragon rises up from the lake and sets its eyes on Zephyr. The blue dragon was able to recover its breath pocket because it went underwater. If it could endure the damage it was taking, it could use its breath. And, just at that time, its enemy stopped moving because he was distracted, and then it shot its dragon breath toward the tiny human that still thinks about his reward. Suddenly, Zephyr turns around, telling it to shut up, as he summons the stake of faith that he stored inside the silver room landing it right on top of the blue dragon's head. He then called out to the rear squad, commanding them to change the strategy, to follow exactly what he is about to order them to do, then in 10 minutes, that dragon is already dead meat. The group of elves that went AWOL is after the last sealed box, which contains the seed of the Tree of Life, so they can move somewhere else to create another settlement. Meanwhile, one of the strongest ten, a reliable healer who supports the masses in standing their ground, Zephyr, who possesses a dragon heart, and even the princess, who possesses powerful authority, are fighting to their teeth. While Dariel is powerful, he is not the center of the elf kingdom since the queen is sick, known as the broken moon, and the king cannot move a muscle in the form of a tree. The elder is the one who is able to call the shot, and that's how the elves are divided into two forces, one that follows Dariel in the raid and one that follows the elder toward the tower that stores that last box. But right at the bottom of that tower, there's an entity that scratches the wall of the tower endlessly. It was a demon, a mindless demon that cried and seemingly wanted something from the tower. The elder then uses the flying golems to attract that monster's attention. That was a standard tactic. The monster reacted to one of the golems, and right after, the other golem threw the explosion seed to break the tower's seal, and the elves were able to recover the sealed box leisurely. What they miscalculated was that the box in their hand was an item that the demonic monster wanted for three whole years. Crimson Moon, Masha, a queen candidate 60 years ago, and the elf that caused the war with Danakil four years ago. Because she went through demonification and lost her rationality, all she remembers now is her hostility towards elves. After being heavily wounded by the war they wage against the humans, she seeks help from the demon god cult's leader along with Black Moon, Ramiel. They then become a pair of demonification monsters, witnessed by the demon god cult executive Twelve Apostles. Three months after they become demons, they kill everything they come into contact with, both monsters and humans, and they got used to their new powers. After that, Aldean schemes against them, offering to kill the blue dragon and he will lend his soldiers. At Gala Mountain, the original den of the blue dragon, Artalis, the pair goes against the blue dragon, as it expresses how ridiculous that is, and it is rendered speechless seeing the demonification elves. The eastern one and all Aldean, the ones who scheme against the elves, thought that even the cult had lent them combatants. They are sloppy, and they will just become that dragon food. That's how they meet their pathetic end, and the dark moon gets swallowed whole by the blue dragon. But that's Aldean's goal to begin with because the dark moon demonification form masters the art of poisons. He has the demonic skills that evolved over thousands of battles, extreme venom and petrification. Aldean uses him to make use of that skill to release poison into the dragon's stomach until it dies. In the end, it's just going to be a race against time. Will the dragon die first because of the poison, or will Black Moon be melted by the dragon's digestive system first? Of course, before everything ends, the Black Moon's objective will be accomplished because the Blue Dragon will definitely go to the Lake of Life in order to cure its poisoned body. At that point, the Blue Dragon doesn't care about Crimson Moon because of the pain it experiences, and Masha is hanging on its tail going to the forest of the elf. Also, because she couldn't think properly due to a side effect of the demonification, she hung on not because she had a plan but purely because of her instincts. As the dragon flies by the tower that stores the sealed box, she is attracted to the energy that stimulated her faint memories and jumps off toward that tower. She ends up killing the security troopers who are making a lot of noise in the vicinity. But because of the confusion caused by the dragon's appearance and the pollution of that vicinity, no one found out about that tragedy. After that day, she spent all of her time clawing away meaninglessly at the tower and feasted as she hadn't done so in a while. The flesh and blood of the elder, who had a lot of water in life, helped Masha recover the meaning of the various words that were in her ruined mind. The moment she regains her mind again, she sets her eyes toward the aura of this particular being in the tower. It is the broken moon, the elf's queen who has been bedridden almost all her life. The branded worm allows demon god worshippers to borrow the power of a demon, and the user would grow so that they could use that power. Once their growth stops and evolves, they would gain special abilities. The special ability of the branded worm that Masha raised was gluttony. It's a power that steals the skill of the living organism that she devours. The elf elder's skill, acceleration, a skill that allows elders to stab the weaknesses of their opponents, 
gave Masha incredible speed that allowed her to reach her destination. She then walks inside the queen's chamber, setting her eyes on the queen's lifeless body, and readily devours her whole. With her raging anger, she dashes towards the queen, but suddenly, Ned appears right between them and then slashes Masha, preventing her from hurting the queen. All of that time, Ned was left wondering why Zephyr, his disciple, sent him to the rear position while asking him to protect the queen. It turns out that a demon would appear out of nowhere, and in any case, he proclaims that it will be her grave, unleashing all of his dragon-style technique to deal with it. Meanwhile, with a full rise of morning wood, Zephyr keeps trading blows with the poisoned blue dragon. The time left before the purification magic circle of the camp is dispelled is 8 minutes and 20 seconds. But he knows the fight won't be over after the blue dragon dies. He knows that the black moon, Ramiel, who's in the dragon's stomach and is the owner of the poison that polluted the forest, will wake up after his petrification is dispelled. That is the real reason Altair's raid failed in the previous life. As the party manages to kill the blue dragon, and when the vanguard is about to claim the dragon's heart, Ramiel wakes up from its stomach, surprising the party while also claiming the dragon's heart. The Black Moon's poison becomes several times stronger as he gets in contact with the dragon's heart. His poison bursts forth like an explosion and covered the forest, melting everything in the vicinity. While Altair gets the party to retreat immediately and manages to avoid total annihilation, they don't get the dragon's heart, and the great elven forest, along with the Danakil granary, became even more polluted. It became a hell that no one could live in. Knowing all of that, Zephyr tries to make sure that will not happen. The other reason they failed back then was because they lacked information. There are also two vanguards that could fight freely within the poison fog. He tells Zephyr back then that, the dragon seemed to move awkwardly as if it was trying to protect a part of its body. Even with that, Zephyr still fails to find it, and having enough out of it, he summons a scale that has been smeared with extremely lethal poison. Using the dragon's tongue, he casts an explosion on the scales after stabbing it into the dragon's body, making it scream hysterically. But then, Artalis uses its own dragon tongue to stop the time, making Zephyr unable to move even the water droplets and the leaves stop at its command. A whole different level of commanding power is needed compared to a dragonoid, who's fundamentally a human but has a dragon heart. Artalis is able to move and then open its mouth wide, going to shallow Zephyr hole. But unfortunately, now he cannot use the silver room to dodge it. But during the seconds that the time stops for them, Dariel fired two rounds of arrows, landing right on point, making the dragon lost its grasp on Zephyr. That's the new plan, so Zephyr will create an opening for Dariel to fire as he pleases. It's far from enough, so Dariel fires more arrows toward the dragon. With every attack that lands on it, he damages its breath pocket even more. Right after, Zephyr arrives behind the blue dragon and swings his sword with full power to go for its neck. With that, both of them manage to completely destroy Artalis' breath pockets, and there are 17 black dragon arrows left. Still, the blue dragon was yet to be killed, so it frantically rampaged more towards Zephyr, who flew around like a fly evading its strikes. Seeing an opening, Zephyr lands another blow to the dragon's body while he keeps looking for its weakness. But then, Artalis manages to land its own punch on Zephyr, blasting him away towards the Tree of Life's trunk. Right at that time, Artalis uses telekinesis to pull the black dragon arrow that is stuck on its flesh, then controls the branches that fall into the lake to fire them toward Zephyr. Using the black dragon chain, Zephyr manages to parry all of it, only to be surprised that the dragon's claw is already coming at him with full force, stamping him into the tree trunk. Fortunately, Zephyr is able to evade it, going around the dragon's hand, then summoning the Stake of Faith again and stabbing it right through its neck. On top of that, Zephyr gathers his mana on his hand, and along with the dragon power he can muster, he punches the stake of faith going through the dragon's neck further. Behind Artalis, another barrage of arrows landed on him again, able to land a massive blow. With the stake of faith stuck on its neck and a dismembered arm, Artalis sets its eyes on Zephyr, who wields the dragon slayer sword. That makes her remember her lord, Kaiseris, the black dragon who went insane and got ganged up by the heroes. It was Georgius who wielded the dragon slayer sword, who ended Kaiseris's life. And 1000 years ago, Artalis thanked him for freeing her lord from Kaiseris's curse. She forgives Georgius for killing her lord, but she promises to kill him if he ever appears right in front of her. As Artalis remembers all of that, the dragon stops moving and stands alone on the lonely lake of life, hurting. But Dariel and Kiara know that the tree of life is trembling. And then suddenly, Artalis releases all of the dragon power within its vessel. She then finally speaks, calling out to Zephyr, who she knows as Georgius the Dragon Slayer. She didn't know what she said back then was her oath. She takes out the stake of faith that stuck on her neck, as she claims that she mustn't forgive him. She then takes up her dismembered arm, and using dragon tongue, she commands it to become a sword. 
with the azure blue sword in hand, Artalis says that she can finally perform her duty, killing the man who killed her lord, Kaiserus. Twelve minutes before dragonification is over, one dragon breath is left, but that number no longer matters before the blue dragon who wields the dancing blade of death. A weapon is created by burning away a life force using a dragon tongue. What's needed to deal with that is total concentration and a decision. All other plans for other situations will be thrown away, focusing only on immense power. Zephyr commences the Berserk Dragon mode, welcoming the strike from the Blue Dragon. That tiny human manages to deflect that massive, overwhelming power, but that doesn't stop there because Artalis keeps coming at him, and within a few breaths, they trade hundreds of blows. Using otherworldly power, Artalis slashes vertically down towards Zephyr, who manages to split the Tree of Life in half. Yet, Zephyr was able to stop that strike in its path, preventing it from going further. He then flies up in the air, remembering what Ned taught him, that just as everything moves, strength also flows from one place to another, like a single leaf that is able to split a tree trunk in half, using a small amount of power to overpower greater enemies. Zephyr managed to land several strikes on the dragon in the amount of time he dashed to it. Looking at the injured blue dragon, Zephyr notices something shining in the dragon's body. Something that's stuck, a weapon that seems to have been stuck for a long time. That's what his comrade told him back then. Information that says the blue dragon has a long-term wound that it can't recover from, which is its fatal weakness. So Zephyr immediately flies towards it again while evading the dragon's sword strike. Right at that moment, Artalis dives down into the lake to try to escape again. But Zephyr doesn't let her be, so he summons the black dragon chain to tie her tail. Instead, he drags him into the lake along with the dragon, so he comes closer to it to strike his dragon slayer sword. From the camp, Dariel prays to his parent to guide him on his path while shooting his crimson meteor. However, the arrows miss the dragon, instead hitting the trunk of the Tree of Life. Still, he shoots the arrows again, deliberately hitting the tree that finally breaks it. At the same time, as Artalis swings her sword to strike Zephyr, the trunk lands on top of her. With that opening, Zephyr goes to strike the weapon that is stuck on Artalis' body, and with a single strike, it makes the dragon scream uncontrollably. As it turns out, 1000 years ago, Georgius didn't leave Artalis be, and he struck her with his dragon slayer sword, and they had a short battle. No, it's more accurate to say that she got beaten up one-sidedly because she let her guard down. Along with it, Georgius stuck the White Queen's finger on her body. A stake made from the First Queen's bone seals the power of its target, and the target cannot remove the curse by himself due to the effects of the curse. Artalis is now finally able to remember clearly what happened a thousand years ago. And in that case, the person right in front of her is not Georgius, so she takes a closer look at him. Zephyr, the new dragon slayer, succeeded Georgius. Right after the blue dragon is killed, Ramiel notices that the blue dragon's life force has stopped reacting. He then wakes up from his deep slumber, and the moment he gets his hands on its dragon heart has come. But then, suddenly, a sword strike came right to him, and it was Zephyr forcefully taking him out from the blue dragon's stomach. Right after, Zephyr strikes him again, blasting him away towards the tree, and then taking the dragon's corpse into the silver room. And now another battle commences between Zephyr and the demonification Dark Moon. Yet, before he is able to make any move, Zephyr uses the black dragon chain to bind him to the tree and in an instant, he appears with the stake of faith in his hands. There, he stakes him, then spins the stake, going to rupture Ramiel's body. Unfortunately, he wasn't there and managed to slip away, only to appear on top of the tree branch. Zephyr then uses the dragon tongue magic to bind Ramiel on it, then chases him with the stake, going for the same attack. But as Zephyr attacks him, he summons a poison barrier that manages to block the stake. At this point, Zephyr is on his last breath because he is about to faint after using the dragon tongue, and his body is in tatters but he has no other choice. So he summons the Sword of Light, but the Goddess of Light doesn't permit it. In the end, summoning the sword only burns him, so he has no other way but to get away from Ramiel. At that opening, the Dark Moon summons his ultimate skill, a Venom Spear, and then strikes it. He laughs ecstatically, saying that he loves that moment, a being who's stronger than him, an overwhelming strong being that he would become humble towards unwittingly. As that is not enough, he also summons an orb, gathering poison mist around him and concentrating it into a single orb that is able to melt everything. But then, suddenly, the root of the tree is moving, striking Ramiel in the chest. Now Zephyr laughs at him, and thanks to him that uses that stupid skill, he sucked up all the poison in that area. And thanks to that, the tree of life and the lake are clean. Then, for good measure, Zephyr comes closer to him, and using the last bit of Dragon Heart's power and the Dragon King-style technique, he decimates Ramiel's head. Before Zephyr's news could reach the camp, the rearguard could already feel it. The Tree of Life was resurrected. The soldiers are cheering up as Altair asks whether Zephyr can hear them, but she fails to get a response, and Zephyr falls down into the lake. Fortunately, the Tree of Life welcomes him with his roots, as he thanks Zephyr, a young dragonoid, and since Zephyr helps the tree, 
he decides to help Zephyr as well, taking the human into his trunk. On the other side, Ned also notices that the roots of the Tree of Life have been revived, which means Zephyr has succeeded, as he himself had already killed the Crimson Moon. But she is stronger than he anticipated after absorbing the Elder's skill, and he is not in great shape after losing a lot of blood against her. At that moment, a vine moves as if it wants to hug him. It was the queen who woke up from her deep slumber, telling Ned to not be surprised and explaining that the vine acts as her hands and feet. She is unable to move. However, he protects her, so she asks him to allow her to express her gratitude as she wakes up from her bed. She is Sylvestia, the queen of the elves, asking Ned to come over. Meanwhile, a dream about when Zephyr is little, evading his sleep, the memories of her mother and all. He wakes up in the chamber inside the Tree of Life. The first question he wonders is how much time has passed since he fell. A voice can be heard saying that it has been 72 hours, 18 minutes and 29 seconds. He also asked him to not move yet, as he is currently recovering. Yggdrasil shows himself to Zephyr, the being of the Tree of Life. Zephyr now knows the Tree of Life, but Dariel never told him anything in his past life. Yggdrasil then explains that the only person who has seen him in that form is his wife since he cannot show such a large reincarnation as that outside his body. He has never shown his children, Dariel and Kiara, that form either. That makes Zephyr wonder whether he can read other people's thoughts. So Yggdrasil then explains that he is only deciphering the signals coming out of Zephyr's body, and that is his power, offering to stop if it offends him. He then commands a twig of the tree to give Zephyr a fruit, explaining that if he eats that fruit enriched with his sap, Zephyr will recover quickly. He then explains that even though he can't move as he was infected by poison, he can see through his children and observe Zephyr. And Zephyr even kept his wife safe by telling Ned where to go. He adds that he knows that is called a bilateral contract, so Yggdrasil will offer him something in return. Yet, Zephyr has no freaking idea what he is talking about, and what he can remember of Yggdrasil from Dariel is that his father is a demigod someone who's akin to a god but hasn't reached that state. Yggdrasil then mentions the dragon heart inside Zephyr, and he knows that it has a side effect to transplant it into such a fragile body. So Yggdrasil offers to help Zephyr with it, and he will also make Zephyr's body stronger so he can transplant the blue dragon's heart as well. Along with it, he also asks Zephyr for a request as well. After the whole ordeal, telling the stories of the past and future, Yggdrasil reveals that he is one who knows the truth of the world, with the symbol of the Oath Ring, an overwhelmingly stronger one. Even only looking at it already sends a jolt of headache to Zephyr, so Yggdrasil tells him to not look at it for too long. He then explains that along with the seven dragons and him, they are beings bound by missions given to them by the Almighty. As long as they have that, they cannot run away from their mission until they die. The only thing he needs to do is to help Zephyr with the transplant of the blue dragon's heart. His request to Zephyr is to kill Yggdrasil when the time comes so he won't hurt his wife or children because of his mission. Now, the same ordeal goes to Zephyr again. A whole fighting against the blue dragons will inside his consciousness. After summoning his past life power, only to be surprised to see a woman inside, where he supposedly sees the blue dragon. There, when he realizes that the blue dragon is a she, on top of that, she takes the human form, which is unheard of from the dragon even in his past life. The difference in this life is that Zephyr already has the black dragon's will with him, which means that he has already gotten Kaiseru's permission. And Kaiseru's is her lord, so Zephyr will have her power without much of a fight. Right after that raid finished, he came out from the trunk of the Tree of Life. What welcomes him are his comrades, along with Altair with them. So Zephyr asks why she is waiting out there, and she says that she is waiting for him. That instant, he jumps off from the root of the Tree of Life to receive Altair in his arms. And thus, another part of the old god is transferred to a new owner, and the future of this world has changed even more. At the same time, in the fourth parish of the Temple of Light, there is a conversation about why there is no news from Cardinal Aldean yet. Suddenly, another knight runs toward the captain with a letter in his hands. As soon as Captain Gertrude opens the letter and reads what is inside, her face immediately changes, knowing her master Aldean is killed. People start to talk about the topic as well. They all wonder whether it's true that the twin knights of Aldean also disappeared. However, others heard that they were dead at the third parish where they were sent. And the fact that the entire third district is killed by the holy son Lucius makes the rumors even more famous. The twin knights are ranked 10th among the top 10 strongest people. Because of religious issues, the saints were not among the top 10. But if the Holy Son defeated their place in the top 10, it would now be in the hands of another terrible person. Meanwhile, all three factions rush straight to the castle at the top of the hill. At the same time, in the Temple of the Angel, Mercedes believes this will be the start of war, leading to rivers of blood flowing to the earth. And at the end of the last thousand years, he will appear to save them all from imminent death. This one is called Destroyer of Fate. Back to Earth, inside the Lindell Castle, Idirius held a huge sword. He had defeated his opponent and began to laugh loudly. He said that it was too dull for him here because he had already won. 
and now he deems himself worthy to meet the princess. While Zephyr is inside the Tree of Life, everyone is busy. Yggdrasil, who's cleared of poison, sent the activation code so the mana flows can start working. With the help of its roots, which it planted along the reservoirs, they stored and filtered the water and distributed magical energy in the air. And thus, the surrounding area began to be cleansed. The surviving people destroyed the remnants of the monsters and headed to the Tree of Life. And when Altair, along with her squad and her faithful knight Ophelia, returned, they saw something incredible. In the capital of the Elven Kingdom of Elvenheim, everything begins to bloom, and a bright white flower appears. Most of the elves began to sob loudly and rejoice at the same time. After all, they did not think that they would ever return to this place. But at that exact moment, Ned appeared behind them and said that it was too early for them to rejoice. And as soon as the elves turned around with great surprise in their eyes, they saw someone they didn't think they would see at that moment. Their queen appeared before them, and they were happy that she had woken up. Dariel and his sister could not hold back the tears in their eyes because they finally saw their mother. At that very moment, they rushed to her to quickly hug her. A while later, the search began for the missing stragglers during the battles and forced march. This is followed by the treatment of the wounded and the burial of the dead. Both garbage collection and the need for labor were great, and it was impossible to assign all the responsibilities to Yggdrasil, which was already busy clearing the lands. In addition, this busyness helped everyone overcome their grief of losing friends, family, and home. After the threat of the blue dragon disappeared, hope returned. Grief still finds its way to their heart, but this also made everyone realize that monstrous damage is unfortunately necessary for victory. And by the time the past is abandoned and the tragedy is realized, the princess and queen officially end the raid on the blue dragon. That day, the queen expresses her gratitude to the lands of the Danakil of the Temple of Light. She also thanks Zephyr, who saved the elf people from extinction. They will always remember this. As a race of the Tree of Life, respecting the bilateral agreement, they will return their kindness as much as they received from them. Taking advantage of this opportunity, the Great Elven Forest will subsequently be an ally of Princess Altair for centuries and will sign the Pact of Non-Aggression. And the son of the head of the trading company realized that this was it, and he received the answer to the question that he had before preparing for the raid. After all, he says that elves and people hate each other, and it is difficult to organize a paradise in such conditions. They also have to worry about the raid members not tearing each other's throats out and whether it's too early to go on a joint hunt. But the princess then answered him and said that she thought it was even better. It's not for nothing that they say that any crisis is an opportunity, and it may seem that the situation is not the best now. But he needs to look to the future. Their goal is to get the Elven Kingdom and Danakil lands. That made him think that Altair was planning a siege on both of them in their weakened state. But his father, the head of the trading company, replied that it wasn't the case. In Danakil, Polaris is treated as a hero because he expelled the Black and Red Moon during the war four years ago. Altair continues to say that when the lands were poisoned, Polaris did not help by saying that he had no strength left and sold all his bonds together. In other words, Polaris concluded that this situation cannot be solved. Soon, Danakil is abandoned when they are in a situation where they need help the most. And it is even worse for the elves, since they broke off diplomatic relations with people a long time ago, so they have no allies to help them. Altair believes that this is their chance and that they will help them but not as people or members of the royal family but as Princess Altair. They will use this chance to reduce Polaris' influence for the sake of victory in the war. That will begin very soon. Back to the ceremony, Zephyr is content with what he sees. The power of the elves, Danakil's abundance of food in the granaries, and the restorative power of the Lake of Life will be in their hands. This is Altair's goal, and he's not disappointed by it. Added by the fact that everything went better than expected. The Queen of the Elves initially had similar goals to them, and now that she has awakened, she will control the Elves using mind control. Those connected to the Tree of Life would never betray them again. As soon as it was over, they all began celebrating this victory together and decided to drink. When the fun was in full swing, suddenly Kiara turned around and started to leave. Dariel is the first one to notice this, but he could not understand why she left the fun. A little later, he saw that she was sitting on the steps near the entrance to the banquet hall. He slowly approaches her and decides to ask what she is doing here alone. But while wiping her tears, she asked him why he had come and why he wasn't having fun at the party. To this, he replied that only a crying baby had run away. At that same moment, he threw an apple at her, even though she had told him not to throw food around. Right after, he decided to sit down next to her and eat the apple he held. Being there for her, he started a conversation about how difficult it was for them to believe in all this. Less than a month and a half had passed since Zephyr appeared in the Great Forest and he had already killed the dragon and returned their home to them. Tiara had thought that no one would have believed that this day would come. She's relieved that her mother and the Tree of Life were also healed. Now, they can return to their duties as the Queen's Arrow. But suddenly, Dariel asked his little sister what happened to her because he felt anxious seeing her cringeworthy attitude. 
Kiara decided to make a face and stick out her tongue to her brother. Gariel couldn't understand what she meant by all this, and she continued to say that if he knew, she would leave the forest. At one point in the morning, when some people are sleeping, there are some who cannot sleep because of worries. Zephyr is one of them. He is passing by the corridor, heading to one place where someone is waiting for him, and so he approaches Altair's door because he still has important business to do. After all, behind that very door stood the princess in her nightgown. At that moment, Zephyr knocks on her door, to which she, with a reddened face, excitedly begin to turn her head towards the door. Previously, everyone wanted to get the princess, a talented and beautiful girl of noble origin. Wherever she is, she is always surrounded by people who say that for the sake of her princess, they would get the stars from the sky and protect her at the cost of their own lives. Although she knew they spoke eloquently, all these cowards would have left instantly if they realized what she wanted and had to be protected from. After all, even in childhood, she realized that a negligible number of people would be ready to follow her, and the people who supported her were really good people. That makes her never experienced a passion for the opposite sex. She has already decided that she will be lonely for the rest of her life. She does not need a loving man but his sharp sword. When she was still little, she saw her brother, who had killed someone and being covered in blood. She was terrified when he extended his hand to her. And it's not just because he killed someone but he began to turn into a huge demon who was chasing her. She ran away as fast as she could, and on that day, her life ended, when she set herself on such a huge goal as a victory over her enemies. It becomes superior to her in everything, and feeling is an unaffordable luxury, while love can only be a weakness. She needs to find a man who will lead her to victory, like a marriage of convenience, which is what she has on her mind. Until that one fateful day when she was looking out the window, she saw Zephyr, who unapologetically showed his swag around. She was surprised when she saw him, who also raised his gaze and looked into her soul. Somewhere else, Ophelia stared into the empty barrel and realized that it was a huge, pathetic failure that the barrel was empty. Ned, sitting next to her, told her not to say anything stupid then. She turns her head, expressing how the princess has changed since Zephyr appeared. The fact that she was brushed away breaks her even more. The way she sees it, they seem to spend all their time together now. When she saw them, the princess brushed her away as she was going to talk to the elders while telling Ophelia to merely monitor the situation. A few days later, Altair brushed her away once more, claiming that she was completely safe being protected by the Tree of Life. On the other hand, there is a feast going on, so Altair tells her to drink and have fun. That thought made Ophelia begin to sob harder because they grew up like sisters, and now, she feels like Altair doesn't need her anymore while Ned thinks he should help his student by keeping this sobbing night company. Somewhere else that night, Zephyr arrives at Altair's door feeling nervous. As it opens up, he is stunned witnessing such a wonderful sight to behold. He reminds her about the promise they made about defeating the dragon in 10 minutes, and he demands compensation. Altair blushes in her nightgown, feeling embarrassed to embrace the night that she had promised herself. She looks away from him, trying to gather her thoughts on what to say to him. Looking at her, Zephyr finally thought that he was able to keep his expectations up after all. So he invites himself in, towards the princess's moist lips to embrace. At this point, she knows this night only for a month or so, which is confusing for Altair. Their lips touch, her cheek blushes, and her breath is short after being bewitched by the sweet kiss from the night. Right after the greetings, Zephyr lays her on the bed. Completely letting her guard down, Altair left with her own thoughts that she would always be lonely until the end of her life, and love would just pass her by. That's what she believed in so far until she found this knight, who claims to love her so much in both this and her past life. To think that the lone princess, who thought she stood alone atop the thorny path, would have someone to walk side by side within life and death. This brings her back to the other night on the first time of their encounter alone. She was trying so hard to ignore that fact. But the truth is, she had a very hard time enduring the loneliness and how hard it must have been for Zephyr to have everyone around him die. The thoughts keep her thinking about him all night. Knowing all of this is breaking her and makes her want to do something for him. That's also the exact time she finally realizes that she has fallen in love with this knight again. Meanwhile, on the 44th day of the blockade of the third parish, a spreading barrier prevents anyone from entering. Suddenly, the nun woke up from Fade, placing his huge sword nearly missing her neck. And he begins to say that he came here for another matter, and she must say who gave her the two potion vials in his hand. The next day, Dariel is practicing his archery. Suddenly, he remembered that when he was 15 years old, he was told that his mother had been conscious for some time. At that time, Kiara is born, and then his mother says that his sister is born with a different fate, and she would have to leave the forest. His sister told him last night that now was the time she didn't want to be lonely, and if she decides to follow Zephyr, it would be interesting, and maybe she could meet Fade. But Dariel realized that there was something else that she hadn't said. 
He wonders why she is so sad at the banquet. The only thing he can think of is that she is still worried about the rumors. Some say nasty things to her because of her eyes and her dirty hair. And there is no doubt that this child is the fruit of the love of a man and an elf. And that is why the queen is punished. The life force of the forest has dried up, and this child cannot stay in the forest. Remembering all this agitates him, and he starts pouring his anger towards the shooting target. Until the moment when someone calls out and praises him. It is his mother, the queen of the elves. Taking Igrasil in the form of a little bird, she wants to hear her son's voice. Dariel tries to remind her about the cold, but the queen praises him again for how cool his archery is. Hearing it makes Dariel so pleased to be with her, as well as the fact that his mother woke up and his father returned several decades later in the form of an incarnation. He is grateful to Zephyr for all this, but suddenly, the queen asked him if he was too nervous when he shot because his flow of magical power seemed to get stuck somewhere inside his stomach. With his accuracy, he should shoot a little more freely. She advises him to trust his comrades as well since he's not going to fight alone. As soon as she touched him, Dariel immediately remembers when Zephyr fought against a huge blue dragon. And the queen continued to say that in order to uplift the moon, he must leave the forest with his sister. At the same time, the head of the trading company is running along the corridor. As soon as he reaches the princess's door, he knocks on the door, saying there is something urgent he has to say. The door begins to open, and Zephyr comes out feeling fresh after claiming the princess's chastity. He immediately asks what it is. The fact that Zephyr is in the princess's chamber confuses him. But after he gathers his thoughts, he explains that there is something important and asks Zephyr to wake the princess up. Otherwise, she will miss the meeting, while Zephyr notices the seal on the envelopes he brought up. A few minutes later, they are gathered together, along with Ophelia, who has a massive headache after a whole night of drinking episode. Altair begins the meeting by apologizing for not setting it up earlier, then starts to begin with the first thing she has. This is part of an agreement with Queen Sylvester during the party. Kiara and Dariel will become the new permanent members of the group, and everyone should welcome them. Dariel and Kiara immediately stood up and started telling the princess to take care of them and that they would study hard. He is glad he didn't let his sister leave alone, but Kiara had no way of knowing that her mother had a similar plan. And besides, when she went to see her mother this morning, she didn't understand why her mother gave this to her. After all, it belonged to her. But she replied that Kiara should remember what she said then. The fact is that she was born with a different fate. Someday, she will have to leave the forest and start a new life. So, she gave her the last seed of the Tree of Life that she must grow as the queen of the great forest of elves and become the future queen of the new generation. Leaving the great forest to grow a tree and find a new kingdom is the only way their species will survive difficult times in the future. And she is the only one who can do this, because she is born as an empty vessel, capable of containing the power of the new tree. Her weak connection with her father and her fragility is a gift. Now, she is grateful to them and will do her best not to disappoint them. Meanwhile, Dariel is completely confident in what he is doing because he aims to protect his sister. Altair immediately said they showed themselves perfectly well against the dragon and are now their party's primary member. So, from now on, they will support them with information, supplies, and manpower. After that, they move on to the main issue, and the chaos has now begun on both sides, and she doesn't even know. But Philip raised his hand and asked the princess so that he could explain. First of all, he had just received letters from the headquarters of their corps located in the third parish. As everyone knows, Saint Lucius conquered one of the eight challenges of the world, called the Tomb of the Vile Princess, and completely sealed the third entrance to which he belongs. This is a smoke screen created to hide the true location of the dragon's heart. Zephyr is quietly listening and thinks about the fact that he understands that no one knows that he has returned in time. That's why everyone is guessing that Lucius absorbed the dragon heart and is now recovering. Whatever the option is, investors will go crazy if the dragon's heart is sold at auction and would have set the record for the highest price ever. In any case, the legal proceedings will drag on for several years. Even the Temple of Light, which used the heart of the dragon as bait to collect huge investments and offerings, cannot escape responsibility. Therefore, a team is created to protect investors who are afraid of losing their profits. The Financial Council of the Chrome Council wants to shift responsibility to Lucius. The Vatican also dispatched a squad of Sacred Relics Management to chase Lucius. Meanwhile, the Iron Maiden Gertrude, the Third Region's Sanctuary Commander, wants to check Aldian if he's alive. After hearing rumors that Aldian and the Twin Knights had died, the adventurers came to challenge Lucius to compete for the 10th strongest place after the Twin Knights. Everyone shouted for him to open the gate and give their money back, and that he should go out and fight them. Hearing the news, Ned thought that the combat effectiveness of the Third Parish was under threat since many soldiers died during the raid on the tomb. Once the actual siege begins, even the saint will not last long. 
So, he asked the head of the trading company about another letter, wondering if there could be anything more severe than the situation in the third parish. But he replied that the letter was from the butler of Lindell Castle, and a certain knight held a duel on behalf of Ophelia for marriage, and a winner appeared. However, the weapons he used are known to everyone and are closely related to them. Zephyr was immediately reminded of Requiem. It is a legendary sword known as the weapon of swordsman John Howell, who is number one of the continent's strongest men. So he sets on a journey to Lindell Castle, and the butler welcomes him by saying that they are waiting for him. Zephyr knows the Requiem well. It was the sword he had chosen as his last weapon in his past life. But the one with this sword is now the last student of the sword saint named Edirius. And this guy is very strong. When Zephyr came to him, he asked where the princess was. He knew that since Edirius had appeared, it meant he was the strongest person on the continent. And maybe he should kill him right now. Ten strongest on the continent is an honorary title that originates from one of the greatest knights. Five years ago, Sir Lucas was congratulated on his victory in the Cayenne Palace because he could defeat the King of Mercenaries. Not only did he have good command of the troops, but he also had an excellent win in one-on-one -on -one fights. Everyone asks him how it feels to be the strongest on the continent, but he answered everyone that he was not the strongest. Because of the countless strong opponents he had faced so far, if he excluded the children of the Holy God and the Saint, as well as demons and monsters, he would still be the sixth, and the mercenary king as the ninth. King Leo III asked him who the five people in front of him were, and he wanted to know who everyone he deemed stronger than him was. Lucas then mentions people that he thinks are stronger than himself before mentioning himself to be the sixth. Right after, he says that Dariel, the son of the great elven forest, would be the seventh. On the tenth will be the twin knight who was recently defeated by Lucius, the saint. While at the meeting before Zephyr left for Lindell, Philip explained that many knights envy Lucas, and the list of the strongest that he announced quickly spread. All over the world, people who had died in some way began to challenge them. The momentum is gaining rapidly because there were many rivals. Then they became legendary, and this list became known as a ranking of the strongest continents. This is the origin of the ten strongest in the continent. The rating has not changed for two years since Ophelia defeated the twin knights, and the mercenary king was executed for treason. Dariel remembered that he once fought with a human knight during a conflict at the forest's edge seven years ago. According to him, the knight was strong and very famous, but he also thinks he is much weaker than Zephyr and the list is incorrect. Zephyr argues that this list was compiled five years ago. At that time, he was still growing up. Ned adds that whatever the beginning, to make a name for themselves, they need to defeat one of the ten in public or they need to take possession of the thing of one of the ten. That's the unspoken rule. In his past life, Zephyr remembers that the chaos began after the appearance of Edirius, and after he spread words that his master had died, leaving a vacant place in the top ten of the strongest. All kinds of fighters came out. Around the same time, Ned is officially put on the wanted list for stealing the heart of a black dragon. He doesn't even want to remember what kind of madhouse the world was then. Altair concludes that this swordmaster, who claims to be the sword saint's last disciple, is a legendary figure that almost no one has ever seen. She believes he is most likely lying about it, so she deems this a pressing matter. And John Howell is the one the devil cult fears most because she can destroy all their plans. Holy Sword John Howell is another name for Elva Laren. Her nickname is also the White Queen. This is the true identity of the white dragon Nemeshuna. This master is the one who taught her the ancient magic of Media. Belize, sitting at the meeting table, heard about it for the first time, and she wondered how she had learned such magic. And as expected from a princess, she has created a lot of remarkable allies. Dariel couldn't understand because John was a man's name or because people had different customs. But his sister heard that humans have a swordsmanship called Zornhal, and think it's probably a pseudonym or a distortion. Meanwhile, this conversation leaves Edwin confused because he read that the white was killed by a black dragon a thousand years ago, and it is written in the books. But Altair answered him that she was not dead but sealed, and every 100 years, she sent an incarnation to find and educate talented people. And Dariel's sister understood that this was a lie. But Altair, of course, knew that this was not a lie. The man named Edirius is actually a student of the sword saint, and she learned about this from Zephyr. However, if she does not suspect, it will be unnatural for her character. Therefore, there are those here who know that she is a student of the dragon. The only ones who see this future are she, Zephyr, and Ned. It will become dangerous if someone else knows about the future. Therefore, speaking as naturally as possible is the logical thing to do, and she needs to lead them to the correct conclusion. But Philip began to say that the problem was in the sword. It doesn't matter if it is fake. But what will happen if it is a real requirement? This is a sword with special properties, and no one except the teacher should have it. He can't fathom the fact that Edarius would take something like that for a mating duel. There will be many eyes, and rumors cannot be avoided. What is more important is the likelihood that the sword is fake. Suddenly, Zephyr realizes that the timing is interesting. 
and hearing him talk makes Altair pay attention to what he has to say next. He clenched his fist while telling them to think about it from the point of view of the demon god cults. It's a big mess for them to have the heart of the dragon stolen and the twin knight killed. Matthias is brought into the cult, and information from the third parish comes directly. He can't imagine anyone who would miss such a skillfully matched party. Now that they've set up the bait for people from the devilish cult to doubt each other, it should lead them toward the inner part. Although they have meticulously directed the suspicion to someone within the cult, he believes that they won't think that Ned went this far alone, and the number one suspect will be someone from the outside, and that person would be Lucius. However, people who think a little more will also want to explore another possibility. It'll lead them to wonder if there is some other dark figure who would have influence comparable to the leaders of the demonic cult. At the same time, they would be cunning enough to manipulate the saint and Ned to accomplish something like this. At that very moment, Altair says that if this is the case, then she will fall under suspicion. What Zephyr wants to say is that this sword and the student's sword master are separate, and that there may be a trap to lure out the princess. Looking at her, he says that it's too suspicious that he appeared at such a time. It is also dangerous for her to go to the estate. So he asks her if there's a way to check the sword's authenticity. And she replies that the sword reacts to the heart of the dragon. If Zephyr comes into contact with it, he will immediately know whether it's real or not. Then, the decision is made, and Zephyr will go to the princess's estate. If the sword is real, he will take it. And if it is a trap for her, then he will take care of everything. This is how he got to Lindell before sunset and how he stood in front of Ederius who began to ask who he was and where the princess was. But Zephyr, looking at him, understood that. In fact, rumors about this guy should have already reached the head of the cult, so there shouldn't be a problem. And it's true that the head is afraid of the holy dragon for some reason. Suddenly, the girl who was sitting next to Idirius started shouting that he had won the fight fair and square. Simultaneously, he began to get up from his chair and approach Zephyr, and immediately made eye contact as if they were about to start fighting. He smirked and immediately began to thank his teacher. He says that he could fight with strong opponents, and immediately upon arrival, he made a big catch. Idirius then suggests changing the place, or he could fight here. Zephyr replied that it didn't matter to him either way. Using his dragon tongue, Zephyr speaks and commands him to crawl and, like a dog, to follow him. At that instant, massive pressure on the white-haired man to kneel left him no power to stand up. Right after, Zephyr guides Idirius out along the corridor, walking on all fours, following him like an obedient dog. Nina didn't know what to do because Idirius was dragged somewhere with an unknown spell cast on him. She saw the look in Zephyr's eyes, and he was clearly dangerous. But the other girl, Hardy Ho, replies that it's not the case. She believes that Idirius would win and that they shouldn't interfere, then advises Nina to remember what happened in Risha's castle. Back at her castle, when Idirius approached her after a month, he was there. He was staying there to fend off the monsters trying to siege the estate. In the end, he solely defends the castle from the invasion, and even with his trashy character, he is still a good person. With every creature he faced, the fiercer he became, fighting the herd of the monsters with no food and sleep. That's how Hardy came to respect the white-haired man. To be more precise, he is just playing with them before killing the boss with madness. After destroying the monsters in three adjacent territories, Baron Risha thanked him for protecting their lands when he was only 18 years old and already so strong. He even offered his daughter's hand for him. Just then, Idirius remembered about the princess and began to tell the Baron that he would go before the Baron managed to tell him to take his daughter with him. So now, when Nina wants to help, Hardy puts herself in front of the door to stop her from doing anything. She tells her that Idirius is stupid and only knows how to fight like a mad dog. As soon as they finished the conversation, they decided to sneak up and watch what was happening. And now, Zephyr drank water cooled with magical ice. When Idirius slowly gains his strength back, the spell fades. Immediately, he jumps up from his place as he is freed from it. Zephyr notices how quickly Idirius is able to break free from his dragon tongue magic. It usually takes 30 minutes, and thanks to all of the overpowered items Idirius possessed, it only takes 12 minutes for him to break free. Right after, Idirius starts to taunt, saying that he doesn't think he will be under the influence of a dragon's tongue and misses the sensations, expressing he misses his teacher. He also wonders whether Zephyr is from the dragon clan or the heart's owner. At the next moment, Idirius began to use his skill, the Cradle of the Earth, which enabled him to hide anything in the subspace in the ground. He continued to say that no matter the answer, he didn't care because his teacher said not to go easy for people like Zephyr. His body is soon engulfed with azure blue lightning as his sword materializes. Zephyr begins to be cautious because Idirius is John Howell's student. And there are three reasons why the Sword Saint is much stronger than other outstanding teachers. He has innate talent and good artifacts. His armor and the silver lion treasure made from the bones of a white dragon removes the effects of cold, heat, poison, 
and curses. He can fight dragons without a dragon's heart, thanks to these overpowered items. Zephyr then decides to test his skills. He activates his storage skill while telling Edarius that he knows his sword is Requiem and introduces him to his sword, which is called Graham. A dragon sword that was made a thousand years ago and just recently bathed in fresh dragon's blood along its blade. Seeing this, Edirius tenses up because he doesn't expect such a turn of events. Zephyr points at himself, boasting that he even has the dragon's heart. On top of that, he pours chilled water into a glass. Challenging Edirius, if there is even one drop of water from the glass, it means that he will win the fight. Then he can have Graham and the dragon's heart. Edirius excitedly agrees, and if he loses, he will give Zephyr his sword. However, Zephyr refuses, suggesting he will come up with a nickname for him, like Pale-Faced Puppy or just Mongrel, since he doesn't want Requiem. Idirius begins to laugh. He clearly doesn't expect to be mocked by strangers. A split second later, he arrives at Zephyr's face as their sword clashes. Idirius understands that he will become his dog if he loses. While the series of attacks keep coming, Zephyr fends off the attack with a single hand. It is impressive to see a man skillfully handling a giant sword. So Edarius decides to end this battle and begin using Lion's Roar to boost his strength. Zephyr slaps him with his giant broadsword without giving him any chance to make a move. A hit so strong, making him vomit blood upon contact. That slap sent him flying with a trail of dust and pulverizing a boulder he landed on, leaving a massive explosion that can be seen even from afar. The two girls watching realize this fight is different from the usual one they had seen. While the old man realizes how Zephyr has become stronger since the last time he saw him, Edirius proves he still has a fight in him. He dashes up through the air and bolts straight towards Zephyr as he screams his excitement to have a real battle. Using all the power he can muster, he lights up his sword and strikes down toward the weak human who dares against him, and their sword meet. Even with one hand holding a glass of water, Zephyr can easily block the strike that came his way. Along with all his power, Edirius taunts him, saying that this is a real fight they should have. But the sword saint's disciple immediately falls silent as Zephyr summons a blue dragon hand. The massive claw appears, then swings towards Edirius, pressing him down. He could not understand what had happened and when he had managed to use such power. It was too hard for him to push back, and he couldn't fully move or pull out his sword, as if something was pressing on his whole body. Meanwhile, Zephyr stood in the same place. He has used his skill called the Dragon's Way. It draws out the real dragon form from people who inherit the power of the original dragon's power. Its size and also abilities are proportional to its power. Now, the current manifestation percentages are 23%. But at that exact second, Zephyr began to use his telekinesis skill, and began to lift Edirius into the air. As soon as he raised him higher, Zephyr remembered that when he met this guy in a past life, he was already number one in the top ten. His talent and skills make him a prime target for recruitment, so he decided to test it a little, which is not the level he remembers. Some events that will trigger his growth must happen later, but he feels grateful for the idiotic child who can't sit still for a second. If he left Lindell Castle and met Altair, he wouldn't be able to control it with his power. This time, everything will be different. Zephyr intended to be the first terrible enemy since he left his teacher, and the reason to become stronger. As Edarius dangled in the air, he cast another spell and materialized a dragon head that ate him. With this, he will become his sword. Also, the fact that he won right now makes him entitled to call him a mongrel. Six years ago, the time allotted to her ended, and the white dragon began apologizing to Altair, because she could no longer teach her, and she would have to look for answers without her help. How to improve magic, and how to defeat the cult leader, and soon began to fly in a different direction. Twenty-five years have passed since the appearance of her incarnation. And this time, she managed to hold out for quite a long time. The shadow of destiny was approaching, and perhaps changes were taking place because she made too many mistakes in teaching gifted children. But among them were those who did not go halfway or turn into a twisted person. However, she believes Altair is different, and she is ready to give her life to the human race's last hope. It is just miserable that her wounds never healed, and she hoped that she would not be alone when she got to her body. So, there will be someone nearby who will share her sadness. But suddenly, the soul of the white dragon began to be pulled to the ground, and she did not understand what was happening. And she didn't understand where she was being pulled into. After all, she couldn't resist it. At the exact moment, she collapsed to the ground. She lies motionless, unable to grasp anything that is happening to her. Some boy noticed her and began to approach her. The soul of the great white dragon, which tried to return to the main body after the end of the incarnation time, is transferred to a mental state. She didn't understand why she lacked air and why she was suffocating. But suddenly, a little boy caught her and began to squeeze her tiny body, which was in the lizard. This boy is happy and lifts it up because he has finally found his dinner. For some reason, she moved into the body of a small lizard, caught by a little boy, and is almost eaten, which is truly unbelievable. And thanks to these events, Edirius became a student of the Sword Saint. 
She taught him the art of the sword until the end of the life of her body, and six months later, she was gone. But before that, she left him a sword with armor and asked him to help Altair. He is the one who doesn't take back his words after the duel, and now Zephyr can order him anything, and he will definitely do it. Zephyr realized that he was a pretty smart guy, and that's how it should be. And there is only one reason why Idirius is acting now. He thirsts for a fight. A born fighter who became a dragon's disciple can die from an ordinary brace here on Earth. Meanwhile, Idirius thought that he would go crazy, because no matter who he fought, whether it was defeating a boss monster, a battle with a knight, or a simple thief, everything became boring. There's a point in time when he wondered if the battle was such an ordinary thing when it was supposed to be something exciting. And now that his teacher is not there, he wonders where he can feel this thrill before the battle again. Soon, it began to be his train of thought every day. Well, he finally found the answer in the face of Zephyr, who was sitting in front of him, and Idirius realized that this guy was just playing with him and did not show his real skill. That makes him want to know what technique he is hiding and where he gains such strength. Then, have a rematch and fight until he wins. With that in mind, Idirius began to ask Zephyr if he had a dog. They're not going just to scare away thieves and guard the sheep. But Zephyr answered, is he really asking to play and ask for a piece of meat? Idirius answers that this way, he can cheer up and play his role better. Stretching out his hand, Zephyr tells him to come closer. He hits him with a flick of a finger right on his head. And from such a blow, Idirius flew back again and crashed into the nearest rock. Zephyr tells him to keep their distance. Then he approaches Idirius, who's lying on the ground, and says that judging by what he says, it means the Sword Saint can no longer send incarnations. So what he heard was the last will of his teacher, which was to help the princess. And he's recklessly carrying out his teacher's will by risking his life in a pointless duel. The old man nearby thinks that Zephyr himself had used the heart of a dragon for a bet. So, it's fair to say that they're both are catastrophically reckless. A little later, Zephyr tells Idirius that he doesn't like him. But his opinion meant little. Whether to leave him here or not is not for him to decide. That gave him the option to watch him, and Idirius was happy to hear it. The last thing Zephyr tells him while his hand is stretched out to his face is that he needs a safety device. Two days later, many warriors gathered near the castle in the Temple of Light in the Third Parish. Ned, who is watching all this, sees an incredible sight with everyone belonging to different organizations but still coming together. He had used a potion of scrutiny before he came, which one drop allowed him to see an insect in the body of a follower of the demon god. Ned saw that among them, there were many people in the cult. Ophelia, who's wearing a cover beside him, adds that the demon god cult must have supported them from behind. Otherwise, this place would have become a big club of demon worshippers. They also don't think about doing anything they want because this is just an armed demonstration. The real siege will begin only after irrefutable evidence is presented. Just like what Zephyr said, it can either be from killing Cardinal Aldian or stealing the dragon's heart. They should have more time to plant fake evidence so things can go smoothly. Both arrived here as an advanced detachment, and their role was to monitor the military situation and transmit information to an ally, including Lucius. They are the best from tens of forces and a speed player specializing in stealth. Theoretically, this is an ideal selection. But there is one problem. They didn't understand how long they would have to walk hand in hand. Before leaving the Great Elven Forest, the Queen helped to upgrade the Mist Bracelets so that if they wore them while holding hands, they would experience the same effect of stealth as if they were wearing a pair. But Ned didn't understand whether it was necessary to do this. Ophelia asked Altair to send her alone to the advanced detachment since she alone would be enough. However, Altair replied that they had already discussed everything in the meeting before. And this is not just a war. It is necessary to prevent the infiltration of persons with exceptional abilities, such as the Smiling Woman. And the fact that Ophelia is the only one who can recognize the Smiling Woman means she is simply irreplaceable. However, as the third parish is preparing itself against the invasion, she believes they have set all sorts of traps with the help of magical objects from the tomb of Eurydica. She knows Ned is the one who helped Lucius create this dungeon, to which Ned replies that he knew what and how it was installed. With that information, Altair concludes that they must be there, and she would wait for their safe return. She also adds that she still doesn't know what will be waiting for them there, so at least before entering the temple, they should not let go of each other's hands, leaving both Ned and Ophelia speechless. A little later, in the Great Elven Forest, Altair says that the Magic Tower and Danakil forces will be placed in the Great Forest. Also, the fifth squad of healers will remain in the Great Forest and help recover the fighters. Meanwhile, one of the two magicians, Milia, cries after she loses her recommendation from the capital's aristocrats. In addition, with the help of the army equipment for the war, Daisy assures her she has more chances after she befriends the Elf Queen. This is an excellent opportunity to show off her talent to the people from the Magic Tower. If she misses it, then she will no longer be called a magician. From now on, she will be faithful to Altair, and Milia will help her since she's shorthanded. Meanwhile, in Lindell Castle, Idirius is crying because of the headpiece that his teacher made for him. 
enabled anyone with a dragon's tongue to cast a spell on it. He thought that after the death of his teacher, he would no longer experience the training mode. He wonders how Zephyr knows the spell for switching modes and why he told him to cut so many onions. But Zephyr, standing behind him, tells this mongrel that his cutting speed has slowed down and he has to do all this seriously. And with the help of a drop of lion's blood, Zephyr could give him orders. This is a gem that is built into the relay silver lion headpiece. In training mode, it splits apart and responds to the control, punishment functions, and location tracking order. He realized that now he could rest, as well as control e Darius's actions. He will not be able to act on his own. A pure fanatic of battles is his nature. But that's not all. A few years will pass, and he will demonstrate another talent. As a result, many people will rely on e Darius but not notice it. And when their end came, e Darius decided to take all responsibility. And if he pulls such bullshit again and tries to ruin everything, then Zephyr will need to kill him before it's too late. It is his responsibility to remember all this down to the smallest detail. While preparing food, Zephyr began to understand that their party should have already arrived in the third parish. He needed to hurry to finish the preparations and meet the guests. One question can only be resolved before he can go to the third parish. During the battle with the Ramiel, the Black Moon, he could not use the Sword of Light. He wonders if it is because of the limits of his abilities that he should not be able to use it when he meets the cult leader. More importantly, knowing how the voice informed him that he was not allowed to use it, make him feel that he must find out the reason and will not enter the temple until he finds out. Then he opens up the silver room. Before approaching Idirius, he asked him whether he could wield anything other than a sword, to which he replied that of course he could. Suddenly, Idirius is on fire because he thought that Zephyr would give him one of the two weapons. But Zephyr, at that very second, hit him with the same weapon that he was holding in his hands. And as soon as Idirius fell to the ground after these blows, Zephyr realized that the hammer was still better, so he told him to take the hammer and play with it. As soon as they went outside, Zephyr began to tell Idirius to carve a tree with the hammer until it looked like a small squirrel. However, for Idirius, it is unclear what Zephyr meant and what makes him think it's possible to carve something with a hammer. Zephyr continued to say that he could do it if he really couldn't. This means that he really can't do anything without his knife, and he can't control his powers. But Idirius began to yell that he didn't say he couldn't and would do everything now. But Zephyr smiles and tells him that he will come to check in a few hours. So, he must ensure his carving is adorable, or he'll kill him. And he also adds that he should not even think about leaving the castle territory. With the help of an order in training mode, it is impossible to go beyond the designated zones. Idirius still could not understand how Zephyr knew about these tricks. Zephyr goes back inside and grabs the food. It is time for him to go. And with the help of the silver key, he began to move to another place. Meanwhile, in the Temple of Light, the third entrance to the Dungeon of the Waterway, Ned and Ophelia padded hand in hand. They noticed that the third entrance of the Temple of Light was a vast building in size, with strong walls, holy protection, and an abundance of food reserves. This fortress could easily survive for a year in a running siege even if the city gates were closed. This time, in order to prevent the smiling woman or the demon worshippers from entering, the passage is thoroughly sealed so that not only people but even letters cannot get inside. However, blocking the sewer drain completely is impossible, and the most suitable path for sabotage is in the sewer. And holding out his hand, Ned began to enter one magical place. The Labyrinth Creator tool expands the force field by deforming space into which no one can enter unless they know the method. And he brought it from the tomb of Eurydica, so that the mages will not have problems, and the place of this installation will also be hidden. And the method of entry is the same as he explains before to Ophelia. They just need to dance. Then, they continue to perform this stupid dance. Ophelia asked Ned who had set such a condition, to which he revealed that Zephyr was the one who had decided it. She says that it means there is no point in killing him, and she wants to deal with him. At the next note after this dance, the conditions were fulfilled. They began to move on to the next condition of standing in the right position. Ophelia began to tell Ned that she would kill him if he did the wrong move, and Ned gave the same thing in mind. But suddenly, she stepped on his foot, and a light appears around them. The fact that she stepped on his foot meant they would have to do everything again, making her raging in anger. At the same time, Lucius is in his room when suddenly someone is pointing a knife at his back and telling him not to move. He's quite impressed that he managed to get here when he put a lot of effort into making the security system. While many tried to get inside, he was the first to go this far. Turning his head, Lucius asked what business she had with the saint. She says that this is a robbery and Lucius just scoffs before quickly turning and disarming his intruder, which is none other than his own wife, Claudia. Once her knife fell, he hugged her and replied that he had given all of his wealth to his wife. He asks her if she will spare his life before kissing her on the cheek. She chuckles as she tells him to have dinner. Later, Lucius converses with one of his servants at the dining table while happily seeing Claudia feeding their child. After that, they had a cup of tea, 
and he told his wife that he felt like he was on holiday because he didn't need to work or welcome visitors. His wife replied that he's been pretty busy lately and should enjoy it. And what she said is true, since after killing the demon god worshippers, the number of the parish's high-ranking priests went down by half. They also lost a lot of knights in the raid. Now, just picking the right people for the right job was his main problem. But spending time with his family was a small blessing in itself. Shortly, a big war will break out, so he should savor moments like this. He then remembers his conversation with the Pope about the woman he brought from the Twilight Mansion, who will be held captive in the third parish under his supervision until he can clear the tomb of the abominable princess and present it to the temple. Now that he's figured out there's a member of the demon god cult in the upper ranks of the Temple of Light, there's no guarantee they'll vote to release her. And if things went south, she might be taken into custody and face a terrible fate. He holds her hand and apologizes to her. The important thing right now is ensuring her safety rather than her freedom. Suddenly, she lost consciousness, and Lucius managed to catch her before she fell to the ground. Only then did he smell sleeping gas permeating the air. He quickly put Claudia down and materialized his weapon. Sleeping won't work on a saint like him, so he needs to find out who the intruder is. Then, the man sitting at the other end of the dining table tells him to sit down. Lucius is on high alert after seeing Fade. This man isn't an ordinary being. He can't feel his presence, and even though he sits comfortably, he shows no loopholes for counterattacks. And the tattoo on his arms reminds him of the legendary assassin guild called Persephone. Lucius wonders who would send Fade, but he can't find an answer because there are too many possible places. Persephone is famous for being very skilled in combat and poison, and despite the poison not affecting him, it's different for Claudia and Marius. That led him to another question. Why did he use sleeping gas instead of deadly poisons? He could have held his family hostage and asked him to do his bidding in exchange for the antidote. If possible, he will use a poison that he can't even purify. So, what's actually going on with this strange timing? Then, he has an idea that Fade is actually testing him. He smirked and asked if his father had sent him. Fade grins before saying that he's quite slow in his guess, but true nonetheless. He also confirmed that Lucius hadn't been brainwashed or controlled by someone smarter than him. Lucius' father is the Duke Cesare Giornetti. He's a powerful noble who possesses great power and wealth. In the Duke's estate, he likes to say that talented and extremely affluent people are always precious. Several hundred guests are living there and rumor has it that there are royalties of fallen kingdoms and assassins among those guests. Then Fade explains that the Duke asked him to check on his son. So, last week, he infiltrated the temple and looked everywhere until he understood the situation. He also fed the priests truth serums to make them cooperate with him quietly. To Lucius's surprise, Fade could also check the branded worm in his stomach while sleeping. After recovering from the shock, Lucius tells him to send his father his message. Fade agrees to deliver the message. He also tells him that his wife and son will wake up in six hours, so he doesn't need to use his purification skill on them. Then Fade asks him where to find Zephyr, and Lucius is surprised that he knows that name. Fade replies that it doesn't matter where he got it. He just needs to worry about what will happen if he gives him a disappointing answer, since he had already fed a time-release poison to 50 priests within the temple without them realizing it. They're also not going to use purification skills because the poison has no external symptoms. By now, their sense would have become sensitive, and they would go after the smell of the poison that he smeared all over the place. Eventually, it'll lead them to the culvert. Lucius worries because the culvert is where sewage passes by to get to the outside. It's a place where anyone can move freely in and out of that area. This means that anyone can get out and tell what happened inside. Then, it will justify other factions to launch a siege war. Then Fade adds that the poison will still work even if he dies. He warns Lucius to tell him everything he knows about Zephyr if he wants to get the antidote. This has turned into a more serious situation. The third parish culvert has the most effective security system by applying an asymmetrical force field. And it was designated with magic to create traps so only water could come and go. Some guards watch over what or who enters and leaves the place. Some said the security measures are the invisible rune stones that have been installed all along the sewer's tunnel and the magic formation that connects each rune stone will detect any attempt at trespassing. Then, an alarm sound blaring inside starts to alert everyone inside. Not long after Fade warns Lucius, he hears the alarm blaring in the castle, which means that Fade is not bluffing. He tells him he only has five minutes until the priests go out, so he had better tell him the information he wanted. However, Lucius doesn't falter and replies that there are knights who guard the culvert, and can subdue the priests who lost their minds because of the poison. He is also confident that there's a way to cleanse the poison remotely, and he can figure out how to detoxify them by force. Then he asks Fade in return of why he wants to know about his comrades. Fade reaches out of his inner pocket, and a bunch of rosaries fall down after he takes it out. Lucius realizes that they are the rosaries of the night, meaning that Fade had also put them to sleep. So essentially, there are no guards to keep the priests inside. 
Then he takes out his weapon and points it at Lucius. Suddenly, somebody pressed his back and used a thunderclap palm strike towards him. That somebody is Ned, and he manages to catch Fade off guard. That even surprises the saint, leaving him speechless. And without giving Fade a chance, Ned keeps going with his attack, blasting it on the assassin's back. Even after getting bombarded like that, Fade fails to see where the attacks come from because Ned wears the mist bracelet that hides his presence. Meanwhile, Fade, who's fighting blind, decides to trust his instinct and attack Ned back through the direction of the attacks. Ned leans back when his knife swings his way. There will be no good comes from getting stabbed by a poisoner's knife. However, to his surprise, his knife can be extended, forcing Ned to go higher to avoid getting hit by it. He can't estimate how long the chain is, so the best option is upwards. Seeing Fade's skills from above, he can now be sure that what Zephyr told him is true. He said that Fade is someone who doesn't listen to weaklings, and he's also good at using poison, hidden weapons, and stealth. So, he wanted Ned to come to the third parish and fight with him, before eventually kidnapping him so Altair can persuade him to join their party. Having enough of it, Fade starts using his poison technique, radiating a deep green hue around his body along with his sword, forming it to become a whip. Right after, he starts to bombard the room, trying to land a hit on Ned with the power level of a Dragon Raid's vanguard. Despite how strong Fade is and how Ned doubts himself, Zephyr believes that he's the right person for the job. With that in mind, Ned lands on the ground and dispels the bracelet's power, which has received the blessing of the Elf Queen. Seeing Ned is here, Lucius is positive that the Dragon Raid was successful. Now that Fade is facing Ned, he only has to cure the priests and guards. Meanwhile, Fade is confused as to why Ned dispels his stealth when it will be more advantageous for him to keep it, and he's also familiar with the technique he uses. At the same time, in the sewers, Ophelia knocks down every priest who tries to get out, to think that the situation came to this after she stepped on Ned's toes a dozen times during the ballroom dancing and then they decided to go separately. Fortunately, she was near the entrance, but it's also been an hour since Ned left. He should have made it into the building by now. So, Ophelia tells herself to go in as well. But before that, she drops a few seeds that she gets from the Elf Queen into the water. If she infused mana and poured water on it, she would be able to stop anyone from running away. As soon as the seeds are in the water, a huge tree appears and blocks the entire tunnel. She tells the tree to knock out anyone who tries to pass. She has an uneasy feeling that Ned might actually need her. Somewhere else, Mercedes hastily walks into the silver room when she hears a loud crash inside. Apparently, the commotion was caused by Zephyr destroying the furniture. She wonders what he's trying to achieve from doing this, and he replies that he doesn't like the interior design. Then, he breaks a chair and moves to the table with his axe. This makes Mercedes angrier because the things that he destroyed are expensive items. But Zephyr doesn't care and keeps destroying it. Suddenly, the turtle alarm went off, stopping him from destroying more furniture. Then he unceremoniously throws his axe and approaches the big cloth behind him. It turns out he was cooking meat using the southern marination sauce he learned from his grandfather. And the meat he was cooking was none other than the blue dragon's ribs. It's usually tough that most knives can't even dent it. But thanks to Ramiel's poison breaking down the protein, the meat is perfectly tender. He had used Ramiel's venom spear magic to get rid of the poison because if he used telekinesis, both the poison and the meat juice would leak out, leaving the meat dry. Then, he dispelled the skill before it was discharged, causing the venom spear to liquefy, and he stored it in a jar. Once it's done, he used weak flames from the dragon's breath on the meat he had prepared thoroughly. He cut a piece and tasted it to make sure that it was perfect, making Mercedes can't help but be tempted by the delicious smell. She decides to let Zephyr go and warns him that he will not gain anything every time he causes a commotion. Zephyr cut a slice and fed it to her, so he can catch her off guard, knowing full well that she can't resist the delicious meat. Then he grabs her face and angrily asks what actually happened during his fight. He thought that the Sword of Light was in his possession, but when he intended to use it, he was told that he couldn't. Mercedes reveals that she knows nothing about it as Zephyr chokes the life out of her, which eventually makes him rage even more and then throws her to the side. Seeing that he can't force her to tell him anything, he turns to tell the other gods that he won't fight for their amusement anymore. As he sits in the chair, he says that from now on, all they have to watch is him eating in this room. Meanwhile, Mercedes, who's fed up with his antics, decides to put him in his place by attacking him. But when she manifested her power, another strong lightning bolt struck her, delivering a message in the form of golden and blue envelopes. Zephyr wondered what was inside the envelope sticking on the ground, while Mercedes is annoyed seeing the gods folding because of Zephyr's tantrum. She took both of them and congratulated him. These are sealed letters from the God of Light and the God of Sky. What he wants is inside one of them, but he can only open one letter, and the other will disappear, leaving Zephyr in a dilemma. Back in the third parish, Ned and Fade had a series of fights, and their swords clashed constantly. 
Fade notices that Ned is using a strange fighting style that he has never seen before, and it reminds him when the nun tells him that Zephyr had drugged himself. She also adds that the last thing she saw was him following Lucius' raid party. From her, he knows that Zephyr has silver hair, so he concludes that his opponent is Ned based on his red hair. Now that he knows they belong to the same group, he has no hesitation in his attack. Fade quickly charges forward, but this time, Ned struggles to defend himself. He wonders how Ned can master skills that took years to train for, and he suspected that Ned was using Eastern martial arts. Ned stays quiet, leaving Fade with no choice but to land another attack that pushes him back. He trues dozens of poisonous needles from his hand before pouring poison into his smoker. Once he blows it, purple smoke engulfs Ned, but he quickly dispels it by making a shockwave by clapping his hands, leaving Fade surprised to see his power. Then he notices Lucius gets away. It makes him think that he's stupid for running away when both of them can fight him together. But Ned is glad he gets out of there because he is in the same room with his family. They're going to be nothing but another obstacle. Right now, Ned has no choice but to use the mind control skill, but he needs time to activate it. So, he asks Fade if his goal is revenge against Zephyr, suggesting they should team up instead of fighting. He also adds a false tale about being imprisoned to make it believable. But Fade doesn't buy it. In his mind, Zephyr doesn't care about anything. He witnessed it by himself four years ago when he betrayed the guild members he had been with since birth, and joined the Eastern Martial Artists, leaving the Persephone Guild to cease to exist. The look on his face as he looked back is something he can't forget. So, after that, he roamed the world to find him. He even looks thoroughly at every little rumor about him. Now that he has found a solid lead, he won't let it go. As he said it, he took off the band-aid in his hand and revealed his secret weapon. It manifested into a sword made out of bones. His last duty as a part of Persephone is to execute Zephyr. As soon as he uses it to attack Ned, he can feel a suffocating aura that triggers his fear. It feels so familiar that it brings him back to when he's face to face with the Shoggoth, a living weapon of the demonic god cult that pollutes people's minds, leaving them paralyzed with fear. Suddenly, Ophelia appears just in time to protect him. Fade is surprised because he also doesn't expect other people to use stealth. Then she roars into his ears until the entire left part of his body is paralyzed, making him wonder if they're from the same origin. Out of nowhere, a string of chains manages to catch him, followed by a stone that immobilizes his body. All of that is from Lucius and his priests. Ned wastes no time approaching Fade and using his mind control skills on him. It was a skill given by Queen Sylvester as per Zephyr's request. She told him he needed to maintain eye contact with his enemy for at least 30 seconds to activate it. She hopes that Ned won't abuse the power because she believed when Zephyr told her that he would use the power to persuade and recruit a comrade who would help in the survival of mankind. But Ned can only use it twice. About a month ago, when Zephyr's party was preparing for the dragon raid, he found a hut belonging to Aldian as a contact point. This means that it's a place where his subordinates, who have been infested with the insect, send the information they've collected or pass on his orders to the other. Aldian was weak compared to the other 12 apostles, but he makes up for it by having excellent intel all over the country to play its politics and gain a high rank position within the demon god cult. However, that's only the past. Now, Leah is slowly killing his subordinates brutally after Aldian's death. She wonders about the other nobles when remembering what the Eastern One said. He believed she was the only one who could resolve this situation. But to do that, she can't trust anyone, and he wants her to look into everything personally. Then, they execute the traitor of their sect. He also declares her as his succeeding disciple, and his hairpin proves it. That is why her first mission is to prove her master's innocence. And when she finishes her mission, the rest of his disciples who went to look for her lost young brother will be on their way back as well. Looking back at the present her brother gave her, this is the only thing she has about him after losing her memory due to an accident. She tells one of the juniors to prepare everything before moving to the next location. Because a new variable appears, she needs to find and take control or eliminate it to win. Because at this point, she's determined to protect her master. Meanwhile, on the third parish, Ned tells Fade that the Master of the East trained two disciples to compete with each other. And he also trained several shadow disciples in case anything happened to the two of them. Among them, one person secretly learned poison or face-changing techniques. This story is what they decided to tell him. So, Ned continues that the first time he saw poison similar to what Fade and Zephyr used was eight years ago. At that time, his senior brother was caught using poison, which got him imprisoned in the punishment room for a month. Because his master doesn't acknowledge any techniques besides martial arts, he never heard about the details of that poison. Fade concludes that Zephyr was actually in cahoots with his guild eight years ago. Ned thinks that there is probably more to them. Anything that he learned from needle techniques, blood path, and acupoint blocking techniques was taught in the East. But seeing that Persephone also used needle techniques as they did, 
he wonders how long these two organizations connected. Seeing Fade silent, Ned realizes how dangerous the Elf Queen's blessing is. Fade looked like someone who'd be hard to deal with. But, now, not only is he talking about secret information, he even listened to him asking for his help with the siege war in a positive light. And another thing he notices is that the scar on his face is expanding. But he shrugs it off as overthinking things. With that, a few days later, the enemies still lined up outside of the castle while Ophelia watched them day and night. However, they show no signs of preparing siege weapons or attacks. So, Lucius persisted in conducting surveillance and training the soldiers. Since the blue dragon managed to draw the attention, he must use this situation and prepare for the ice dragon raid. But prepare for the perfect situation leading to the next raid. He and his enemies have no choice but to wait for the time they reach their limits with anxious hearts. And it doesn't take long to break the balance when Matthias appears. The other leader knew that he was a saint candidate when he was young but disqualified. Then, he followed Lucius before Aldi and took him under his wings. Meanwhile, inside the castle, Lucius can't believe what he saw. He immediately knows that Matthias is a fake because he turned into a demon in the dungeon and died in his hands. But he turned into ashes so that he couldn't collect his corpse. Ophelia also agrees that he's an imposter and it's all just a trick by someone who knows that Matthias' corpse couldn't be collected. Others might be fooled by the fact that she can see through the deceits. The secret weapon the Master of the East groomed without telling the cult is a master of face-changing techniques that can make her change look into anyone. She's also known as the smiling woman, Lea Testarossa. She gaslights their enemy by telling false tales about what happened in the dragon raid and declares war on Lucius. While Ned is perplexed right now because all he can see is Matthias when he is actually his sister. And to think that she revealed that he was a demon god worshipper in front of many people. Zephyr had told him that Leah was involved in an accident that caused her to lose her memories and forget about him. Meanwhile, one of the priests named Benjamin approaches the fake Matthias. He tells him that he can't arrest someone who's ranked higher than him because he's just a former heresy inquisitor. He can only arrest and interrogate someone if three or more high-ranked priests approve his report. Luckily for him, Benjamin, Cornwall, and Gertrude are willing to do it. But Benjamin warns him that if his accusation is fake, he will be executed immediately. After that, he activates his dimension ring, and the Themis judgment appears above him. It's a judgment tool used in the era of the Holy Kingdom that will fire an arrow toward the target if they give false testimony. Matthias has no choice but to kneel when Benjamin asks him if it's true that Lucius has colluded with the demon god worshipper. Leah silently thought about the tool that was used in this trial. It was said that heresy inquisitor Themis of the ancient ages stabbed her own eyes, so she conducted a fair trial and ignored how things might look on the surface. In return, she earned an extreme sense of hearing for trials. She also knew that Themis's judgment detects the sound of a heartbeat breathing, and faint tremors in someone's voice. Those are the traits of lying, and it will fire an arrow when it gets detected. However, Leah is confident in her ability to control her muscle movement and act out certain emotions at the level of her own subconsciousness. No one can tell if she is lying, not even a holy relic, so she confidently says that it's true. The arrow burns brighter before it disappears, signifying that what she said was the truth. With that, two of the three factions approve his testimony, so they have a plausible cause to siege the third parish. Meanwhile, Leah is silently enjoying the situation. She found it amusing that these people have forsaken their respect for the saint and their faith in money, and they're just waiting for someone else to open the gates for them violently. They're nothing more than a group of cowardly beasts. She had put Matthew's name at stake and set the fire to everything. Now, she just needs approval from Gertrude. She's silent momentarily since she has no interest in this war but she just wants to make sure that Aldean is safe. When she's about to approve, a bolt of red lightning hits Matthias and two people come down. Benjamin immediately recognizes Ophelia. Others are also surprised by her presence. She went to Benjamin and asked him how accurate Themis' judgment was. He replies that it's 100% accurate. So, Ophelia questions if the tool is considered to detect whether or not the target has been hypnotized and truly believes in false information. Benjamin has no answer for that. And Ophelia continues that Ned is a reinforcement from Altair to help the saint. She also unnecessarily adds that Ned is her servant to annoy him secretly. Then she tells everyone that someone is clearly trying to frame the saint while posing as Matthias. The light she used to paralyze him temporarily also dispersed the mana flow. Leah was unable to maintain her form, so she slowly revealed herself. She begins to laugh and praise Ophelia for being able to botch her plans twice. When Ned asks her if she recognizes him, she only knows him as a traitor she had to kill. Then she took Hypno's ocarina along with her troops and blew it. This instrument can control the Shoggoth to issue various commands depending on the combination of notes. They all simultaneously play it, and the melodies start to ring in the air, leaving Ned surprised because the notes differed from what he had learned. Not only that, but the melody can make the Shoggoth evolve into a Basilicos. It is clear that Leah is deemed a dangerous opponent for a reason. The monster begins to roar through the air, 
those who have weak magic defense will become extremely dizzy. Everyone quickly realized what kind of skill it was when monsters started pouring out from the woods. The name Basilicos means a small king and it has the power to control monsters. People started to run away and scattered all over the place. This makes Benjamin worry because they need to fight to survive. Then, some people dare look up into the blazing red eyes and immediately turn into stones. Benjamin uses the Staff of Benevolence to create a barrier from the evil monsters. The people who were turned into stone could return to being humans, and Benjamin ordered everyone to stay within the barrier. That way, the purification effect will last longer. Then he tells Cornwall to buy him some time to kill the beast. He agrees and whips out a weapon that was originally supposed to destroy the castle gate. It's called the Spear Servant of the Goddess, and it's a statue of a Templar that will attack the enemy if it is infused with divine power. It launches its spear toward the beast and successfully wounds it. The beast tries to attack back, but the statue holds it off with his shield, and it immediately counters it by landing multiple punches before summoning his spear back. Seeing the fight from afar, Benjamin knows how dangerous the beast actually is. But a priest's skill can cancel most of its mental strike, since their attacks are light elemental, so there's nothing to worry about. But according to the records of this beast being tamed, he should worry about the second mouth on its tail. It will use a life-threatening skill after chanting an incantation for at least 5 minutes up to 1 hour. If the second mouth succeeds at activation, 80% of their party will be killed. And every time it activates, it will use different skills to confuse them even more. So, the safest way to fight it is not to let the second mouth activate in the first place. He turns to ask his subordinate how much time is left and informs him that the land monsters will arrive in 10 minutes while the flying monster will get to them in 2. Knowing that they have a small window of time, Benjamin took another holy relic called the Golden Mirror of the Holy Sanctuary. It connects him directly to the Holy Relic Management Squad headquarters, where another cardinal received his signal. By using the dagger of the Holy Sanctuary, they join their mana and send it through the mirror, making Benjamin struggle to hold the kickback of their power. This mirror was meant to be used for the siege of the war. Just like the Stake of Faith, there is a heavy restriction on the permitted usage because it was loaned items based on a mission. He has no choice but to use these items now because they need to survive. Suddenly, Gertrude interrupts and redirects the power towards the castle gate. Benjamin can't even fathom how willing she is to sacrifice many people for the sake of Aldian. The massive magic power shoots straight towards the gate, and apparently, the entire situation is fabricated by the demon god worshippers to get the result that they want. Cable had ensured his partners that it had already been set in motion. However, Othello prefers an all-out war instead of this meticulously planned manipulation. Cable tells him that full-blown war is a last resort because they take a lot of processes like justification, war declaration, and negotiations, and they have to manipulate the higher-ups. The only exception is that when talking is no longer an option, their action following it will be justified. Having it will mean that they still have to keep the etiquette of war and garner support from other powerful parties. Ultimately, there won't be any disciplinary actions from the Gold Guardian Dragon of the Kingdom. Othello finally understands that his partners are trying to take as much as possible from the saint while maintaining their position on the surface. Helmina agrees since this is how the higher-ups live. Meanwhile, outside the castle, the cardinals are still sending waves of power through the mirror, and Gertrude redirected it with such commotion that it caught Cornwell's attention. The door starts crumbling while Altair and her companion are still in the woods near the third parish. Elise was notified that the attack started when they were still 30 minutes away from the parish. She also confirms that the golden mirror is the weapon they use to break into the door. Then she explains to Altair that it's a relic that consumes divine power or mana for instant firepower and gains tremendous power temporarily. Altair assumes the station master who was deployed using Eurydica relic will be in danger as well. Dariel takes the initiative to provide support with long-range attacks and asks Kiara to calculate the coordinates. But he notices something in the front and tells everyone to jump in the count of three. And right as they all jump, a blue flash strikes them from below. Altair and her companions are saved, but a few soldiers fall because their horses get hit. The ground and trees around them are leveled, and Altair is worried for the soldiers. The attack comes from a sharp whip imbued with mana, wielded by the disciple of the Master of the East. Along with it, he also wields a bladed spear, showing himself as he claims he will kill them all right there. Meanwhile, in front of the castle, both Ned and Ophelia strike Leah together, but she can block their attack. Ned desperately tries to make Leah remember that he's her brother, but she denies it and attacks him, saying he should be more convincing when lying. Ned is confused about how she can turn like this. Then suddenly, a loud bomb can be heard behind them, and somebody yells that the castle gate has been destroyed. Leah takes the opportunity to charge forward using electric acceleration. Ophelia knows that she's trying to get close to the shrine and quickly tries to catch up to her. Meanwhile, Leah's troops redirected some of their own to protect the mansion and began to blow the whistle again. 
he forcefully activates the code in the second mouth. This weakens the power it lets out because it's a forced activation before the spell is completed, but it's still powerful enough to hold off the priests. The second mouth manifested its spell, and a black rain started to pour from the sky, covering the troops and the priests in the field, and soon, one of them feels suffocated. In the future, this black rain will be named Keystrain. It's said to immediately drive anyone who touches it into a state of madness. Even the priests inside the purification formation are having a hard time withstanding its mental attack. But they refuse to give up and tell everyone to stay together. Suddenly, one of the priests who held the staff got caught by a monster, and he was dragged through the air. Soon, the other monsters arrive and devour the priests as well. Three of the staff have been taken, decreasing the range of the purification formation. And Ned, watching it from the side, couldn't help but feel pity. The only ones who can move around without worrying about mental corruption inside this place are the followers of the demon god that has the ocarina, him, and Ophelia, who have immunity against it. Ned was in a dilemma about whether or not he should help or let them get slaughtered. He tries to think about what Zephyr will do in this situation, and remember that he used to say the ones that need to be neutralized should be dealt with efficiently. Apart from that, he wants to spare as many lives as possible because the greater the number of capable soldiers they retain, the broader their spectrum of potential actions becomes. And he also says that it's always the case on a greater scale. He will trust Ned to decide for himself what is right. So he turns around and tells Ophelia to chase Leah. At the same time, he will hold off the monsters. Deep inside, he wants to pursue his sister and convince her by using the Elf Queen's blessing. Leah is a very troublesome enemy, so it's a good choice from a strategic point of view but he will trust his companions and fulfill his role to pave the way for Zephyr. Soon after, Ophelia manages to catch up to Leah and try to kick her, but Leah's troops push her to the side with the beast he controlled. Seeing the opportunity, she immediately disappears, leaving Ophelia confused as to where she was going. But soon, she feels her power from the back. When Leah strikes her with her lightning bolt, another whip flings her to the back and ultimately saves Ophelia. Leah is surprised to see that the one who hit her is Fade. Meanwhile, Ned cast a spell on his sword and charged forward to kill the monsters. He will end this fight with a perfect score. At the same time, Lucius called out to the priests using an Echo of Angels tool to amplify his voice and surprise Ned and the others. Lucius proclaims that he has received the words of God and that the priests should treat him like they would treat God's son. And today, they will witness a miracle. Right at that moment, like the omnipotent goddess spoke to the world, let there be light. From the sky, descends a golden stroke of light, ripping apart the beast right at its essence as it lit up the world. It's Zephyr in his dragon form bolting through, toward the battleground wielding the sword of light. Its power shines, as it implies that he chooses to open the letter from the goddess of light. It brings upon an ancient light, not only is it powerful, but it's also a legendary divine item that can use the spell of the highest rank. The person who wields that sword only appears once every few hundred years, a special priest that is chosen by the goddess. The high-ranking priests are all dumbstruck by the appearance of Zephyr. Not only does he have the Sword of Light, but he also has the feature of a dragon. In Zephyr's past life, he went unnoticed at this point in time for the next few years, because the spotlight was stolen by Edirius who appeared like a comet. That actually gave Zephyr an opportunity. His enemies didn't care about him because they were busy going after Edirius. While their guard was down, he was able to take advantage of a few really good opportunities and become stronger. This time, Zephyr was going to hide as well, in Lucius or Dariel's shadow until he had grown strong enough. But a few days ago, inside the Silver Room, Zephyr decided to open the golden envelope from the Goddess of Light. Mercedes also informs him that the voice he heard wasn't Goddess Area. The owner of that voice is the Sword of Light itself, adding that Zephyr has already fulfilled the prerequisites of the Sword of Light, but it rejected him. Along with the Golden Envelope, Goddess Area gave him a quest to do, so he will be able to use the Sword of Light while carrying the quest. Premiering on the battlefield, Zephyr uses the Dragon's Tongue magic, commanding all humans present to kneel and monster to stop at their feet. That instant everyone kneels, including Ophelia and Ned while the monsters all stop at their track and some are even ready to blast the knight's head. But that's what Zephyr wants, as he tightens his grip on the Sword of Light then swings it around. A strike of brilliant light went through the battlefield as if nothing can stop it. With one fell swoop he defeated the mobs of monsters that attacked the third parish temple setting the world alight with his brilliance. 